Right, welcome along everybody. Today, I'm ridiculously excited to announce that after months of planning, we're finally going live with this course, Essential Cocktails, right here on YouTube, free of charge. Over the next 50 days, this course is designed to take you from potentially having never made a cocktail before, right through to making 40 of the most popular cocktails in the world, and also making your own perfect drink. In this course, you can expect tips, tricks, tools, and techniques, and also I'll be giving you recipes, which if you've followed this channel for a while, you'll know aren't necessarily recipes, they're actually templates that you can build upon, adapt, and twist to make your own perfect drinks, regardless of your experience level. So with all that being said, let's roll the new intro. So for those of you who have been here before, welcome along, thank you for being here. And for those of you who are new here, a quick reintroduction to myself. My name is Dan Fellows. I'm the first and only ever double world coffee and good spirits champion, which is the world's leading coffee cocktail competition. And over the last decade plus, my mission has been to learn as much as I possibly can about cocktails, about coffee, and to share it with people like yourselves. So after all those years making cocktails in bars, in competitions, all around the world delivering workshops and masterclasses, and right here on YouTube, this eight week course is the perfect opportunity for me to share the most important things I've learned about cocktails with you, whether you're at the start of your cocktail journey or making your way through it. A lot of you have commented on my other videos that you either come from a coffee background or you're not an experienced bartender, so don't have the kind of high level skills needed to make drinks at home, which couldn't be further from the truth. So this course is designed to give you the confidence you need to make delicious drinks, either at home or in a bar, wherever you wanna make them. In the first episodes, we'll cover the essential bottles, tools and techniques to set you up for success. And then after that, we'll follow up with 40 template style recipes designed to be super simple, using widely available ingredients wherever possible, and no complex homemade ingredients. So whether you're a bartender, a barista, a home enthusiast, or even a high level pro, come along for this amazing journey. It's gonna be awesome to have you along. Share it with a friend who wants to level up their own cocktail skills, get them involved too. Make the drinks, and most importantly, have fun, which is what it's all about, right? So before we get started with the course, a huge amount of time and work's gone into making all of this information available free of charge. And I really hope you do find huge value in it because I've really enjoyed creating it. And the only one thing I ask in return is that you subscribe to the channel, which number one, helps you stay up to date with the course, follow along in time, and as soon as the videos drop, you can watch them. But also number two, it helps these videos be seen by more eyes, therefore helping more people make better drinks. So without further ado, let's get started with Essential Cocktail. Welcome along to Essential Cocktails, everybody. So in this 50 video course, I'm gonna give you all of the tips, tricks, tools, and techniques you need to make better drinks, as well as 40 template style recipes for some of the most popular cocktails in the world. We've taken over this incredible barn in order to film these videos, and I really hope you do find them valuable. And in this video, we're gonna be demystifying the back bar. So I'm fully aware that all these bottles can be kind of overwhelming, a little bit intimidating, but in this episode, we're gonna demystify this, simplify it, and I'll run through some key styles and categories so you understand which bottles you could choose from based on your own preferences. Within each category, I'll give you some examples of some brands that I think represent a really good blend of value, versatility, quality, and availability, as well as giving you some example cocktails made with each bottle. So you can choose the bottles that actually represent your flavor preferences, rather than having to go out and spend all this money on all these bottles, which you might not necessarily need. And the truth honestly is that you could buy one bottle of spirit, some citrus, some pantry ingredients that you've got at home, and also some sweetness, and you could make a big range of cocktails just to get started. So don't be fooled and think you need to have all these bottles to get started buy one bottle and you've got a really good starting point. So if you wanna see those example cocktails and videos, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss them when they drop. And we're gonna start by exploring the first quite neutral category, which is vodka. All right, first of all, we're gonna get started with vodka. And there are a few different types of vodka, but I would recommend starting with just one bottle because we have similar end results when you mix this into a cocktail with subtle differences between styles. So the most popular base that vodka is made from is a kind of grain, and you have a few different grains within that category. You have things like a rye vodka, such as Vibrova. You have a wheat vodka, such as Boatyard. You also have a corn vodka, such as the Crystal Skull. But outside this, you also get other bases to vodka, which have slightly different characteristics. So we also have things like a potato vodka, which I'm a really big fan of. And we've got the Avaldor by Colworth Farm Distillery here. This sounds a little bit strange to have potatoes as the base of your vodka, but don't be put off by this. It doesn't taste like potatoes. It tastes like a really good quality vodka with nice body and a little creaminess in there as well. And we've got more contemporary things like a grape skin vodka from Discarded. A rye vodka might be a little bit more spicy. A wheat vodka might be a little bit cleaner and lighter. A corn vodka might have a little bit of natural sweetness coming through. 
Potato vodka could have a little bit more body. And then a grape skin vodka might be a little bit lighter and a little bit more tannic. So bear in mind when I give these characteristics, they are generalized, they're not specific to different brands. Um, within the production process, within different brands, within different bases, you will get variety. So if I say this might be spicy, you might find another rye vodka which isn't necessarily too spicy, but these are kind of very loose starting points, just to give you an understanding. And whichever one you choose is gonna be a really good starting point. Vodka is great in cocktails. It brings that neutrality, which kind of lengthens the cocktail and brings the alcohol to the drink without adding too much character. And that's a really powerful thing. So I'm gonna go with this potato vodka, which is the Avaldor from Colwood Farm Distillery. And this is actually fairly local to where I am. And that's another thing I really recommend. If you can buy local and find great produce, definitely do that. These are fairly widely available bottles. This is a little bit more niche, but it's really, really delicious. And support local, that's always a really good thing to do. So as I said, this works really nicely in a vodka martini, but vodka also features in a huge array of cocktails, things like the Porn Star Martini, Cosmopolitan, Espresso Martini, the list goes on. We'll be exploring all of those in the future, so stay tuned. And now we're gonna move on to our second category, which is gonna be gin. All right, so next up, we're gonna look at gin. And gin has had a real resurgence recently with hundreds if not thousands of distillers creating their own signature blends of botanicals. But one thing that's common of all gin is that it's based around a flavor profile of juniper. And this has to be there for it to be called gin. So one of the most famous styles of gin you're looking at is a London dry gin, something like Beef Eater, which is very juniper forward. It has a big complex range of botanicals that surround it, but juniper is kind of that punchy, forefronted flavor. So this works really well in a huge range of cocktails. Things like a Negroni, a gin martini, a bramble, lots of cocktails feature gin, all very delicious. And this is a really good base for that because it has that big, heavy juniper flavor, which cuts through the other ingredients. So we also have other distillers bringing their own signature blend of botanicals, which are behind the juniper, but bring other layers of complexity. So things like Tancray 10, which is a really delicious gin, a little bit more grapefruity, a little bit of chamomile in there, and very complex, so really nice in a martini. But those subtleties might be lost when you mix them with other big flavors. So you don't need to spend a huge amount of money on gin to get really good results. So interestingly, London dry gin doesn't actually have to be made in London, whereas Plymouth gin has to be made in the city of Plymouth, which isn't too far from where we are today. And this is a slightly different style, a little bit less juniper forward, a little bit sweeter and softer, and another really good mix in gin, which works in all the cocktails I spoke about before. We also have precursors to gin, things like Geneva, which has a little bit more of a malty style. We've got Old Tom Gin, which is a slightly sweeter style, a little bit more kind of licorice coming through, a little bit less juniper forward. And again, these are very broad sweeping statements, so there is lots of variation within categories. But if I were to start with one bottle to mix into as many cocktails as possible, I'd go with Beef Eater. It seems to be really readily available. It's very good value. It's actually quite a cheap bottle and it has all that juniper flavor coming through. So now this is gonna live on our back bar ready for making some delicious cocktails, and we're gonna move on to rum. Okay, so next up we have a very wide category, which is rum. So rum is made from sugarcane or sugarcane juice or molasses, and as you can see, there's a big variety in rum. So typically a lot of people will talk about light, medium or golden, and then dark rums or black rum, but these boundaries are fairly loosely defined and there aren't kind of clear delineations between them. But when it comes to flavor, you can kind of path that journey through and choose some rums that work for you. So I'm actually gonna choose three rums, a light flavored rum, an aged rum, which has those kind of subtle, rich woody notes, and then a black rum. So when it comes to your lightly flavored rums, I like to look at an aged white rum. And what that means is that it's actually aged and then usually charcoal filtered. So El Dorado 3 and Havana Club 3 are both aged for three years, given a little bit of complexity, taking the edge off the kind of sharpness of the alcohol and given some light tropical flavors, some kind of vanilla and white chocolate. Then we have Diplomatico Planus, which is aged for around about six years, then charcoal filtered, which has much more ripe fruit coming through, some of those nice fruit esters, so a little bit of banana. Again, white chocolate, vanilla, really, really delicious. But I'm gonna go for El Dorado 3, because again, this is widely available, really good value. It comes in at quite a cheap bottle, despite being really good quality, and a really good base for lots of cocktails, things like a mojito, a Mai Tai, lots of tropical cocktails and tiki cocktails contain white rum. So this is gonna have its place on our back bar. And then second of all, I wanna go for something that stands in between your kind of light rums and then your richer, more molasses forward rums. So something like an aged rum, like an Appleton Estate, which is a Jamaican rum. And just like things like coffee, things like wine, terroir plays a huge impact in the production of rum. So when we think back to that kind of nature versus nurture thing, the nature has a big impact. So the soil composition, 
things like the elevation where the sugarcane grows will have a big impact. But as well as the nature side of things, the kind of nurture or production method also plays a big, big impact in this. So that whole process in producing the rum has a big impact on the flavor. And we've got three bottles here which sit within our kind of middle ground of the rum category. Appleton Estate is a Jamaican rum, which again has those really high fruit esters, almost like a tropical fruit and some people say funky, which is traditional with Jamaican rum a lot of the time, kind of pineapple-y, mango, passion fruit, really, really delicious. And if you're talking tiki cocktails, look no further than Appleton Estate. But we also have things like a blended rum, such as Black Top, which comes from three different origins, so you can control the flavor profile a little bit. It's got lots of nice sweetness, a little bit of funk without being overpowered by that. Or if you're looking for something really sweet and delicious and luxurious, almost like a butterscotch flavor, something like Diplomatico Reserva Exclusiva. These are some of my favorite rums in the world, but I'm gonna go with the Appleton Estate because I really want that typical funkiness of Jamaican rum. And this is gonna live in our back bar. So I like to use this to add richness to a pina colada in tropical drinks like a hurricane, and also to give a daiquiri a really nice depth. And then the final rum we're looking at is gonna be a black rum. And I love Gosling's Black Seal so much. So this, as you can see, is really, really dark in color. And this is indicative of the flavor. Molasses, rich, heavy, burnt caramel, and a little bit of almost like a treacly note coming through. So this is very sweet, but also really, really good in lots of cocktails. Black rum brings that really delicious depth of flavor to one of my favorite cocktails, which is called a Jungle Bird. It's also a really important ingredient in a dark and stormy. All of these three rums are gonna stand up in tiki cocktails, and you can substitute each rum in and out for each other. So when I spoke about the Mai Tai, this also contains black rum. When I spoke about the Mojito, you can make a light Mojito with Eldorado 3. You can make a medium kind of middle ground Mojito using our aged rum, the Appleton Estate, or you can make a black Mojito using Gosling's Black Seal. All of these are completely different, but all super, super delicious. And this is a kind of thing I'm talking about with all of this. We're gonna be substituting ingredients out fairly freely, not necessarily following tradition too hard because I wanna make delicious drinks, which fundamentally are delicious, and we're not gonna be bound by different boundaries and traditions too heavily. So these three rums are gonna give you a really, really good spectrum of flavor on which to build our cocktails around. So now we've got our three rums on the back bar. I wanna talk about another thing which is somewhat related to rum, in that it's also made with the base of sugarcane, this time sugarcane juice, and this is a Brazilian spirit called cachaça. So this is used in cocktails you might have heard of, such as a caipirinha, also a batida, and although this isn't technically rum, it does share some of the kind of similar flavor characteristics. So you'll often get a butterscotch character in cachaça, but it also has a little bit more grassiness, a little bit more astringency, almost tea-like characteristics, which in those cocktails are really, really good. And once again, you can substitute this in where you'd otherwise find rum to slightly change the flavor profile of your drink. So I'm gonna add this to the back bar, and it's worth noting that this is a two-year-old cachaça, and again, you get varying flavors as you work through the different ages of cachaça, but Avoa cachaça, really delicious, really solid and that is going to finish off our rum and cachaça section and now we're going to move into the world of agave all right so now we step into the world of agave spirits specifically tequila and mezcal and you may or may not know this but mezcal is not tequila but tequila is mezcal so what i mean by this is tequila is a specific type of mezcal, which has some rules around it, such as it has to be primarily blue agave, which is the type of agave used to make it. it has to be at least 51% legally, but ideally you want this to be 100% blue agave for the best possible quality. Whereas mezcal can be made using different types of agave, and this can be made in lots of different parts of Mexico, whereas tequila has to come from the Jalisco region and a couple of surrounding municipalities. So it has a very specific set of rules around it. From a flavor perspective, these are wildly different. And again, speaking quite generally about the flavor profiles of the two categories, tequila tends to be a little bit more zesty, a little bit more citrus fruit in there, a little bit more fruit altogether, a little bit cleaner and fresher. Whereas mezcal tends to be kind of rich, big, earthy, robust, and a little bit smoky. And that's thanks to all the smoke that it's exposed to in the production process. So although these are very different products, they do share something in common, which is as they're aged for longer periods in barrels, they take on categorizations depending on how long they're in there. So as with the other spirits we've spoken about, the longer time they spend resting in barrels, the more they take on the oaky notes, a little bit of vanilla and caramel, moving into your kind of rich spice notes. Whereas a really young, unaged tequila will be a little bit fresher, a little bit greener, a little bit more zesty. And all of these categories, which I'll put on the screen, have different utilizations. But I really like a Reposado tequila because it has a little bit of body, a little bit of kind of age on it. And that's what we're looking for in our tequila cocktails, although silver tequila works really nicely. And then from the mezcal front, I like a younger mezcal because I really want to lean into those grassy notes, 
the astringency and the lightness with some of the smoke coming through because I want these to be as different as possible. So one thing you can do is you can interchange these bottles really easily. So if we think of tequila cocktails such as a margarita, Tommy's margarita, also a Paloma, traditionally these contain tequila, but if you substitute out the tequila, bring in the mezcal, you get a completely different dynamic. Still something fairly authentic in its flavor profile and its origin, but it just has more smoke, more of that kind of richness, and it's a completely new take on the drink. So I'm gonna keep hold of these two, put them on our back bar, and now we've got our agave section boxed off. We're gonna talk about the big wild world of whiskey. All right, so now we're stepping into the world of whiskey, which is one of my personal favorite categories and potentially one of yours. And if you haven't discovered the world of whiskey, explore it, it's fantastic. There's such a range of flavor in there, such a range of styles, which we're gonna explore here. And the first bottle I'd be looking at for a whiskey selection would be a kind of house whiskey. And this wants to be big, bold, punchy, because we're gonna be adding it into cocktails. We don't wanna lose the spirit in there with something too delicate. And for this, I'll be looking at something like a bourbon or a rye. So the difference between bourbon and rye from a flavor perspective is bourbon tends to be a little bit sweeter, a little bit more toffee and butterscotch in there, whereas rye can be a little bit more spicy and a little bit more rich. But because the mash bill can be fairly similar on these, you do get a crossover between the two categories. So bourbon whiskey has to contain at least 51% corn in its mash bill, whereas rye whiskey contains at least 51% rye in its mash bill. But the remaining 49% can be quite varied, which is why you do get that crossover in styles. So, Pick one or two of these, whichever one you prefer. I really like Buffalo Trace because I think it's really nice and sweet and toffee forward. I also really like the Woodford Reserve Rye, but Bullet, again, is one of those kind of crossover spirits which has a little bit of spice as well. Explore this, it's a huge category, but I'm gonna start with Buffalo Trace because I really like to mix with this, but this could easily be a rye whiskey and a lot of recipes call for rye specifically. So you do wanna have a rye as well, ideally. But if you were to buy one bottle, I think the Buffalo Trace is a really good start just because it's got that perfect mixing characteristic. You could also look at things like a Scotch whiskey, which is a really good option. So Monkey Shoulder is a blended Scotch, similar characteristics, a little bit more fruit coming through, but these are all winners. They're really good value. I think quite widely available. So whichever one you choose here as your house whiskey, it's gonna be a winner. Just go forth and conquer and make lots of drinks with it. So now we've got our house whiskey. I would also look at a smoky or a peaty whiskey. And I've got two here, which are kind of good examples of this. In fact, very good examples of this, but they sit at opposite ends of the spectrum. So Glenfiddich Fire and Cane, I think is the best introductory peated whiskey on the market. It's also aged in rum barrels, which gives it a little bit more sweetness to balance out that peat smoke. Whereas Laphroaig, big, peaty, medicinal, salty, earthy flavors, which are really, really powerful, but you do need to tame them in cocktails, otherwise it can be quite overwhelming. So I'm gonna put the Fire and Cane on the back bar. But if you wanted to go really big, you could definitely go with a Laphroaig or something similar to that to get those big peaty flavors. And then I just want to stress, there's a world of whiskey out there. It comes from all over the world. I really love Kavalan whiskey from Taiwan. I love Japanese whiskey. I love Irish whiskey. I love Scandinavian whiskey. I love whiskey. You might love whiskey too. So whichever bottle you buy, just make sure you experiment with making cocktails with it. But don't go super expensive to begin with because we're looking for something you're gonna mix. And if you mix it with other big flavors, you'll lose some of the subtle nuances. So these are a really good starting point. We're gonna start with these in our back bar, but we'll explore whiskey throughout the course. You'll find whiskey in a lot of the recipes we're about to cover, things like a penicillin, whiskey sour, Manhattan. There's a huge range of whiskey cocktails out there, which we're gonna find in the future videos. But now we've got our whiskeys on the back bar, we're gonna move on to the next category. All right, so now we're gonna talk about brandy. And although I wouldn't say this is an essential bottle to have in your back bar, if you love brandy, you definitely should. So brandy can be subbed into a lot of different cocktails, anything that's kind of rich and warming, a hot toddy, a penicillin, any sour style drinks can work really nicely with brandy. And there's a few different types of brandy. So brandy itself is actually an umbrella term for any distilled spirit made with fermented fruit juice. Typically this is grape, but you can also have it made with apples such as Calvados. And we're gonna be talking about things like cognac, which has to be made in the cognac region, Armagnac, which again has to be made in the Armagnac region, but it's made all over the world. So when it comes to choosing a bottle for our back bar, I'm going with the Hein Cognac, which is a really good blend of those things we're looking for, value, availability, quality, versatility. So this is gonna live on our back bar, and it's a really, really nice option. It's got those really nice deep grape notes, but we could also look at something like Pisco, which is really popular in Chile and Peru, something like Grappa from Italy, or even a Calvados, such as the Avalen. 
These are all really nice, have very distinctive personalities when it comes to the flavor profile, but whichever one you go for, mix it in, mix it out, substitute other spirits in and out for it, and you'll get really good results. So now we've talked about brandy, we can start talking about aperitif and bitter style liqueurs. All right, so now we're gonna talk about bitter liqueurs and Amaro. And I've got a selection here in front of me, all of which have very different flavor characteristics, but these work really well before dinner, after dinner as an aperitif or a digestif, but they also work really, really well in cocktails. And they often go together really nicely, pair them with different spirits like gin, bourbon, lots of different spirits. And we're looking at drinks like a Negroni, a Spritz, a Paper Plain contains some of these ingredients, a white Negroni, white Jungle Bird, black Manhattan. But these have quite varying flavors and intensities. So if we're looking at just one bitter liqueur, I'd say go for Campari because it has a really nice balance of bitter sweet flavor, kind of grapefruit, rhubarb, quite rich, but quite a high bitterness when compared to Aperol. Whereas Aperol itself tends to be a little bit more orangey, a little bit lighter, a little bit less bitter, and also much lower ABV. So if you're looking for a lower ABV cocktail, Aperol is definitely gonna be your friend. We've also got some really delicious Amari here. We've got the Amaro Nanino, which is a little bit fruitier, still has plenty of those bitter, sweet, complex notes. And we've got Averna, which is a bit richer, a little bit darker, a little bit more treacly, but still really nice and bittersweet. And I also categorize Sousa in this category, which is a bitter gentian based liqueur. It substitutes in place of Aperol or Campari really nicely in things like a white Negroni, a white Jungle Bird, and you can get really delicious results with this, although it's a big flavor. So you do need to kind of tame it down nicely. So this is a huge spectrum. I'd say the most essential would be Campari, which is gonna live on our back bar. I'd also chuck Aperol on there because I think it's a really versatile ingredient, but don't kind of miss out on these. These are really delicious. Again, can be used to make lower ABV drinks and that's our bitter liqueurs. So now we're gonna move on to our next section, which is gonna be our sort of fruit and more versatile liqueurs. All right, so next up, we're gonna be looking at some liqueurs for your bar. And there are countless flavors of liqueur out there, but what I recommend doing is buying the liqueur based on the flavor that you love. So if you really love oranges, buy an orange liqueur. If you love cherries, buy a cherry liqueur, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And within these categories, we've got a huge range of drinks. So with your orange liqueur, which is, I'm going with Cointreau, you're looking at things like a margarita, things like a cosmopolitan and a Long Island iced tea. In your cherry liqueur, we're looking at things like a last word, Amaretto can be an amaretto sour. Blackberry is gonna be in a bramble. Violet is gonna be an aviation. Cacao is gonna be in a 20th century. And elderflower works really nicely with a lot of different cocktails. So I'm not gonna tell you which liqueurs to buy specifically. Buy the ones you love and then go from there. But two things you need to bear in mind here are the sweetness level and the alcohol level. Because you might need to adjust the other ingredients in the drink to make sure it's balanced when you add it. So if it has a very high ABV like Cointreau, which is 40%, you might wanna bring down the spirit a little bit. If it's very sweet, like amaretto, you might wanna bring down your sugar content a little bit, but I'll give you these templates, you can play around with them at home, and then we can introduce your liqueurs to your drink. I should also mention a coffee liqueur here, but if you're interested in coffee liqueur, you can check out the rest of my YouTube channel, which is all about coffee cocktails. So we'll leave that to one side for now, but let's move on to our next category, which is gonna be our herbal ingredients. So now we're gonna look at some herbal flavors, which can bring real nice variety to cocktails. So I really like this pair of chartreuses, so you've got yellow chartreuse and green chartreuse. They're quite similar in flavor profile. They're very complex, made with lots of different ingredients. But fundamentally, yellow chartreuse is a little bit less herbal, a little less intense, whereas green chartreuse is much more intense, more herbal, and you get much more intensity of flavor. There are lots of other herbal options on the market, things like Benedictine, even Jägermeister, if you wanna go down that route. But these bring lots of variation to cocktails and something a little bit different to your traditional sweet, sour, fruity spirit, and can go a really long way. So you'll find the yellow chartreuse in drinks like a Naked and Famous. You'll find the green chartreuse in The Last Word. But you could also look at something like Absinthe, which has a really strong aniseed note, kind of strong herbal flavors. But my biggest advice here is to have a gentle touch. Don't overdo it with these, they can be very overpowering. So particularly with the Absinthe, you could even spritz this just over the top of a drink to get that nice aniseed character. But don't go too heavy because it will completely take over the drink if you're not careful. So the green chartreuse is gonna live up on our back bar here but I really do like the yellow chartreuse as well because it's much easier to control. And although you can see these syrups up here, we're gonna talk about those in a future episode. So now what we're gonna do is delve into the fridge, which is just down here, to talk about fortifieds and cherries. All right, so now we're gonna start talking about fortified wines, vermouths and cherries. And as a minimum here, I'd recommend having something from down here. So your dry, extra dry vermouth or an aromatized wine, and then something from over here. 
so you're kind of sweet vermouth. Um, there's a few brands we're looking at here. Martini is very popular. I really like Cocky. I think this is a really, really good brand, which has the delicious Cocky Americano, which is on the lighter end of the spectrum. Cocky Vermouth di Torino on the kind of rich red end of the spectrum. But we've also got some really interesting options in here, such as Discarded. So this is a really interesting product, which I really like. It's a vermouth which is infused with cascara, which is actually the leftover fruit from around the coffee beans, which is often discarded as part of the coffee production process, hence the name. And this brings a really nice kind of raisin character, sticky dates, and a little kind of toffee characteristic, which is very, very complex. So whichever ones you go for, these are gonna be found in lots of cocktails, white Negroni, a martini, a classic Negroni, Manhattan, the list goes on. This is in lots of classic cocktails, but you wanna keep these in the fridge fundamentally because essentially they are wine. They will oxidize and they'll lose quality over time. Buy small bottles if you can, store them in the fridge and don't let them sit there for too long. A quick note on sherry. I think sherry is one of the most underappreciated categories within cocktails. And honestly, I'm as guilty of that as anyone else. I don't have any sherry here with me today, but I really love Pedro Jimenez, particularly as a cocktail ingredient, because it's again got those rich, raise and dried fruit notes in there, lots of sweetness. And we'll explore sherry in the future because I haven't explored it too much up until now. So we'll get these in the fridge, ready for making some drinks. And then finally, I'm gonna to touch upon non-alcoholic spirits. All right, so the final category we're gonna look at, which is actually one of the fastest growing and most important, is our non-alcoholic spirit category. And something I'd mention here is that anywhere you see a spirit, you can actually sub that out, substitute in a non-alcoholic alternative, and you'll still get really delicious drinks. So within this category, I'd recommend starting with two bottles, which represent polarizing ends of the spectrum. So we've got something kind of citrusy, a little bit of fruit in there and some spice, like the Seedlip Grove 42. And this is gonna substitute in any way you see vodka, gin, even an unaged rum or a white rum, or even a tequila blanco. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I'd go for something like a Liars Spiced Cane Spirit, which is a spiced rum alternative. But the reason I chose this one is because it has those rich notes, again, more spice, but also some depth and kind of dark fruit flavor, molasses, toffee, and some treacle in there, as well as our dried fruit. So these do a lot of kind of work. They can be blended together to meet somewhere in the middle. So if you substitute this one in for your unaged or lightly aged spirits, and if you substitute this one in for your aged spirits, so whiskey, aged rums, aged tequilas, that kind of thing, they're gonna do a huge, huge amount of work for you and give you either low ABV or zero ABV cocktails. So these two, all of these, all of these are not entirely necessary. Start with one bottle, pick your favorite, pick your favorite cocktails and let's start building them from there. So now I've talked about all the bottles that you can look into to start making a decision on where you start with your own home bar. We can move on to the next video, which is gonna be just here when it lands, which is gonna be all about the tools required to make cocktails. So I'll see you in the next video. Hello and welcome back to Essential Cocktails. So this is a 50 video course where I'm going to be giving you all of the tips, tricks, tools and techniques you might need to make better drinks all in 50 days. And what we're going to talk about today is the essential tools for making cocktails. And this is a massively inappropriate title because I'd actually go as far as to say that none of these tools are 100% essential and can pretty much always be subbed out for something you might already have in your house, at least until it starts to hold you back. So custom designed cocktail tools are quite expensive, particularly if you wanna buy the best ones. But until then, use what you have. Don't let this be a barrier to entry. Don't feel you have to spend any money because we just wanna get started. All right, so what we wanna do before we even start thinking about making cocktails is to prepare our ice. And to do this, you're gonna want some ice trays, ideally some ice molds. I like to have a smaller size and a bigger size, but don't go too small because you want plenty of surface area when you're shaking the cocktail. Get this in the freezer well in advance and make sure you have plenty of ice because you don't want to scrimp on ice when it's an ingredient in pretty much every cold cocktail. You can also buy bags of ice, but I actually prefer to make my own, A, because it's more economical, and B, because it's more consistent and you can control exactly the size of the ice you make. Once we've got plenty of ice in the freezer, we can start thinking about laying our bar. And none of this is really essential, but I do like to set a nice mise en place or having all my things in place ready to go. So it's an efficient process and an enjoyable process when I make drinks. So first of all, I like to have a bar mat, but again, completely unessential. It just makes things a little bit cleaner and a little bit easier to clean up afterwards. One thing that I would say actually is essential, but I would imagine everyone has, is to have a tea towel to hand so you can clean up any spills and wipe around and do some kind of cleaning as you go, which is really important. I'd recommend having a chopping board and knife in place so you can chop your ingredients, your fruit, your citruses, your garnishes. But again, this is something I'd expect everyone has in their house. And then something that perhaps you don't have, but I really strongly recommend buying actually as a first purchase, would be a really good set of scales. 
not a very expensive set of scales necessarily, but just something that's reliable that can measure to 0.1 of a gram. And this just means we can be very precise with our measurements. If your scales just go to a gram, that's totally fine for making syrups, making a lot of ingredients. But because we're gonna be actually seasoning our drinks, which we'll talk about in a future episode, you do have to have quite a delicate touch and a little bit too much can actually spoil a drink. So if you're gonna make one investment, I recommend a good set of scales that measure to 0.1 of a gram. So in scenario one, let's say you're making a shaken cocktail. The first thing you're gonna need is something to shake the drink in, and that is gonna be imperative, but it doesn't have to be a professional bar tool. So my preferred option, if you can, is to use a tin on tin Boston shaker. We have a bigger tin, a smaller tin, they seal together and you shake the drink in here. And the reason for this is twofold. Number one, it tends to have a much better seal. So you're not gonna get any kind of leakages or spillages or any accidents, hopefully. But also number two, this should last you a lifetime. There's no reason for this to break. It should have that really nice seal. You shake it all together. And this, particularly with the tin on tin, is incredibly robust. You can buy these where you get a glass that goes onto a tin. Still great results, but I just find tin on tin is so robust. They just kind of fit together really nicely because they both slightly adapt to each other to get a really nice seal. And if you can, go for one of these. Another option you have is a kind of three-piece shaker, which is something like this, where you have the base tin, you have the kind of built-in strainer, so you can strain the cocktail through these holes, which is really useful, and then a lid. Similar fundamentals, you're gonna shake the cocktail, but if you see the difference here, the tin on tin, or the Boston shaker style, has much more headroom, so you're gonna get more motion as you shake the drink up and down, more motion in the ocean, so you get a little bit more kind of texture. This one is a little bit smaller. If you have serving a smaller drink, really, really kind of works well. Some people prefer this, Whichever one you have, just use it, pick your poison. They're both gonna do a great job, but I do prefer this just slightly in terms of texture. But if you have neither of these, don't worry about it. Use a Kilner jar or a jam jar or even some kind of sealed container at home. So this works surprisingly well. You just build the drink in here, shake the whole thing up. The only limiting factor of this in particular is it's quite short, so you don't get that headroom to get really nice texture, but still a really, really good starting point. So now I've chosen our tin and I'm gonna go with this one. You can move these to one side. We wanna think about what's gonna go in here. So if you're gonna add some fruit in here, first of all, you're gonna need your chopping board and knife to cut it. And then if you're gonna crush the fruit or some herbs into the drink, you can use one of these, which is called a muddler. If you don't have this, not a problem at all. You can use a rolling pin, which works really well. And all this is doing is just pressing the fruit or herbs just to release the flavor into the drink. So a really important tool to have but it doesn't have to be a specific cocktail tool. In your cocktail, you're probably gonna to wanna to add some kind of citrus or some kind of fruit juice. And in order to do so, you might want one of these, which are called Mexican elbows. But if you don't have these, which are custom designed for squeezing limes and lemons and oranges, again, completely fine. Use your hands, use what you have, squeeze the juice in there. You can perhaps use your other hand as a sieve to catch the pips, but chances are we're gonna strain the drink anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But don't get too hung up on juices. You can use the hand pressed ones. As long as you get the juice from the fruit, that's the most important thing. Next up, you might want to add some liquid to your drink in the form of a spirit, a juice, a syrup, whatever that might be. And you wanna accurately measure this to make sure you can make the same drink over and over again. And if it's not quite right, you know exactly how to fine tune it next time. So I do recommend measuring and jiggers come in all sorts of forms. You got this style, which is my preferred style. And the reason I really like this is it has lines inside each section, which are bands, to give you an idea of exactly how much you're adding to the drink. So this particular model has five, 10, 15, 20, 25 mils on this side. And on the other side, we have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. In the States, you might find a one and two ounce version of this with bands to kind of measure the increments in between. But jiggers come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. These are really popular, which I also like because they're straight sided, but then you have to kind of eyeball within them because they don't have the interior bands. So 25 and 50 mil. These might be one and two ounce, so one ounce is 30 mils, two ounces is 60 mils, so bear that in mind for the conversions. And even if you don't have either of these, that's totally fine. Move them to one side. Grab something you have, which is a similar size to a jigger, something like an egg cup or a shot glass. And to measure exactly how much this holds, all you need to do is put it on a scale, tear the scale to zero, fill it up with water, weigh how much water goes in there in grams. And because one gram of water is equivalent to one mil of water, However much it holds in grams, that's how many mils it holds. So you can use this to then have an idea of exactly how much you're adding to the drink in a way to control exactly your ratios and proportions. So really, really kind of easy to use. 
It might not be exactly a convenient number, which does make it a little bit more difficult. But again, I don't want any of this to hold you back. Use what you have to get great results. Something I can't stress enough is to taste, taste, taste. And if you've made a cocktail in a tin, you're not 100% sure it's gonna be perfect. You can just grab a straw, dip it in the drink, put your finger on the end, have a little taste, check you're happy with the balance. If you do this before you add the ice and before you shake the drink, obviously it's gonna be a little bit more intense. So you do have to kind of allow for a little bit of variation when you get the final drink. But this will give you a really good understanding of primarily the balance of the drink to make sure you're happy with what you're about to shake up. Obviously don't double dip your straws, so make sure that goes in the wash after use. But I do recommend using reusable straws. Definitely don't use plastic for this because it's incredibly wasteful. Next up, you're gonna to wanna to give this a really good shake with lots of ice. And now you've got your cold drink ready to go. You wanna serve this in a glass. So the professional tools to do this would be a hawthorn strainer and a fine strainer to catch all the little shards of ice and any kind of fruit that makes it through. But if you don't have these, that's completely fine again. Hawthorn strainers come in all different shapes and sizes. But if you've got a nice tightly coiled spring, that's a really good sign to not let too much through. And with a fine strainer, substitute this out. You can use something like this, just a sieve. You can use a tea strainer. And in place of your hawthorn strainer, you can just pour it through your kilner jar, just closing the lid slightly to kind of catch the main bulk of the ice through your sieve and you get really good results. Another thing you can do if you really must, which I don't really recommend, but it does just about get the job done, is put the smaller tin on the bigger tin just to catch the main bit of ice. But this does let a lot through and it's very difficult to control. So this is your plan Z if you're gonna do that, but at a pinch, it will do a decent job. If you're making a stirred drink, you might want something like this, which is a mixing glass. But if you don't have a professional mixing glass, that's also completely fine. You can use the bigger tin from your Boston shaker. You can even use a pint glass. Anything that's big enough to hold the liquid will work pretty well. And you're gonna to wanna to stir it with a spoon. So professional bar spoons look like this, which have your kind of round neck, I guess, or something like this. But if you don't have these, that's completely fine. You can actually get really good results just by using a chopstick and this will get you pretty similar results. The benefit of having a longer spoon is that you can reach all the way to the bottom of the ice and you can get the whole thing moving rather than just the top part of the drink. So ideally a bar spoon will be great, but if you don't have that, go with the chopstick. You wanna strain your drink into a glass, which I recommend keeping in the freezer. And if you were to have three glasses, I'd recommend a kind of short water glass, a taller highball glass, and some kind of coupe or martini glass. But again, whichever glass you have will work perfectly well. Just bear in mind you don't want these glasses to be too big, either because they'll look really empty when you add the cocktail, or you'll need to multiply your recipe up, which might get you quite drunk, which is not ideal. To prepare your garnishes, you might need something like a peeler, a grater, or a lighter. And then, with all that, and potentially a blender too, if you wanna make some blended cocktails, you'll be really well set up to make the vast majority of cocktails. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you can see the rest of the course where we start using these tools to make delicious drinks and I'll see you in the next video. Chances are, if you've ever ordered a cocktail and been really disappointed, either because you didn't enjoy it or you thought it just wasn't how you expected it to be, it's not the ingredients, it's the balance that's the culprit. So any component element of a cocktail can completely ruin it. If there's too much alcohol, it'll be too boozy and hot. If there's too much citrus, it'll be sour and kind of uncomfortably sharp. And if there's too much sweetener, it'll be sickly sweet and just really kind of coating and too much. So what we're gonna to do today is two experiments. First of all, to identify whether you prefer kind of less sweet things and more acidic. Otherwise, maybe you prefer very sweet things. And then in the second experiment, we're gonna look at exactly how much booze you find to be around about perfect for yourself. So you know you can add a little bit less if you find it too overwhelming or a little bit more if you're all right with that. So let's get started with the first experiment. So this first experiment is designed to just give you an understanding of where you sit on the spectrum of sour to sweet and your preferences. Most people sit in the middle in the kind of balanced ground, but some people do really like sour things. Some people like really kind of very sweet things. And you probably know this yourself, but I do recommend carrying out this test. So what I'm gonna do here is to each glass, which has the same thing in it, 25 mils of lemon juice and 100 grams of sparkling water. I'm gonna add sugar in increasing levels. So to these, I'm gonna add monin sugar syrup, which is the cane sugar. And this is equivalent to a two to one sugar syrup. So two parts sugar to one part water. In the first glass, we're gonna leave the 25 mils of lemon juice and 100 grams of soda water on its own. In the second glass, I'm gonna add 10 mils of sugar syrup. In the third glass, I'm gonna add 20 mils of sugar syrup. 
and in the fourth glass, I'm adding 30 mils of sugar syrup. So I'm just gonna give these a little mix together to make sure they're fully integrated, and then we'll give them a taste. And as you can already tell, they're gonna get sweeter as we go along. But it's kind of good to understand where you sit with these preferences, so that when you make a cocktail, you can think, okay, the base spec is 25 mils of lemon juice and 10 mils of sugar syrup, let's say. If you know you lean sweet and you prefer sweeter drinks, you can increase the sugar, you can decrease the citrus or vice versa. So let's give the first drink a taste, which is our lemon and sparkling water. Cheers, everybody. Sour sparkling water, kind of nice, but definitely a little bit sharp. Here's the 10 mils of sugar syrup added. So this is kind of dry, like a traditional lemonade and pretty good. Definitely still taste the lemon. A little bit of sweetness coming through, but not too much. Now let's try the 25 mils of lemon juice to 20 mils of sugar syrup and 100 grams of sparkling water. To me, that's pretty perfect. Just really delicious lemonade, not too sour, not too sweet, just well balanced. And then finally, let's go with our last glass, which is 30 mils of sugar syrup. So to me, that's too sweet. Not crazy sweet, but definitely too sweet. And what I recommend you do is if you sit down at this end, you're probably looking towards a more sour drink. If you're here, you're gonna to wanna to add a little bit more sugar to your drinks. If you like one of the middle two glasses, so somewhere between 10 and 20 mils of sugar syrup to balance 25 mils of lemon juice, chances are the recipes on this course are gonna be just right for you in terms of balance. But as I said at the beginning, they're always templates. So feel free to make adjustments if you want to. So now we understand where we sit on our kind of sweet and sour spectrum. We're gonna take this glass, which is to me balanced. So 25 mils of lemon juice, 20 mils of sugar syrup, and 100 grams of sparkling water. And I'm gonna add different amounts of alcohol to this to understand my kind of preference when it comes to alcohol level. So onwards with number two. Okay, so now we've got what I consider to be four very well balanced glasses of essentially lemonade. So 25 mils of lemon juice, 20 mils of sugar syrup, 100 grams of sparkling water. We're gonna make these into essentially a Tom Collins by adding gin to it. So I'm gonna go in with our beef eater and in each glass, I'm gonna add 20 mils more and we'll see where I sit on the kind of alcohol perception preference scale. So 20 mils in the first glass will be our lowest ABV. Gonna go 40 mils in the second glass, which is pretty standard spec for a Tom Collins, maybe closer to 50. We're gonna go 60 mils in the third glass, which is getting pretty boozy. And then in the final glass, if it fits, we're gonna go 80 mils, which is probably beyond what recommended recipes would call for, but it's just interesting to see these things. So we'll give these a little stir and then we'll give them a little taste. And again, I recommend doing this, drink responsibly, don't drink the whole thing, but interesting to see where your preferences lie when it comes to alcohol. So here's the lowest ABV of 20 mils. Still tastes mostly like that lemonade, which is really delicious, but I don't get much gin. Gonna go 40 mils. Gin's coming through nicely. I think actually it's really well balanced. Could probably go a little bit more. So I think this might be potentially my favorite. Actually, that's way too much. 60 mils is overwhelmingly gin-like. It's delicious, but I think it's now out of balance. So it probably goes without saying that 80 mils, here we go, takes me back to being a teenager when you mix your own drinks without using any measures. Really boozy, really hot, but these two are my favorite. I think probably 50 mils, probably closer to 40 is where my preferences lie. But now I understand this, I can factor it into my cocktail recipes. So now we've got a pretty solid understanding of where we sit when it comes to our preferences, when it comes to sweetness versus acidity and citrus. We also understand how much alcohol we like in drinks. The next thing we can explore is different sweeteners. So obviously I've used a straight cane sugar syrup, but there are many different sweetenesses you can use in cocktails. And we're gonna explore those more in the next episode, which is just it. So I'll see you in the next video. All right, welcome back to Essential Cocktails, everybody. Today we're gonna to be talking about sweeteners. So when you think of cocktails, there are actually many, many different ways of sweetening cocktails. And what we're gonna to do today is talk through some of my absolute favorite ways to do this and the power that this holds. So whenever you see a sugar syrup in a recipe, you can actually substitute in pretty much any of these options we're gonna talk about today. 
and we're going to start with talking about different sugars, followed by flavoured syrups, and followed by some other alternatives you could choose, which are going to really give you the power to level up your drinks. So, without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so first of all, we're going to talk about sugars. And as you can see here, sugar is not one thing. Sugar is many, many different things. There are lots of different types of sugar, and within that, there's lots of different flavor characteristics which we can look for. And what you want to do when you choose a sugar is think about the drink you're making. So if you were to make, for example, something gin-based, which is light and floral and delicate, a little bit kind of citrusy, something like this, which is caster sugar, is going to taste very, very different to something like this, which is molasses. So these two look completely different. And if you've ever tasted these two things, you'll know they taste drastically different. And working through this spectrum here of some of my personal favorite sugars to use, caster sugar, clean, neutral, brings basically nothing but sweetness. Golden caster sugar has a little bit more richness coming through, but only like a very light caramel, kind of really still quite delicate and light like a caster sugar. Then we've got the pair of Muscovados, light and dark. Two of my favorite sugars to use here because they bring really nice kind of richness, toffee notes, butterscotch, and even a little bit more kind of burnt caramel flavors in the dark Muscovado. And then as we move into our molasses, very rich, very heavy, almost kind of bittersweet with that burnt caramel and kind of cinder toffee kind of flavors. So very different. And as you move through the spectrum, you get more intensity and more kind of impact on the final drink. And then we've got things like coconut sugar, which although it's made from coconut, doesn't really taste like coconut. It's more kind of malty and biscuity, but you can pair this with coconutty flavors, tropical flavors, tiki flavors, and it brings a nice storytelling element using the same kind of base ingredient as a lot of the other ingredients in the drink, particularly coconut. So when we look at these sugars, one thing you can do is pair your sugar to your spirit, and then you're gonna really change the flavor profile of the drink. So if we take a mojito, a mojito with caster sugar and a kind of white rum, a very light rum, is gonna taste very different to a mojito made with, let's say, light Muscovado sugar, and then maybe an aged rum, maybe around about an eight year, versus a dark mojito made with something like a dark Muscovado sugar or a molasses, then maybe a Gosling's black seal rum. These are gonna be drastically different drinks. The mint, the sweet and sour will be common, but the actual flavor profile will be worlds apart. So even within a very similar template, you can get drastically different drinks, and that's the power of this approach. So when you've chosen the sugar you want to showcase, you need to make a sugar syrup. And there are a few different ways of doing this. You could make a one-to-one -one sugar syrup, also known as a simple syrup, which is as simple as it sounds, equal parts sugar and water. You could make a semi-rich sugar syrup, which is 1.5 parts sugar to one part water. A little bit thicker, a little bit less water, therefore a little bit sweeter. But my preferred way of doing this is a two-to-one sugar syrup, also known as a rich sugar syrup. And the reason I like this is threefold. Number one, it means you can actually sweeten the drink without adding as much water as you would in a simple syrup, let's say, because obviously if it's a one-to-one -one syrup, you're gonna to need to add more of it to get to the same level of sweetness as a two-to-one. So this gives you a little bit more control over the dilution. Number two, it still pours perfectly easily, so no concerns there. And then number three, it's actually more shelf stable than a simple syrup because of that higher sugar content. So once you've done this, literally add two parts sugar, one part water, bottle it up, and then store it in the fridge and you're ready to go. So I wouldn't recommend keeping this more than a month, but because it's such an easy process to follow, you can scale it down so you don't have too much sugar syrup left over. But if you don't wanna go through this, what I do recommend doing is going with something like a Monin syrup. And what I love about Monin syrups is the quality is really high, but also they're two to one. So they have that same sweetness level across the board, meaning you can transfer different syrups in and out. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the next section, which is our flavored syrup section. So when it comes to flavored syrups, you've got two options. Number one, you can make your homemade syrups by infusing fruits, spices, herbs into the sugar syrup, and that's really effective. But because we're focusing on kind of commercially available, high quality syrups, which are easy to execute over and over again, we're gonna be looking at Monin syrups for this course. So three of my favorites are vanilla, coconut, and orgeat. And because we're gonna be looking at quite classic drinks, things like a porn star martini with vanilla syrup, some tiki and tropical drinks, which introduce coconut syrup, and also the orgeat syrup, which is in the Mai Tai. These are readily available, really high quality, and just mean you can pour those drinks anytime you want to. So don't be scared of commercially available syrups. They're actually really high quality and a really good way to substitute out a regular sugar syrup, bring in a flavored sugar syrup and create a brand new flavor experience in the drink. So now we've talked about flavored syrups, 
we're gonna talk about a few other alternatives you have which can level up your drinks. So now I've touched upon a few different sugars you can use and also some flavored syrups. I just wanna talk about a couple of options we have which can slightly change the dynamic of some drinks and give you something different again. So the most obvious would be honey, which you'll find in a penicillin, a hot toddy, but you can also bring this into a lot of whiskey-based drinks, any kind of warming drinks, even some summery drinks work really nicely with this. And I do recommend bringing this down with a little bit of water, just so it's more pourable. And actually with all of these, you can introduce water to get the same level of sweetness you would from a two to one sugar syrup. So I do recommend experimenting with that. Something like maple syrup probably won't need bringing down because it's already quite pourable. Agave, perhaps not because it's still quite thin. Date syrup will definitely need bringing down with water. And then golden syrup and treacle 100% will do because they're super thick, rich and heavy. So you can again substitute all of these in where you'd see sugar syrup and bring something completely different to your drinks. Agave in particular is really exciting. This pairs really well with tequila, with mezcal. You'll find this in a Tommy's margarita, a picante. But again, you can bring this into lots of different kind of tequila, agave, mezcal based drinks and it'll bring synergy, but also a really delicious form of sweetness. So now that we've got an understanding of all these different sugars available to us to introduce to our cocktails, as I've said before, my recipes are templates rather than hard and fast recipes. So I really do recommend experiment, 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 introduce different sugars to existing recipes, try new things, try flavored syrups, try all these different options, see what you like, see what you don't, and you'll definitely learn something along the way. And now we've done that, we can talk about another really, really important factor when it comes to building cocktails, which is seasoning. So you can watch that video by clicking here. The idea of seasoning cocktails seems like an alien idea to a lot of people, but when you think about chefs, they wouldn't dream of creating a dish without seasoning their food. So we're buying the best ingredients possible, we're putting them together in a really balanced way, but if we don't season our drinks appropriately, we're not gonna bring the best out of our ingredients. So today I'm gonna to show you my three favorite seasonings. So the first seasoning we're going to talk about today is salt, specifically saline solution. And in order to make this, my personal recipe, which I prefer to go with, is one part salt to five parts water. Mix the two together, dissolve the salt into the water, and then put it into a little dripper bottle like this, just so you've got plenty of control over exactly how much saline you're adding. And because salt is a big, powerful thing, you want to be very careful that you don't overpower the drink, but equally, a little bit goes a really long way. And if ever you've done the test of adding a little bit of salt to a drink versus not adding the salt, a lot of the time, the drink with salt will come out on top. So most cocktails tend to be built around sweetness, acidity, and bitterness, and incorporating salt into this is actually a really, really powerful thing to do. So in the past, I've talked about uber foods and uber drinks, where you'll hit multiple taste components. So when we think about sweetness, acidity, bitterness, We've also got salt, we've got umami. Some people argue fattiness is one, piquancy or spice is another, and even the alcoholic burn could be argued to be a kind of taste component. But what we're doing here is bringing more complexity to the drinks that we serve. And salt has a really interesting interaction with other taste groups. So salt tends to bring together acidity and sweetness when you add it to cocktails, but it also suppresses bitterness. So when I make coffee cocktails, because there's an inherent bitterness there, I do often add salt. But when I'm looking for that kind of big, wide, sweet and sour flavor profile, I probably won't. So I wouldn't add salt to a daiquiri because I do want the width of the sweetness and acidity with the rum kind of coming through the middle. But what I would add it to is something like a Tommy's margarita. So famously, salt works really nicely with lime. It wants to all come together, which the salt does a really good job of, bridging the tequila, the lime, the agave, and just making the whole drink work together really nicely. Another example would be a porn star martini. Although it is technically a sweet and sour drink, what we're doing is really celebrating the passion fruit. So rather than kind of bringing the width of the acidity and the sweetness as primary notes, which has easily happened, I like to use salt to really focus everything in, bring together those edges, and really make everything look at that really delicious passion fruit underpinned by the vanilla. And that works really well in there. So saline solution, although this is a small bottle, is very, very powerful, can have a massive impact on your drinks. If you want to test this, I'd recommend making a drink Add in one drop of saline at a time until you can taste salt, and then you know you've gone too far. The goal here isn't to make the drink salty. That's definitely not what we're looking to do. What we're trying to do here is elevate the ingredients in the drink to get the very, very best from them. So saline solution, extremely powerful. Now we're gonna move on to my second favorite seasoning. So if the saline solution is gonna be the salt in our seasoning, I'd say bitters are 
going to be treated a little bit more like pepper, where they're going to bring a little bit of bitterness, as the name suggests, a little bit of warmth, and just a new level to drinks, which tend to be more sweet and sour. So if you're going to buy one bitters to rule them all, aromatic bitters are the way to go. I really like scrappies, but Angostura bitters are widely available. And if you're gonna buy a second bitters, something like a Seville orange bitters or a regular orange bitters will work really nicely. So aromatic bitters tend to be a little bit more spice driven and work really well with aged spirits, but also a lot of stirred cocktails like a Martinez, a Manhattan, but also in your more sweet and sour drinks like a Pisco sour, which they work incredibly well in and they're kind of a critical ingredient. Whereas your Seville orange bitters or your orange bitters tend to be more pithy. Think of the kind of peel of a citrus fruit, bitter, sweet, acidic, this is what you're looking at here. And this works nicely with kind of fruit flavors. Works really nicely in my porn star martini recipe, which we'll cover in a few episodes, because it really focuses in on the passion fruit. So these two are gonna go a really long way, but you've also got all sorts of flavors of bitters. So when you've got these, you can experiment even more. So we've got things like uh, chocolate bitters, which is gonna bring that really nice kind of cacao nib bitterness. We've got black lemon bitters, grapefruit, lime. These are gonna be more towards that kind of pithy flavor, but there are so many bitters in the world. so go for your life, enjoy them, try them, and see which works well for you. And now we've got our bitters, we've got our saline sorted, we're gonna talk about number three, which is vanilla extract. Okay, so the final seasoning to talk about today is gonna to be this little powerhouse, which is vanilla extract. And this might seem like we wanna add vanilla to drinks, but that's not the goal at all. Similar to the salt, we're not making the drinks taste salty, nor are we making the drinks taste like vanilla. So you can add this in very small proportions until you reach that threshold of the drink tasting like vanilla and then just pull it back for the next time you make the drink. Vanilla is delicious, so it's not too much of an issue. But what this does is just rounds everything out. So if you've got a drink that's a little bit spiky, a little bit rough, a little bit stringent, you can add vanilla extract and it just softens the whole thing. And kind of in the same way as vanilla in a spiced rum, just makes the whole thing a little bit more mellow and a little bit more manageable. Vanilla extract does that in cocktails. So I wouldn't use this all the time. I use it quite sparingly, but in your drinks, which are kind of focused on like something like a whiskey sour, it's really nice because it just seems to bring those big acidic sweet flavors and the whiskey just brings them all together and focuses in on the whiskey nicely. So a little bit really does go a long way. So even half a gram will make a massive difference. And if it's something that has those kind of vanilla notes, something like Amaretto actually works really nicely with vanilla your kind of aged spirits, your rums, your aged whiskies, your bourbon here, that's gonna be really nice with vanilla. But what we don't wanna do is take away from their flavor. You just wanna underpin it and add a new level. So now we've talked about my three favorite seasonings, salt in the form of saline solution, bitters, which we're treating a little bit like pepper, and then finally vanilla extract, which has a massive impact on drinks, but we do use fairly sparingly. So in the next video, we're gonna focus on something absolutely critical to every cold cocktail, not only the taste, but also the texture and the temperature of the drinks, and that's gonna be a deep dive into ice and dilution. So that's gonna be the next video in the series, and I'll see you there. If I were to ask you what one ingredient is in pretty much every cocktail that's ever been made, the answer of course would be water. So just like in the coffee industry, when I think a lot of people underestimate the power of water, even though it makes up a massive proportion of the drink, I think in the drinks industry, water in the form of ice, dilution and occasionally hot water in hot drinks is often massively overlooked. Even though it has a fundamental impact on things like the temperature of the drink, but also the taste and the texture. So today I'm gonna to run through my top tips when it comes to ice and dilution so that we can make the best possible drinks every single time. So the first thing I wanna talk about, which is really important, is the quality and consistency of the ice. And before we even have ice, obviously we have water. The water wants to be neutral tasting without any kind of chlorine flavors or metallic flavors. It wants to be the water you'd be happy to drink fundamentally because you're going to. We're gonna freeze this into consistent cubes and ideally have an ice tray that you use repeatedly. I've got four or five of these, which means I always have the same size ice cubes for shaking. And I always use eight cubes when I shake a cocktail. And I also have these bigger cubes, which I use for serving drinks over, giving a little bit more surface area and a slower dilution, because I want the drink that you serve over ice to take a much longer time to dilute, so you've got more time to drink it. So consistency wise, the same ice, the same amount of ice. Ideally, it wants to come straight out the freezer like these. And you can see with these ice cubes, they're really nice and firm. They haven't started to melt, which is really important. I'm gonna be using these straight away so we can really control the dilution. 
If we're going to be using ice that's been sitting out for maybe 15, 20, 25 minutes, obviously it starts to melt, it starts to round off at the edges, it loses this kind of dry look and we get much more water introduced to the drink straight away. So as soon as you add the wet ice into the drink, it immediately starts diluting, the clock starts ticking and with wet ice that start to melt, you really won't get the drink down to the temperature you want to, but more importantly, shake it to the texture you want before the drink becomes over diluted. So the first tip I'll give here is to use the same really high quality ice made with neutral, delicious taste in water. Use the same amount, same size, same shape in every cocktail. That way, whichever drink you make is completely repeatable and easy to control the dilution. So number two is probably something a little bit less obvious, and that's to measure your dilution, particularly when you first get started making cocktails. And by doing this, you really understand how much water you're introducing to your drinks, which otherwise you wouldn't be able to do. So the process for this is really easy. Add your glass to some scales, tear the scales, add all your ingredients to the drink so you know exactly how much the ingredients weigh before dilution. Add the ice, stir it down or shake it up. Then pop your serving glass onto the same scales, tear them off and pour the liquid into the glass, measuring how much you end up with. In the case of this drink, this started off as being just under 70 grams and after stirring ended up being just over 90 grams, meaning we added just over 20 grams of water, which equates to around about 30% dilution. So measuring this gives you a really good control over how much water you're adding and you start to understand exactly how much time it takes to add how much water. And one thing you need to think here is any less than 20% is gonna be really kind of low dilution, giving big boozy flavors and allowing those spirits to come through. Anything over 40% is gonna be quite watered down. But again, you need to think about the ABV of the ingredients in the drink. And that 20 to 40 is probably a sweet spot that most people will enjoy, but not everyone. So make sure you understand where you are in terms of dilution so you can tailor the drinks either to yourself or whoever you're serving them to. So the final point here is a really important one and it's to be intentional. So what I mean by this is to make sure that things you want to be cold, start off cold. So you wanna freeze your glasses to make sure as soon as you add liquid to the glass, it doesn't start immediately warming up. If there's ice in there, you wanna make sure again, this hasn't started to melt because as soon as you pour liquid over ice, it's gonna to start to dilute even further. And if that's wet ice, it's gonna happen really quickly. So even controlling your dilution in the stirring or shaking process will be for nothing. And then finally, if you're making something that really needs to be as cold as possible, you can even freeze your spirits to give you as much time as you can to stir it down to the appropriate dilution with ice and get it as cold as possible, then served in a frozen glass. And then with those three tips, number one, using high quality, consistent ice. Number two, measuring your dilution. And number three, being intentional with temperature. You're much more likely to get the drinks that you intend to serve. So now we've covered those three tips, we're gonna move on to the next video in the series, which is gonna be how to make clear ice. Welcome back to Essential Cocktails, everybody. Today, I'm gonna to show you the easiest way to make clear ice, which is an amazing way to level up the visual appeal of your drinks. So, let's get started. So, what exactly is clear ice? So, clear ice is ice without any of those impurities, without any bubbles, which just looks like a completely transparent block which is gonna sit in your drinks. And you may have seen this in some really high-end, top-level cocktail bars, but it's actually really easy to do. And particularly on a small scale like this, you can do it at home. And it doesn't require any really very specific tools, just this, which is actually quite easy to get hold of. So the first thing we're gonna need is a cool box like this one, which ideally you can store with the lid open or even take off, even better, and leave that to one side. And the reason this works is called directional freezing. So directional freezing is where you insulate the sides around the water so that it freezes from the top down. And in doing this, all of those impurities in the water actually end up at the bottom, which freezes last. And you get all the kind of really nice, clear, pure ice sitting on top. Other than that, you're just gonna need a tray to catch the ice in later, which does make a little bit of mess. You could use a sink, but a tray is more hygienic. You want a chopping board and you want a serrated knife, and we're good to go. So step one is to fill up your cool box around about three quarters of the way with water that you'd be really happy to drink. So something that's neutral tasting, flavorless, odorless. And then you're gonna put this in the freezer for between 24 and 36 hours. Step two is after those 24 to 36 hours, take your cool box out of the freezer, put it on a tray, turn it upside down, and just give it a gentle press to release the ice block. When you've done that, leave it in the tray for around about 15 to 20 minutes just to temper. And after that, we're ready to carve. I recommend doing this with very clean hands for yourself, but if you're doing this in a commercial environment, you must always wear gloves. Once the ice is tempered, you wanna start carving your ice. And this is actually really easy to do. Just make score lines with a serrated knife on all four edges, just where you wanna make a cut. And then very gently give your knife a tap with something like a rubber mallet 
just to release the ice and this should happen fairly easily. Keep making cuts until you've got the shapes you're after and you'll be left with these amazing clear ice cubes perfectly cut for the glasses you're gonna serve the drink in. So this works really nicely with things like an old fashioned, any kind of stirred down drink served over ice it looks really good with. With anything shaking, it's a little bit pointless because you get the kind of emulsion and the kind of creaminess from the shaking process, but anything stirred with this looks fantastic. So now we've got our glassware with our amazing ice to serve our drinking. We wanna start thinking about how we can level up the drink even further. And we're gonna do that through garnishing, which we'll cover in the next episode. Welcome back to Essential Cocktails. Today, I'm gonna to show you my top three extremely simple, but extremely effective garnishes. Let's get into it. So the first garnish we're gonna talk about today is a citrus peel. And this is extremely simple. Could be from an orange, could be from a lemon, could be from a grapefruit, which I have one just here. Could even be from a lime, although these are quite small. And the principle here is extremely simple. Ideally, if you can peel your citrus first before juicing, that means you get maximum yield from your fruits and that's always a good thing. So whenever you can approach things from a kind of zero waste mindset to maximize flavor output, always do that. So the process is really simple. Just start at the top, work across the fruit if it's quite small or down the fruit if it's a little bit bigger. Give yourself a nice big swathe of citrus. Before doing anything with this, you wanna express it over the drink if that's part of the recipe. So hold it over the drink, squeeze, as you'll see in lots of different recipes on this channel. And then once you've expressed those oils, which you wanna do on drinks which have particularly aquafaba, because this can have a slight aroma and the citrus really covers it over, or just any drink that wants that little zip and zing of freshness over the top of it, you wanna use this as a garnish. So now we've got our kind of piece of citrus here. We wanna tidy it up nicely, just using a knife. So straighten out the edges on both sides as our starting point to give yourself a nice long peel. Then you can either just box off the ends for a nice tidy garnish, or you can even take it into a slight diagonal to kind of give it a little bit more elegance. I think that will be called a trapezium. And then you've got these really nice, simple, effective looking garnishes that can just sit in the drink or on top of the drink or on the side of the drink. And it's also very aromatic. It smells delicious in here. A variation on our very long peel is gonna be a citrus coin which is really easy to take. So just using a serrated knife this time, just kind of cut through the citrus without going too deep and then back out again. To give yourself this little, probably two pence pieced coin, which again, you can express over the drink for a little bit less zestiness. But this is the foundation of our next garnish, which is gonna be a flamed peel, which is all related to our peels. So with this, you wanna hold it probably with three, two fingers and a thumb, I should say over the drink, so when you do squeeze it, it goes over the drink rather than away from it, also away from a customer. So take your lighter to flame our peel. You just wanna warm it up, obviously being very careful. And then when you're ready to express, just give it a little quick squeeze. And then you can rim the glass, drop in your coin, obviously ensuring your hands are nice and clean. And you have a really nice looking flamed citrus peel coin. It also gives a really nice aroma to the room, so win-win right there. So the next really simple garnish we're gonna look at, again, is a citrus-based garnish, and this is gonna be a slice. So a lot of cocktails, you'll see a citrus wheel. I use this in tiki drinks because they're kind of all about excessive garnishes, which really add to the visual appeal. But my general approach to garnishing is keep it extremely simple, and if in doubt, leave it out. If it doesn't add anything to the drink visually, aromatically, or from a flavor perspective, I'd actually rather it wasn't there. So one I use sparingly is gonna be a citrus slice. So I don't use these very often because I don't think they're the best looking garnish, but I actually use it more functionally. So if you want an opposing color, that's really kind of easily done with citrus fruit. But more importantly, I use these as a way to rebalance the drink. So if you've served someone a drink and for example, you think it's balanced, but you think they might actually prefer it a little bit more kind of acidic, a little bit more vibrant and zingy with the citrus fruit, you can actually serve the garnish on the side. Make sure you cut it lengthways, just like this, and then into small eighths, essentially. And then you can just slide these into the drink, giving the drinker the option to squeeze it in if they want to, but also not if they don't want to. So citrus slices can look great, can add to the aroma, but most importantly, they can impact the taste balance of the drink if you want to retrospectively. And then finally, we're gonna look at dried fruit. So the final garnish we're gonna talk about now is dehydrated fruit. So this works with all sorts of things, lime, lemon, 
grapefruit, blood orange, even because these are quite seasonal. So you can actually dehydrate things in season so you can eat them out of season. So blood orange is one of my favorite fruits in the world. Here I have some, which is not in season right now, but I could give this a little taste and it'd be delicious. And also things like pineapple I really like to use. These are all quite striking looking, but they also have really intensified flavor because you've removed all the moisture from them. So a couple of things on that. Because you've removed so much moisture, they keep for a really, really long time. So this is a really good way to preserve fruit. But also one drawback of this is it doesn't have a huge amount of aroma on the drink. So when you compare the peel of a citrus fruit to a dried fruit, something like this, although it does have a little bit of aroma, it doesn't have anywhere near as much zing and freshness as a citrus peel. So you can actually combine the two together, express the zest over the drink and then garnish with a dehydrated fruit. That's both aromatic and visually beautiful. But if you just include this, then you wanna make sure that the drink is well balanced, has enough acidity that you're looking for, because this definitely won't bring it, but it does have plenty of delicious flavor when you give it a taste. To make these, all you need to do is cut the fruit really, really finely, put it in the dehydrator, turn it on to around about 50 to 55 degrees, which is my preferred temperature, but it will vary for different fruits. And you wanna leave this for at least 24 hours until as much of the moisture as you can has been removed from the fruit. This will give you these amazing shelf-stable garnishes which you can use all year round. So there we have three really simple, really powerful garnishes you can use in your cocktails, and there'll be plenty of examples of these in the future. So I'll see you in the next episode. Today we're gonna to talk about five of the most popular ways to mix cocktails. Shaking, double shaking, stirring, building and blending. In this episode, I'm gonna try and help you understand which technique you use when you're making certain drinks, the impact it has on the drink, and also give you some examples of drinks that use each technique. So, let's have a look at it. So before we get into those five different methods of mixing drinks, we wanna talk about why exactly you would do this. And there are three primary reasons. Number one is to mix the ingredients together. Number two is to chill the drink. And number three is to bring some dilution to the drink. Whichever method you go for, you need to be quite intentional with because it's gonna have a big impact on the texture of the drink primarily. So first of all, we're gonna talk about shaking. So when it comes to shaking a cocktail, there are a few things you really need to think about. First of all, you wanna make sure you use plenty of ice. Even though it seems kind of contradictory, using more ice actually gives you a slower dilution because the drink stays nice and cold. Whereas if you just add one or two ice cubes, they're gonna melt pretty quickly and they're actually gonna dilute the drink before you reach the texture you're looking for. Again, whichever shaker you go for, make sure you seal the two together nice and tight and you wanna hold onto it with two hands. One hand on top, one hand underneath. And when you shake, there are many different ways to shake a cocktail. And the evidence seems to suggest that whichever way you go for can be greatly effective, as long as you shake it for around about 12 to 15 seconds. So if you wanna read more about this, you can read Liquid Intelligence, which does a lot of work into this. But fundamentally, plenty of headroom, shake it really hard end to end, and make sure the ice has plenty of room to travel and the drink also goes up and down through the shaker. You don't wanna go side to side because it's just kind of going all over the place without really mixing. You wanna use the full capacity of the shaker to get as much back and forth as you possibly can in the drink. The same applies for your kind of three-piece shaker. Top and bottom, make sure you hold on nice and tight so you don't have any spillages. Shake, shake, shake. Could be a kind of up and down, could be a over the shoulder, could be straight back and forward, but it has to feel comfortable, has to get the job done, and shake nice and hard. Really important, however you shake, shake hard. But when would you do this? So these are kind of rules of thumb. They're made to be broken, but they're also there for a particular reason. So shaking a cocktail is usually done when there's citrus in the drink, when there's dairy in the drink, or when you wanna really aerate the drink to get it nice and vibrant and bubbly and foamy and alive. So this is found in lots of different cocktails, daiquiri, last word, paper plane. These are all shaken cocktails because they all contain citrus. But if you wanna take this one step further and get even more texture on your drink, you can do what's called a double shake. So one of the key variations of shake in a cocktail is called a double shake. And this incorporates a dry shake. So rather than just shaking the drink once with ice, you're actually gonna do two shakes, once with ice and once without, either dry first or dry second. If you do the dry shake first, where you just shake the cocktail to kind of emulsify it, that will be a dry shake. Whereas if you do it after the main shake with ice, that's a reverse dry shake. So both of these work really well, experiment with both. But when I talked about emulsification, that's kind of important here because it's gonna be used when you incorporate things like egg white or aquafaba or even pineapple juice. You can use this technique in drinks which are sour based like a whiskey sour or a pisco sour or even something like a white lady. 
I actually try and avoid this process as much as possible because it is a little bit fiddly. If you're using things like pineapple juice, egg white and aquafaba, you do want that really firmy texture. But if you also use ice that's fresh out of the freezer, you can just give it a single really hard shake over ice and avoid the need to do this. But if your ice has been out of the freezer a little bit longer, you might want to do this so you don't shake it too hard and overly dilute the drink. So now we've got a shake, we've got a double shake, we can talk about stirring cocktails. So if you're making a drink that doesn't contain citrus or it's almost entirely booze, you might want to stir the drink. And this doesn't add anywhere near as much aeration as your shaking and double shaking. It's kind of silkier, more refined, a little bit smoother, but equally powerful. So you do this when you're making drinks like a martini, as long as it's not a shaken martini, a Manhattan, a Martinez, and an old fashioned. And if you think about the texture of those drinks, they're very elegant, very silky not kind of vibrant and alive, which is what you're gonna get with a shaken drink. So again, the technique for this can be really simple. You just wanna stir the drink down over lots of ice using a bar spoon ideally, but also a chopstick might work. And then once you reach the level of dilution you're looking for, strain it out and you'll get that really nice silky cocktail. This retains a lot of really nice aromatics of the drink, but also it gives a really nice kind of clear final drink, which obviously if you're shaking the drink, you're gonna aerate it and lose that. So now we've got our shaken drinks, our double shaken drinks and our stirred drinks. We're gonna look at building drinks. So when it comes to building drinks, what this means is building the drink in the glass. Something like a mojito would be a really good example of this, or any drink that you're gonna to top with something like soda water, tonic, or even sparkling wine. And the reason to do this is to avoid overly diluting the drink, or to keep the entire pieces of fruit, herbs, or spices in the final drink. So when it comes to the mojito, you're actually muddling the mint into the drink and leaving it in there. But you do have to be careful that if you're building in the drink, you don't break the glass when you muddle too hard. So now we're gonna talk about the final technique today, which is gonna be blending. So a final technique we can look at, which is featured in things like a pina colada and all sorts of frozen cocktails, is gonna be blending drinks. And this is really useful if you wanna leave the entire fruit in the drink or to get that kind of really nice blended, smooth, almost creamy texture, if you can add something like coconut milk or cream. And it's just a really interesting way to do things where you actually blend the ice completely into the drink rather than straining it out. So when it comes to adding ice, if you add a little bit of ice, you'll get a kind of almost milkshake texture. Whereas if you add a lot of ice, it'll become very thick, almost like a slushy. So there's no right and wrong here. I prefer it a little bit on the looser side so you can at least drink it rather than eating it. But your mileage may vary. If you like disco drinks, you might like them to be kind of slushy drinks, which is totally fine. But I like to go a little bit lighter, a little bit more pourable, a little bit more sippable, and we'll see a pina colada in the future, which I'm very excited to share with you. So now I've got a really good foundation to build upon. We've covered some essential bottles, some essential tools, the importance of balance, sweetening drinks, seasoning drinks, all sorts of ways of presenting the drinks, including ice, clear ice, garnishes. I think we're pretty much ready to start mixing some cocktails. Welcome back to Essential Cocktails, everybody. Today I'm gonna to show you what I think is the quintessential sweet and sour cocktail, which is a daiquiri. And I'll also show you how you can introduce fruit to this, such as strawberries, to make something like a strawberry daiquiri. So, let's get started. Okay, so the daiquiri is not a new drink. It's actually a really old drink invented over 100 years ago in Cuba, and it just contains three things. Rum, being number one, and you can use different types of rum for this, lime, and then sugar syrup. And I'm gonna be using cane sugar syrup for this. And there's lots of variations on a daiquiri. You can introduce fruit in all kinds of different ways. You could also blend it if you prefer. But today we're gonna to be shaking up two daiquiris, classic and with strawberry. So the two recipes are actually gonna be exactly the same with the exception of strawberries being in the strawberry daiquiri. And because both of these drinks contain citrus, as we learned a few episodes back, we're gonna be shaking this drink. So the first thing I wanna do is prepare my strawberries for the strawberry daiquiri. And I'm going quite heavy on this, six strawberries, because these are super delicious, really kind of flavorsome strawberries. If you want to go more of that, you can add even more strawberries. Or if you want it to be more rum forward, you can add a little bit less. So this is a personal preference thing. I like a strawberry daiquiri to be quite, you know, fruit forward, but it's up to you, which is your preference. And if you like it boozy, obviously add much, much less, maybe one or two strawberries. So I'm just going to be cutting these into four, removing the heads. And actually, if you use these heads, strawberry tops. You can actually infuse these into spirits and liqueurs. Strawberry top Campari is really delicious. Strawberry top gin is really delicious. Strawberry top vermouth is very delicious. And just infuse this into the liquid for a few days and you get loads of strawberry flavor coming through, even though these are often kind of wasted products. So consider that a little zero waste hack there. 
So I'm just gonna finish this off with my six strawberries, just reserving an extra one for later for garnish, and then we're gonna start building the drink. So now we've got our strawberries prepped, we're gonna start building the daiquiris. And these have exactly the same spec. And when it comes to the specs for a daiquiri, there's a few different ways you can approach this. If you want it to be really kind of booze forward, obviously you can add less of your sweetness and acidity. If you want it to be more sweet and sour, you can add more of that. So I like to go with 60 mils of rum in my drinks. And in this version, which I think is a really nicely balanced daiquiri, we're gonna accompany this with 25 mils of lime juice, and I'm just adding 12.5 mils of sugar syrup, which is a two to one white cane sugar syrup. And before I add the other ingredients, we're just gonna muddle up our strawberries just to release all that really delicious strawberry flavor. So you just wanna press this into the sugar syrup to make essentially a strawberry syrup. But you can also use different syrups here. A vanilla syrup might be really nice. We're kind of moving away from a pure daiquiri at that point. We're adding lots of other flavors. But as I've always said, these are templates. You can adapt them, you can adjust them. You could use raspberries here. You could use blackberries. Lots of berries work really nicely. Passion fruit's also really good. So just mix it into the sugar and then we can move on to our citrus fruit. Next up to each drink, I'm gonna add 25 mils of freshly squeezed lime juice. And ideally, this wants to be as fresh as possible. So I squeezed this just a few minutes ago, but if you wanna make this in advance, I'd recommend doing it probably less than a day before serving if you can. And 25 mils gives you a nice balanced drink. If you want it to be more boozy, maybe bring this down to 20 mils and 10 mils of sugar syrup, but this is a really well-balanced drink. We're gonna go 60 mils of rum. And once again, template style, I'm going with an eight-year-old Jamaican rum. You could use a younger rum, you could use a darker rum, you could use a more intense rum, a lighter rum. Just bear in mind whichever rum you do choose will impact the final flavor profile of the drink. You could even blend them together, which works really well. So you can get a bit of richness of darker rum and then the kind of tropical notes of a lighter rum. So 60 mils goes in. Next thing we wanna do is give this a really good shake over ice. It's gonna pour our liquid into the bigger tins, giving them a good firm knock and we'll shake these up. Now we'll shake our fruity strawberry daiquiri. Grab out our chilled glasses from the fridge, and then we're gonna fine strain each of these, starting with our regular daiquiri, because this will leave our strainer nice and clean. The fine straining just removes any of the kind of ice shards from in the drink. Gives you a really nice texture. And then the strawberry daiquiri, which is a little bit thicker, so we'll take a little bit more strain in, but it's fully worth the effort. You can see the fruit does clog the strainer a little bit, but that's all good flavor. Gonna garnish with half a strawberry on our strawberry daiquiri, and then a little bit of dried lime on our regular daiquiri. And there we have a daiquiri two ways, strawberry and classic. Welcome back to Essential Cocktails, everybody. Today I'm gonna to show you how to make one of the most popular cocktails in the world, which is a whiskey sour. Okay, so the whiskey sour dates back to around about the mid to late 1800s, and it's such a delicious drink, and I think this is a perfect gateway into the world of whiskey. So if you're not a massive whiskey fan, which is completely fine for now, give this drink a try, and I guarantee you, you'll find a way to really start enjoying whiskey. And once you're down the rabbit hole, you'll never look back. The world of whiskey is an incredible world, so there's lots of different flavors to explore. And I'm pretty confident you just haven't found the right whiskey for you just yet. And um, this is a really good way to find it. So to make a whiskey sour, essentially kind of build in a box around the whiskey to elevate it, bring it to the forefront, but also add some kind of sweetness, acidity and bitterness and a little bit of creaminess, just making it a little bit more approachable for people. So in order to do this, we need to start with a whiskey, of course, and you can use any whiskey for this. I like to use a bourbon, which is kind of a traditional way to do things, but you could go with a rye, which would be a little bit more spicy. You could use a Scotch whiskey for a Scotch sour. You could use any international whiskey, which will bring different flavor characteristics, but let's keep things traditional for now. We'll go with Buffalo Trace as our kind of foundational whiskey sour ingredient. To bring our sour element to the drink, which makes it a whiskey sour, we're gonna go with lemon juice, and this ideally wants to be freshly squeezed, and we're gonna balance this with a little bit of a two to one morning cane sugar syrup. So you can use, again, any sugar for this. It will just change the characteristic of the drink, but we're gonna keep things kind of traditional here. So we've got whiskey, we've got sourness, we've got sweetness. 
We're gonna add some bitterness in the form of aromatic bitters. I'm going with scrappies, but you can explore with different bitters here. And we want that really nice kind of creamy, foamy texture that you've had in a whiskey sour before. And there's two ways to do this. There are probably more, but two primary ways. So the first of which being to use aquafaba, which is essentially the water from inside a can of chickpeas. And if you can avoid using the salted water, that makes a massive difference. And although this sounds a little bit strange, don't be put off by this. You don't taste chickpea in the final drink at all. It just brings that really nice kind of foamy texture. But if you wanna go for a more traditional route, you can use an egg white, which works beautifully well, but obviously not everyone eats eggs. So I'm gonna go with the plant-based alternative, which is aquafaba. So because we want a really nice foamy texture and we're using citrus in here, we're gonna shake the drink. And you could even actually incorporate a second shake into this, a dry shake, as we saw in our double shaking video, which I'll link above. But because I'm using ice that's straight out of the freezer, you actually don't need to necessarily do this. You can give it a really good hard shake to get that really nice emulsified texture. So a whiskey sour starts with whiskey. And we want a fairly handsome pour of this. So I'm going with 60 mils. We're gonna go 30 mils of our freshly squeezed lemon juice, and then 15 mils of our two to one mon and sugar syrup. And that four to two to one ratio of spirit to sour to sweet is a really popular ratio that a lot of people enjoy. But as with anything, you can adjust this. You can add more sweetness, less sweetness, more sourness, less sourness, more spirit, less spirit and find the ratio that works for you. I'm gonna go with two to three dashes of bitters, but again, if you prefer it a little bit more bitter, go for a touch more. And then 15 mils of our chickpea water, which is called aquafaba. And you don't need a huge amount of this to kind of bring that really nice texture. We don't wanna add any chickpea flavor, which it really doesn't do anyway. But if you went too high, it'd be unnecessary. It'd almost be too foamy. And this is the perfect amount for this drink. I'm gonna give this a really good hard shake of lots of ice to really whip things up and get that nice texture gonna fine strain into a chilled glass with lots of ice. We're just gonna finish off the drink with a nice slice of lemon. And the reason for this is twofold, adds a really nice contrast of color to the cherry, but it also gives people the option to add a little bit more acidity to the drink if they prefer. Just gonna skewer the lemon wedge, skewer the cherry, avoiding the stone. And there we have a delicious whiskey sour. Cheers everybody. Today I'm gonna to give you one mojito recipe that you can use to make at least three completely different drinks. So let's get into it. So the mojito originated in Cuba, but its popularity is spread all over the world. It's a super popular drink. And if you see one mojito ordered in a bar, pretty much immediately after that, you'll see five, 10, 15, 20, because if you see a mojito, you want a mojito. So the recipe I'm gonna give you today, although technically kind of the same, has variations within each category to give you very different results. So we're gonna cover a full spectrum of mojitos from the lightest and most refreshing to the darkest and richest, but they're all completely delicious. So we're gonna be building our mojitos in the glass and I've got three glasses here so you can see the difference between each drink. And I'm gonna start off with around about six to eight mint leaves in each glass. So this is gonna be our kind of core flavor to the mojito. As with anything, if you add more mint, it's gonna be more minty, gonna be kind of a little bit more refreshing, add a little bit less and it'll be more kind of rum forward. But you know your own preferences. If you love mint, add more mint. If you're not a huge fan, add a little bit less. So now I've got our mint bases. This is where it really starts to get interesting. For our lighter drinks, we're gonna have a cane sugar, which is a two to one cane sugar syrup from Monin. And then from the darker mojito, I'm gonna go with a two to one light muscovado sugar syrup. And straight away you can see these are gonna give pretty different results. If you tasted cane sugar versus light muscovado sugar, you know, they're completely different, but we're gonna add the same amount of our two to one syrup to each drink. So in our lightest mojito, we're gonna go with 20 mils of our cane sugar syrup. And this is our really clean base. It allows the light rum to really shine through. In our kind of medium mojito, 20 mils of our light sugar again, because we don't wanna overpower the rum in this. We want it to still be very vivid and evident. But then as we move into our dark mojito, which is a completely different flavor profile. I'm gonna add 20 mils of our two to one light muscovado sugar syrup, which brings sort of butterscotch notes, burnt caramels, toffee, really different to our clean white sugar and a little bit more character coming through as well. We're just gonna give these a very gentle muddle using our muddler or rolling pin. And we don't wanna to press too hard here because if you really bruise the mint or tear it, it's gonna become quite bitter. You just wanna release the oils in the mint, which then infuse into the syrup. So do the same with our sort of medium mojito 
and then finally our dark mojito. So with each of these, I've added 20 mils of our sugar syrup. If you like your mojitos a little bit less sweet, obviously add less, maybe 15 mils. If you like them a little bit sweeter, maybe go up to 25 mils. But then to balance that, we're gonna go in with 30 mils of freshly squeezed lime juice. And this is a really important flavor in a mojito. Just brings that vibrancy, acidity, and freshness to the drink. And 30 mils per glass. Our spirit base in each mojito is actually gonna be rum, but they're gonna be three different rums. A lighter rum, a kind of more middle ground aged rum, and then a very dark rum. So first of all, we're gonna start in our very light mojito with 60 mils of aged white rum from El Dorado. So if you wanna learn more about these bottles and why I've chosen them, you can click on the video above, which explains all of my back bar decisions. So in our lightest mojito, we've got our aged white rum into our sort of medium mojito. I'm gonna go 60 mils again of a Jamaican aged rum, Appleton Estate. And this brings those kind of funky tropical notes, a little bit of pineapple coming through, which is really delicious. Whereas our white rum over here is more white chocolate, kind of unripe banana, very different flavor profiles. And then finally, into our dark mojito, we're gonna go 60 mils again of Gosling's Black Seal Rum. And this really complements that kind of darker sugar in there. Very rich, completely different to the light rum. This is more treacly, molasses-like, and got that really nice kind of dark sugar going in there as well. Another thing about this mojito template is it's really versatile. You can incorporate lots of different flavors here. Things like gin work really well, apple leaf flavors, elderflower, a full range of flavors work in a mojito, lots of fruit flavors as well. So I really do encourage you to experiment with all these. We're just gonna two thirds fill each glass with crushed ice. And then just give them a little stir with a spoon just to move the mint around really and to mix the sugar, lime and rum together. Not to add too much dilution because there's a lot of crushed ice in here. So just go really easy with it. Be kind of strategic with your movements to move that mint around. And this is just gonna really integrate all those ingredients together. We're not looking to churn the drink up too much because we don't want to over dilute. We're just gonna to top these up with crushed ice. You can add something sparkling here if you like to. Something like soda would work really nicely in the light mojito. Champagne works really well in a mojito or even ginger beer in the dark mojito. But I actually kind of prefer to leave these out. I think these drinks work really well on their own and I don't like to over dilute them. So just to finish off the drinks, Gonna go for a small straw, a medium straw, and a large straw. And then when I was picking the mint leaves earlier, I reserved these really nice big sprigs, which if you want to, you can just give a little slap to bring back to life and release the aroma. Add that into each glass. And there we have three fantastic looking, smelling, and also tasting mojitos. Hope you enjoy these. Today on Essential Cocktails, we're gonna make one of the most popular cocktails in the world, which is a margarita. So the margarita is an amazing cocktail that most people have heard of, and at its heart, it's essentially a tequila sour with some flavor accents of orange, often in the form of Cointreau, and lime in the form of freshly squeezed lime juice. So our three core ingredients are gonna be tequila, orange liqueur and lime juice. And on a little tray or some kind of receptacle, you wanna pour out some really good quality sea salt, which you can either pour straight out, or you can also crush up slightly if you want a slightly finer result. So just breaking down any little pieces into a slightly finer grind is what you wanna do. And the margarita is a great template for so much experimentation. So some people add fruit to this, which gives you a little bit more kind of sweetness often, a little bit more flavor complexity. Chili is a really good ingredient in margarita, but what's common is gonna be our tequila base, sweetness and sourness. So to get started, you wanna take your salt, which is now a little bit finer than it was before, and with your glass, you wanna grab some lime and take a small section out of this just to kind of rim the top of the glass. So just make a couple of small cuts to give yourself a lime wedge. And what we're gonna do is just coat the top rim of the glass with a little bit of lime, just so we have essentially an adhesive for our salt to stick to. So you can go all the way around, you can just go halfway around if people wanna try it with and without the lime and salt, but I love salt, so I'm gonna go the whole way around and be fairly liberal with our salting. So just now, really importantly, you wanna just connect the outside of the glass to the salt, not the inside, because we're not adding salt to the drink directly. We want it to be something that kind of is external to the drink, bringing texture and also taste. 
So if you have any salt sitting on the rim of the glass that's likely to fall in, I recommend just running a very clean towel or tissue just around the inside to make sure none of the salt falls in. And you should have a fairly uniform salt rim around the edge of your glass. So around about three quarters of a centimeter should be plenty. And now you've got this, you wanna whack this into a fridge or a freezer to get it really nice and cold. Or if you don't have a fridge or freezer to hand, you can just add an ice cube into the glass or a couple of ice cubes to get it nice and chilled down. So now we've prepped our glass, which is a really important first step. We can start building our cocktail. So this is gonna be a shake and drink because we have citrus in the drink. And we're gonna start with a fairly healthy pouring of tequila. So the margarita was invented in around about the 1930s or 1940s in Mexico. And it's a pretty murky history, just like lots of cocktails. But what we do know is tequila is gonna be a fundamental ingredient to any margarita. You can also blend in some mezcal. You can use a Blanco tequila, Reposado, Añejo, doesn't really matter. Just think about the tequila that you use. This is gonna have a massive impact on the final flavor of the drink because it's a core component. A younger Blanco tequila is gonna be a little bit more grassy, a little bit more kind of citric and refreshing. A Reposado tequila like this is gonna have a little bit more sort of caramel coming through, a little bit more of the kind of aging notes coming through. An Añejo is gonna have more of those again, so it'll be quite rich and intense. And if you had a mezcal in there, you're gonna get smoky notes, a little bit of grassiness and almost astringency. You can blend, pretty much do whatever you want, as long as it has an agave spirit at the base. And I personally recommend a Reposado tequila as a really good starting point. If you wanna learn more about tequila and also all the bottles on the back bar and why I chose them, you can check out the Essential Bottles episode, which I'll put above. But what we're gonna do now is start building the rest of our tequila. So we've got our spirit base. Now we need our sweetness and our acidity because it's essentially a sweet and sour drink. So we're gonna go with 25 mils of Cointreau. And this brings those really nice orange notes, but also a lot of sweetness. But we do need to remember this is 40% ABV, so it's a fairly high alcohol content. And then to balance this, 25 mils of lime juice. And you can add fruit in here, just muddle it into the bottom of the tin. Herb spices will cover the Picante Della Casa, which is a really similar kind of margarita template with chili and coriander in a future episode, so make sure you subscribe for more. We're just gonna shake the cocktail with lots of cubed ice. And then we can fine strain the cocktail into our now chilled Nick and Nora or coupe glass. We're gonna garnish with a little bit of dried lime. And there we have a delicious, salty, tequila-based sweet and sour drink known as the margarita. Enjoy everybody. Welcome back to Essential Cocktails, everybody. Today we're making a super refreshing cocktail called an Aviation, which is botanical, floral, citrus forward, and downright delicious. So let's get started. So the aviation has a couple of really interesting stories behind the name. One of which being that the aviation industry in the 1910s and 1920s, around when this drink was being created, was a really kind of growing industry, and this drink was a homage to that. And the second being that this drink, which contains a really interesting ingredient called creme de violet, which contributes a kind of distinctive blue-purple color to the drink, that the drink was named after the color of the sky, where the airplanes would go. So a couple of different stories. We're not sure which is exactly true, but both of which seem pretty relevant. So this is a sweet and sour cocktail, creme de violet being one of our sweeteners, and the other one being maraschino liqueur. So these are our sweet elements. We have our sour element, which is gonna be our lemon juice. And this is a gin-based drink. So I'm gonna go with our beef eater gin once again, but whichever gin you have is gonna work really nicely in here. This is a really straightforward recipe. It's gonna be a shaken drink because we have citrus in here with 50 mils of gin at the base. And this gin brings a really nice botanical character. Obviously we have citrus in there, we have juniper, which is obviously the key botanical in there. And this is just light and refreshing and kind of the beating heart of the drink. But it's not the only element. So our sweeteners in the creme de violet bring florality primarily. I'm gonna go 15 mils of this. And this brings that really vivid kind of vibrant purple color, as well as 15 mils of maraschino cherry liqueur. You can go with a clear one like this, but you could also go with a more colored kind of rich cherry liqueur. Both work really nicely. Obviously the clear keeps the drink a little bit lighter. If you have a more rich colored cherry liqueur, it's gonna be a little bit more red, kind of purpley colored. But this combination of cherry and violet with the kind of freshness of the gin just really works so nicely. And then to add our sourness, 15 mils of lemon juice. So this is a really simple spec. 
we have 50 mils of gin and then 15 mils each of our creme de violet, maraschino liqueur and lemon juice. And we're gonna give this a really good hard shake over ice. This drink has an awesome color. We're gonna fine strain this into a chilled Nicanora glass or a coupe glass. And you can see that really nice violet liqueur. It's had a big impact on the color of this drink. And I do understand what they're saying with the blue sky reference. Gonna garnish with a boozy cherry. And there we have a delicious, refreshing, floral and citric cocktail called an aviation. Enjoy that one. All right, welcome back to Essential Cocktails, everybody. Today we're making a drink called a White Lady, which is perfect for you gin lovers, but also those of you who love sweet and sour drinks. So let's show you how to make it right now. Okay, so in terms of style, a White Lady is actually quite similar to a whiskey sour, but we're actually substituting that whiskey, which is obviously the dominant flavor in a whiskey sour, and we're gonna introduce gin to the drink, which really does change the dynamic altogether. And we're also gonna bring in a little bit of an orange flavor in the form of Cointreau. So these two become our kind of key flavor notes. A whiskey sour is obviously whiskey, sweetness and sourness with a little bit of bitterness. Whereas this is gonna be more floral, more delicate, more kind of citric and refreshing. And it's a really nice alternative to the whiskey sour. Just like the whiskey sour, we're gonna need our sweet element, which is gonna be freshly squeezed lemon juice. We're gonna need our sweetener to balance this out which is gonna be our Monin two to one cane sugar syrup once again. And then finally, once again, we're gonna go with aquafaba as our kind of emulsifier to bring that really nice creamy texture without adding any dairy to the drink. But if you prefer, you can go for egg white, which is more traditional, but it's obviously not a plant-based option, not suitable for vegans. So we're gonna stick with our chickpea water, also known as aquafaba for our recipe today. So this drink has quite an interesting story behind it, which is that it was designed originally in the 1920s to be a lighter alternative to a classic martini. And I'd say it does a good job of that. I'd say it's quite a different drink in terms of style. Less boozy than a martini, a little bit more refreshing, sweet and sour, and I think it does its job perfectly of being an alternative to a martini. So we're gonna start off with 50 mils of beef eater gin, or whichever gin you have. And obviously the gin you choose will slightly impact the drink when you're adding so much of it to the drink. And then we're gonna balance this, bring in another flavor of orange with 20 mils of Cointreau. Again, use whichever orange liqueur is your favorite. But just be mindful that Cointreau is quite a high ABV, so we're gonna to wanna to give this a good shake to make sure we get plenty of dilution in there. Because 70 mils of 40% ABV alcohol is actually quite a lot, even though this drink doesn't feel particularly boozy. We're gonna go 20 mils of our freshly squeezed lemon juice for a little bit of zip and zing, and also works really nicely with the gin. 10 mils of our two to one sugar syrup, and I would recommend using a white sugar here. Brown sugar would be a little bit jarring in this drink. So 10 mils of our white cane sugar syrup at two to one ratio. I'm using the Monin. And then finally 20 mils of our aquafaba or one egg white. And this will bring that really nice fluffiness when we shake it up. With this drink, I wanna get it as light and fluffy as possible. So we're actually gonna do a double shake or a reverse dry shake. So first of all, we're gonna shake it with lots of ice to begin with to get it nice and chilled and a little bit of dilution in there. So I give that around about a 15 second shake. And then we're just gonna strain this from the bigger tin into the smaller tin. Don't need to fine strain this just yet. Just gonna ditch our old ice into the tin and then give this a second shake with no ice, which does feel a little bit strange because it's quite a quiet process, but this really just emulsifies everything and gives it that really nice whippy, light, airy texture. Another sort of 10 to 15 seconds. Now you just need to fine strain this into our chilled coupe glass. And you can see how lovely and foamy and airy that drink's gonna be. We're gonna express a big peel of orange zest over the drink. This just gives another layer of freshness and acidity and zing to the drink. Just gonna gently rim the glass, tidy up our garnish. Just make it into a little perfect rectangle. Pop that on the side of the drink. And there we have a delicious, light, refreshing and clean white lady. I think when a lot of people think of Mexican cocktails, they think of the margarita, 
which although it's an incredible drink and we've covered that in previous episodes, you shouldn't overlook the Paloma. So the Paloma is a longer drink, it's bubbly, and it's arguably even more refreshing. So we're gonna make that today. So the Paloma is actually a really simple drink to put together, which might explain a lot of its popularity, but it's also extremely delicious. And tequila is at its base, as you might have expected, but you can even blend in a little bit of mezcal to this. I like to go three parts tequila to one part mezcal if I want a little bit more smokiness coming through, but for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna stick with tequila now. It also has acidity coming from freshly squeezed lime juice. And if you wanna balance this out, you can add a little bit of agave nectar, but I would say don't overdo it because a lot of the grapefruit soda, which we're gonna lengthen the drink with, has a lot of sugar anyway. So a lot of the time, this isn't necessary. But what we're going to do to kind of bring all these big flavors together is add a little bit of saline solution. So a lot of classic recipes call for a pinch of salt, which is incredibly difficult to be consistent with. You can easily overdo it and spoil a drink. But using a saline solution with one part salt to five parts water just gives you so much more control over this. And I actually use seasonings quite a lot in my cocktails, which I covered in an earlier video in the course, which I'll put just above for you here. And then to finish the drink, we're going to add something sparkling, refreshing, which is going to be grapefruit soda. So I'm going with Jaritos, which is a Mexican option, quite traditional, but there are lots of grapefruit sodas on the market. And I'd say just give them a little taste beforehand so you understand how acidic they are, how sweet they are, and how fizzy they are, and then you can adapt your recipe accordingly. So if you don't have Jaritos grapefruit soda, because it's not that widely available across the world, that's completely fine. You can either watch this video for a really good solution, or you can even just blend grapefruit juice and soda water to top up the drink around about half and half, and you'll still get a really good result. In that case, you might just need to add a little bit of agave to bring a little bit of sweetness. We're gonna build the Paloma straight in the glass, which I've chilled in advance. And we're gonna start with 40 mils of tequila. But as I mentioned earlier, doing 30 mils of tequila, 10 mils of mezcal is actually a really good option as well. Just brings a little bit more earthiness and a little bit more smokiness. But for simplicity's sake, 40 mils of tequila and 15 mils of freshly squeezed lime juice. And so far, we're looking quite close to a margarita, but this is where we kind of depart from the margarita template. So first of all, if your soda's not very sweet, you can add a little bit of agave nectar, which obviously is the base of your tequila, your mezcal, so it's kind of in keeping and synergistic, bringing lots of sweetness, but because we're using Jaritos, which does have a really good level of sweetness, we don't really need this in this recipe. So now I've got our spirit base, our acidity from the lime juice, the option to add some sweetness from the agave nectar, I wanna add a little bit of saltiness to the drink, which won't taste like salt, but it just brings everything together really nicely. So in order to do this, just gonna add our glass to the scales. And I like to add quite a lot of this. So one gram of our one to five saline solution. And this is a pretty magical ingredient. So with a margarita, obviously you're adding salt to the rim of the glass. You can also do that here if you like to. You can add chili to this. You can add tropical flavors like pineapple work really well. But this is just gonna be a really kind of clean grapefruit for a drink with that nice tequila underlying. And then now our base is ready, we're just gonna add our ice. And don't scrimp on the ice, you wanna add as much as you can fit in the glass because you want this drink to stay really nice and cold for as long as possible. So I've gone five or six big cubes and then we're just gonna finish the drink with around about 100 grams, or in fact, exactly 100 grams of our Jaritos grapefruit soda. Just gonna to top this up. Just leave a little bit of room so you can give it a stir, first of all. So I've not added all of my 100 grams. Just gonna give it a little mix together to make sure all the ingredients are fully mixed. Top it up to 100. I'm gonna garnish with a nice big grapefruit wedge which you can squeeze into the drink if you like. Finish it off with a straw. And there we have the most refreshing tequila-based drink I can think of, the Paloma. Enjoy everybody. <music> Caipirinha is a three ingredient Brazilian cocktail that's so much more than the sum of its parts. Cachaça, lime and sugar combined to create one of the most refreshing cocktails imaginable and today I'm going to show you how to make it. Welcome to Essential Cocktails. All right, welcome back to Essential Cocktails, everybody. I'm Dan Fellows, and in this course, I'm sharing with you 40 of the most popular cocktails in the world. And this cocktail, the Caipirinha, 
is one of my absolute favorites. There aren't many things more refreshing than a caipirinha. And although this is a very simple drink on the surface, there are actually quite a few different ways of making it. And I'm gonna show you my preferred way, but there are lots of other kind of techniques you can use, building it in the glass, building it in a shaker, shaking versus churning, etc., etc. But this works really nicely. So the caipirinha is built around cachaça, which is the national spirit of Brazil. And cachaça is an interesting one. If you're not familiar with it, it kind of sits within the realm of rum, although it isn't rum. And whereas rum is often made from molasses, which is a byproduct of sugar production, cachaça is made with fermented sugarcane juice. And you might be thinking this is very similar to rum agricole. And there are elements that are similar, but there are lots of different rules around cachaça, where it's made, how it's made, which make it distinctively itself. So cachaça can be completely unaged. You can get a lightly aged cachaça, like this one, which is aged up to two years in oak barrels. You can get more heavily aged. All of these will have slightly different results. The younger it is, the more kind of vibrant and grassy it will be. Whereas the more time it spends aging, the more it will mellow, take on some of those nice kind of vanilla caramel notes. And this is a really nice sort of butterscotchy, slightly grassy cachaça, but play around with whatever you have. So all you're gonna need to make a caipirinha is gonna be your cachaça of choice. You're gonna need one big juicy lime and then something to sweeten the drink. And there are a few different schools of thought here. Some people really like to use a granulated sugar. The argument being that it helps to kind of encourage the oils out of the skins of the lime. But I find this is a little bit inconsistent. A lot of people don't weigh how much sugar they're using, so you get varying levels of sweetness. I like to go with one lime, a fixed amount of sugar syrup, and get very consistent results. So the first variable we're gonna talk about here is whether you make this in a shaker tin or in a glass. And because these are quite delicate glasses, I don't wanna be muddling too hard into these, so I'm actually gonna put this in the fridge to get it nice and cold. I'm gonna build it in our shaker tin. To get started, you wanna prep your lime, make sure it's a nice clean lime, and you just wanna remove the kind of nubbins on either end. So this one, and if there's a little nub in there, just pick that off. It's not gonna to do too much damage to the drink, but it just avoids it going in your mouth. I like to cut this into half and then cut each half into quarters. So you get these nice eighths of a lime, which have a nice surface area to crush. But some people like to cut this lengthways. Some people even remove the pith, which is an option. If you have particularly bitter pith, then you may want to remove this, but I'm not bothered about that. I think actually a little bit of bitterness is welcome in the drink. So I like to leave them as they are, as a kind of scattering a very wide pressable lime eighths. I'm gonna pop these all into our tin. And then to that, I'm gonna add my sweetener, which is gonna be 20 mils of a two to one sugar syrup. I'm going with Monin Cane sugar syrup. And this just balances out the acidity of the lime. And we're gonna muddle the two together to give them a really nice base, which we're gonna build our cachaça and caipirinha on top of. And we're just gonna muddle these together to give ourselves a kind of sweet and sour, lightly pithy and bitter base. Squeezing out all the juice from the lime, but not too hard. You don't wanna overdo it and get too much bitterness from the skin, but it will just give you sweetness acidity, and these really sit alongside the cachaça to create a delicious harmony of those three ingredients. A really nice variation here is called a caipirinha de uva, where you add grapes in here as well, maybe five or six. Crush those in with the lime and the sugar, and you get that really nice kind of grapey, tannic acidity in there, which really complements the lime. So that's a really recommended variation. And then to our lime and sugar, I'm gonna go for a healthy pour of cachaça. It's gonna be 60 mils. But again, this is a kind of template which you can build upon. If you add vodka instead of cachaça, which is a really popular alternative, you get a caipirosca. If you add rum, you get a caipirissima. But there's nothing wrong with cachaça. I think this is the perfect base for a caipirinha. People play around with it, but I don't think they need to. This, those three ingredients, potentially with some grapes in there, are absolutely perfect in my opinion. So experiment, but I don't think you can go wrong with cachaça. If you're building this in the glass, you can just add your crushed ice straight into the glass and give it a little churn. But I like to just add my crushed ice into the shaker, not too much and just give it a really light shake, just to kind of almost turn it upside down a few times rather than shaking, just so we really integrate the ingredients. So just a very delicate shake, so everything's kind of mixed together. Crushed ice does really kind of dilute quite quickly, so we don't want to do that. Just want to make sure the sugar and the lime juice and the cachaça all kind of mixed together. And then we're just going to open pour this into our glass. Some people like to shake the drink over ice and then strain it over crushed ice, but I think we've got to be really careful we don't over dilute the drink. So I think this method works really well and it avoids us breaking any delicate glasses, which we don't want to do. I'm going to top that up with a crown of crushed ice, just to really make it look very, very, very refreshing. Add a little straw, and there we have, in my opinion, one of the most delicious, cooling, clean cocktails you can imagine, which is going to be the Brazilian classic, the Caipirinha. Enjoy, everybody.
Welcome back to Essential Cocktails, everybody. I'm Dan Fellows, and today I'm gonna to show you a really refreshing raspberry-based gin cocktail, which has sweet and sour elements and is just an absolute winner. It's called a Clover Club. All right, so the Clover Club was created in the early 1900s, and it was actually named after a really popular club, which went by the same name, the Clover Club. And this has some pretty interesting ingredients. We've got raspberry in there. We've also got gin in there, which is gonna be our base spirit. But interestingly, we have a little bit of dry vermouth in here. So just gonna grab this from my fridge. And this actually lightens the whole drink down, slightly reduces the ABV, especially if you can compare it to something like a White Lady, which used Cointreau, as well as gin. So that was quite a high ABV. This one's a little bit less intense. The vermouth just brings a kind of maltiness, a little bit of roundness to the drink, whereas obviously Cointreau is quite a big old orange flavor. As with a lot of our sweet and sour recipes, we're gonna go with lemon juice, balanced out by a little bit of white sugar syrup. I'm going with Monin Cane Sugar Syrup, which is a two to one ratio. And again, we're making this into quite a sort of foamy drink, a little bit creamy, and you can either do this with an egg white, which is one option, or you can do it with aquafaba, which is the water from a can of chickpeas, which is what we're gonna do today. So these are our kind of key liquid ingredients, but we also have one more ingredient, which brings a real nice, delicate sweetness and fruitiness to the drink, which is gonna be raspberries. And we're gonna muddle these in the bottom of our shaker tin, but if they're kind of soft raspberries, you probably don't need to muddle them because they're gonna get really knocked around when they get shaken up. So in our tin, because we're gonna shake this drink because we have citrus in here, I'm gonna add 10 mils of our sugar syrup to our five raspberries. And if you wanna get a more raspberry kind of forward flavor, obviously add more raspberries. If you want it to be more delicate and less fruity, obviously add less. But five raspberries here is a pretty good starting point, And I think this gives enough of the flavor that it kind of comes through without overpowering the drink. So it's gonna give this a light press with our muddler just to release the raspberry juice into the syrup. And some recipes actually call for a raspberry syrup, but essentially what we're doing here is making a raspberry syrup in the base of our shaker. Now we're gonna build the rest of the drink, which is gonna be 40 mils of gin. And you can use a London dry gin here. You could use a Plymouth gin, which would work really nicely because it's a little bit more kind of sweet and fruit forward. But whichever gin you have is gonna work really nicely. And we're complementing this with 20 mils of a dry vermouth or an extra dry vermouth or a Blanco vermouth. Obviously these all have slightly different sweetnesses and different characteristics. But again, whichever one you have is gonna work really nicely. As with lots of our sweet and sour drinks, we're gonna go 20 mils of freshly squeezed lemon juice to bring our acidity and a bit of zestiness to the drink. We're gonna go 15 mils of our aquafaba just to bring our nice foaminess. But if you're using an egg white, just use one egg white. And then we have one more optional ingredient, which actually I do recommend. So onto a set of scales, just gonna add our tin. And I like to add around about 0.5 grams of a saline solution made with one part salt to five parts water. And this has an interesting effect on the drink. So if it's not here, it's kind of wide, kind of sweet and sour but just adding a little bit of salt just brings it all together, almost makes the drink a little bit malty and it ties in with the vermouth in particular really nicely just to lighten the drink and add just something a little bit more kind of round and warming to the drink, whereas otherwise it's kind of bright, vibrant, sweet and sour. Give this a really hard single shake over ice if you're just using really kind of fresh ice, but if you're not using fresh ice, you can do a double shake, which I'll show you how to do in this episode. So with this, I've got ice fresh out of the freezer, so a single shake will suffice as long as you do a very, very hard shake like this. So after 10 to 15 seconds, you get a nicely frosted up shaker, which is a really good sign. It means the drink's nice and cold. You can see in the drink, it's got really nice foamy texture already. So we don't need that second shake in there. But if this wasn't completely kind of whipped up and emulsified, just strain it out, do a second shake dry, and you'll get that nice foamy texture. Fine strain this into a chilled glass. And it has that really nice light pink color and a foamy texture on top of the drink. I like to express a little lemon coin over the drink just to give it another kind of citric aroma. Just really freshens the whole drink up. You can discard this and then garnish with a raspberry spear. And there we have the raspberry forward gin-based sweet and sour cocktail called a Clover Club. Enjoy. <laughs> Cocktails from the 1980s don't usually scream refinement, balance, and beauty, but Dick Bradsell's creation, the Bramble, is all of those things and more. This drink tells a story, has a unique aesthetic, and has an elegant simplicity that requires no adjustment. So today, we're gonna make a Bramble.
For those of you unfamiliar with Dick Bradsall, Dick was one of the greatest bartenders of all time, really influential and was doing kind of things against the grain in the 1980s when creating cocktails like the espresso martini and also the bramble that we're talking about today. So there's actually a really nice story behind the bramble where Dick was working in Fred's bar in London and a supplier brought him in a bottle of this, which is creme de mule or a blackberry liqueur. And Dick grew up on the Isle of Wight and he'd pick blackberries as a child, eat them. He'd be covered in scratches and semi-dyed purple. And this bottle of creme de mule took him back to his childhood memories. And he wanted to create a drink around this, which really celebrated British produce. So Dick essentially made a blackberry gin sour using the creme de mure, gin, lemon juice, and also sugar syrup to provide some balance. And this drink is actually a really simple, elegant serve, which although it has really kind of simple foundations, punches way above its weight and it's a really iconic drink. So although you can shake this drink, I actually prefer to build it straight in the glass because we're gonna be serving it with crushed ice and if you shake it, you dilute it. You pour it over crushed ice, you dilute it even more. And I like to keep that dilution a little bit lower so we can always add dilution, but it's very difficult to take away. So in the base of the glass, we're gonna start with 50 mils of our gin. And this brings those really nice botanical notes. Again, a British product, which Dick was really trying to celebrate. And then we're gonna add our citrus, which I think Dick was a bit annoyed that doesn't grow in the UK. And this is lemon juice. So this is a really nice kind of gin sour base, spirit, citrus, and sugar. And it's gonna be a little bit less sugar than we'd use in our four to two to one ratio, which we've used in a few other videos, primarily because we're gonna add the creme de mule, which has its own level of sweetness as well. So I'm just gonna go with 10 mils here, but you can adjust this according to your own taste preferences. And if you like things a little bit sweeter, add a little bit more. If you like things a little bit more dry, which actually works quite nicely in this drink, you can add a little bit less or even no sugar. Although it does get a little bit tart at that point, so I do recommend around about five mils minimum. So that's our classic bramble base, which we're gonna finish with the creme de mule. But there are lots of ways you can riff on this. You could introduce fresh fruit to the mix. You could muddle it into the bottom of the glass. Something seasonal, maybe blackberry when it's in season would be the obvious choice, but also raspberry works nicely, maybe strawberry. You can use different spirits. I've seen this made with Pisco before, which adds something completely different to it, or even vodka, which is a little bit more neutral. You can even use a different liqueur to drizzle with. So obviously creme de mure, blackberry liqueur is the really obvious choice, which is kind of classic for the drink, but you could use raspberry liqueur. You could use cherry liqueur. There are many different variations on this, and this is a really nice starting point. So as a pro tip now, as we're about to build the drink, we want to maximize the kind of impact of this. So you want to prepare everything. So our drizzle is as impactful as possible. So grab your straw, have that ready to go. I'm gonna garnish with blueberries because we don't have any blackberries, they're out of season at the moment. But this is kind of in the spirit of Dick's idea behind the drink, all about seasonality. These are what I could get hold of, they'll do a great job. And then we're just gonna take a little slice of lemon just to add a bit of color and a little bit of citrus to the drink. So now we've got our base, we're just gonna add our crushed ice. Don't go all the way to the top just yet. Just give it a little mix together to add some dilution and get all those flavors kind of knowing each other. Don't ever do that. Gonna add more crushed ice to kind of crown on top of the drink. So it's got that really nice impactful look. I don't usually do this, but we're gonna pre-straw, pre-garnish. And then the final thing we do, in Dick's words, is to add a lovely trickle of our creme de mure over the drink. And I like to add around about 15 to 20 mils. And if you're serving this for friends or even in a bar, you could take this as it is, take it to the table, like so, and then finish the drink with your creme de mule drizzle. So 15 to 20 mils in a jigger. This is gonna be a really nice kind of blackberry sweetness to the drink. And it's a very, very impactful and beautiful drink with it bleeding through. And there we have an absolute celebration of seasonality in British produce called a bramble. Cheers everybody. Welcome back to Essential Cocktails, everybody. Today we're talking about a drink which is equally refreshing and warming at the same time. We're gonna be making a dark and stormy. So the dark and stormy is a classic Bermudan cocktail built around Gosling's Black Seal Rum, with which it's synonymous, and it really does celebrate everything that's amazing about this rum. 
those treacle flavors, the molasses flavors, those big dark sugars. And it really kind of brings warmth, but also freshness to this using sweet and sour ingredients. So rum is gonna be at the base of our drink. We're also gonna go with freshly squeezed lime juice for our acidity. If you have a sweeter tooth or a slightly less sweet ginger beer, you might wanna go with a little bit of sugar syrup. And I really like to add a little bit of our saline solution just to kind of bring those big acidic and sweet flavors together so that they really focus in on the Gosling's Black Seal. And then we're gonna finish the drink with our ginger beer and I'm going with Fever Tree, which I think is a really nicely balanced ginger beer. So if you watched the Paloma video from a few days ago, which I'll link above, you'll actually recognize this template. And this template of 40 mils of spirit, 15 mils of acidity, up to 10 mils of sugar, up to one gram of saline solution and 100 grams of something sparkling can be utilized with so many different ingredients and flavor profiles. So you can start experimenting with this to either riff on these creations or even create your own brand new cocktails, which is pretty cool. So whereas in our Paloma, we're using a tequila base. Now in our Dark and Stormy, we're gonna use a Gosling's Black Seal Rum base. I'm gonna go 40 mils of this. And this is the main flavor in the drink. For our acidity, we're gonna go 15 mils of fresh lime juice, which brings that kind of zing and a little vibrancy and a little bit of freshness, whereas otherwise these are quite rich ingredients. If you wanted to, you could add your sugar syrup now, but I'm actually not going to, but I wouldn't recommend going above 10 mils here because I think that's gonna be plenty of sweetness for you. We're gonna add one gram of our saline solution, which is made with one part salt to five parts water. And as I said in my previous episode, all about seasoning drinks, this just brings those kind of wide flavors together. So when there's big sweetness and acidity, but you actually wanna focus in on the kind of middle flavors, which are gonna be our rum and ginger. This does a really good job of that, kind of bridging it all together and just softening the kind of width of the drink. Because we're building this drink in the glass, just gonna add our ice straight on top of the liquid. Gonna add our ginger beer, but not quite all of it, just cause we wanna give it a little mix together. So I'm going about 75 mils in there now. Just give this a little quick mix together, but we don't want to over dilute here. Top up with our remaining ginger beer up to hundred grams. And then to finish the drink, just gonna cut a little lime wedge in case you wanna increase the acidity of the drink and finish that off with our wooden straw. So this drink's hot and cool. The ginger brings heat, it brings coolness. We've got the acidity, which makes it kind of light and refreshing. The richness from the rum. And all in all, despite its simplicity, this is an extremely complex drink. And it's called a dark and stormy. The Amaretto Sour. Is it a good drink? Is it a bad drink? It really does depend on how you make it and crucially, whether it's balanced. So often an Amaretto Sour can be really kind of sickly sweet and poorly balanced. But if you make this drink well, it can be a really delightful drink for you to enjoy. So today I'm gonna to show you my favorite recipe for the drink, which makes some subtle changes to the original template, but actually I think makes a massive difference. So let's get started making an Amaretto Sour and welcome to Essential Cocktails. Okay, so when we think back to a more classic sour template, something like a whiskey sour, something like a pisco sour, rum sour, gin sour, etc., it tends to have a fairly fixed template, which is a spirit base, citrus as your kind of acidity, some kind of sweetener, potentially some bitters, and then maybe something to give it that really nice emulsified creamy texture, such as aquafabra or egg white. When we move into the world of an amaretto sour, this changes quite significantly because actually amaretto has a fairly high amount of sweetness in itself. So even though this is the base ingredient, it also serves pretty much as the sweetener in the drink as well. So we're gonna be building this around Disrano Amaretto, which is where the drink was originally designed. It was in the 1970s promotional campaign. And the original spec was just Amaretto and lemon juice. This kind of makes sense. You're bringing balance to the very sweet ingredient, which is the Amaretto, which is an almond liqueur. But actually what we're gonna to do today is kind of build some layers around it, add some seasonings, which is something I often talk about, and just create a really well-balanced drink, which also has some slight flavor accents, which I think really elevate the drink. So obviously at the heart of the drink is gonna be our amaretto, but I'm actually gonna cut our base with a bourbon or rye, ideally a higher proof bourbon or rye, such as Bullet, which is 45% ABV. And this just kind of takes the edge off the sweetness of the amaretto. And this is gonna be our kind of base ingredients, which is gonna be our liqueur and our spirit. And then to this, we're gonna have our sourness, which is gonna be freshly squeezed lemon juice. We're gonna go for our emulsifier now because we don't need a sweetener, hence the amaretto. And this is gonna be something which you don't often see in an amaretto sour, which I really like to add, which is pineapple juice. So as well as bringing texture and that really nice foamy mouthfeel when we shake the drink up, this is also a sweetener, but it also has acidity in there. So lots of complexity brought there. 
Um, the drink doesn't taste like pineapple, even though pineapple is delicious. It just brings something slightly different to the drink and an extra layer of dynamics. And then on that note, we've got some seasonings. We're gonna go saline solution, which is a one to five salt to water ratio. We're gonna go vanilla extract, which again is a flavor which kind of bridges all these ingredients together really nicely. And then finally, we're gonna go with some aromatic bitters. And I'm actually quite heavy handed with this because the rest of the drink very much sits in the realm of sweet and sour and bringing some really nice bitterness to the drink is a very welcome addition. So let's build our amaretto sour. So before we start mixing the drink, you just wanna make sure your glassware is really nice and cold and you've got your ice on hand. So it can move nice and quickly and preserve the really cold temperature, which this drink really benefits from. And also the nice foamy texture, so you can serve it really kind of lively and awake. So we're gonna be shaking the drink today. So we're gonna be building it in a tin. And because we do have an emulsifier in here, which is the pineapple juice, you could double shake this, but a single shake here is gonna be perfectly adequate. It's gonna give it that really nice foamy texture if you shake nice and hard. And that's exactly what we want in the drink. So if you want to deep dive more into different mixing techniques, we actually covered this earlier in the course, which I'll link above. But we're gonna start with 40 mils of our amaretto. And this has got that really nice kind of nuttiness, some sweetness, obviously that really nice almond flavor. And it's just a really kind of strong, intense flavored base to the drink. And because it is so strong and intense, we want to kind of dial that down and bring up a little bit of alcohol in here just to avoid the drink becoming too kind of sweet and sour without any kind of spirit behind it. So to 40 mils of amaretto, I like to cut this with 20 mils of bourbon, ideally a high proof. So the addition of a higher ABV spirit like this one is credited to Jeffrey Morgenthaler and it really does improve the drink. Our acidity is gonna be 30 mils of freshly squeezed lemon juice, but you could also use lime juice here if you want a little bit more sharpness. It's just lemons a little bit more traditional to the original recipe. And then, as I said earlier, pineapple juice is a bit of a secret weapon here. Not only does it bring acidity and sweetness, it brings a really nice texture, which you'll see in a second. So now we've got the core of the drink ready to go. You could shake this up and get a really delicious drink, but I think these seasonings really take it to the next level and just bring everything together really nicely and just kind of complement all the flavors. So first of all, we're gonna go half a gram or 0.5 grams of saline solution, which just brings all the flavors together. If you think of almonds as well, nuts and salt, a really delicious combination. Also 0.3 grams of vanilla extract. And again, this is not designed to make the drink taste like vanilla. It's just a complementary flavor that works with pretty much everything in the drink. And then when it comes to bitters, I go pretty heavy handed here because I really want to add dimension to the sweetness and the acidity. And I think a depth of bitters is a really powerful thing to add. So I'm going to go four dashes of Scrappy's aromatic bitters. And that's equivalent to around about two to two and a half grams. I'm gonna add this to our shaker with lots of ice and give this a really good hard shake over ice. And if your ice isn't fresh out the freezer or the ice machine, you might wanna give it a double shake just to get that nice texture whilst also chilling the drink. But because this is really cold ice, really big cubes, we're just gonna shake it really, really nice and hard and fast, like so. Fine strain this over some nice big cubes of ice. I'm gonna garnish with a fresh cherry, which complements the almond really nicely. And there we have a really nutty, sweet and sour, very lightly tropical, really well balanced amaretto sour. Enjoy. You know the Long Island iced tea. It's a drink that's called tea, that doesn't contain tea, does contain far more spirits than seems sensible. And on paper, it's a complete mess of a drink, but somehow it works. So today I'm gonna show you how to make one. Welcome to Essential Cocktails. So I don't think the Long Island iced tea has a really kind of beautiful, illustrious history. It seems to have been created in around about the 1970s, but I think most people watching this will have their own stories of Long Island iced tea, maybe from your kind of late teenage years, your 20s, if that's when you're allowed to start drinking. And it'd often be served in a jug. It'd be a load of booze chucked in there, topped up with loads of cola, really sugary, really boozy, not great for the head the next day, but probably quite good times in your life. And what we're gonna do today is make a slightly more refined version of the drink, taking a little bit more care, not going too over the top on the booze, but still kind of balanced, brings through the cola nicely, has a little bit of that iced tea flavor, but not a really kind of messy, horrible jug of boozy Coke, like you probably remember. 
So the Long Island iced tea actually has five different bottles in there. We're gonna need all sorts of things. So get shopping. Vodka is gonna be our number one. Gin is gonna be number two. White rum is gonna be number three. You can tell this is gonna be a pretty dangerous combination. Tequila is number four. And Cointreau or orange liqueur is number five. And this is a suite of alcohol you wouldn't usually put together, but in a Long Island iced tea, apparently that's a good idea. And you'll taste it later and, you know, I wouldn't necessarily beg to differ. So for our acidity, we're gonna go with freshly squeezed lemon juice. We're gonna go just a little bit of cane sugar syrup, but we're also gonna get sweetness from the other ingredient, which is kind of famous and synonymous with Long Island iced tea, which is good quality Coca-Cola. And I like to use the OG, particularly in a glass bottle. I don't know if it actually tastes any better, but the experience of drinking from a glass bottle is always lovely, especially if it's really nice and cold. I don't know who exactly put all these bottles together and thought it was a good idea to make one drink from them, but regardless of what goes into the drink, this is an undeniably popular drink. And even in bars that don't list it on the menu, a lot of people will ask for it just because it's kind of a cult classic. So some people build this drink in a glass, some people build it in a jug, sometimes in a big bucket, maybe a goldfish bowl, but we're not gonna do that today. Whereas I like to actually shake the drink. So I'm gonna go a little bit lighter on the booze than a lot of people would and I'm only gonna go 15 mils of each. But even 15 mils of each spirit is quite a lot when you add it all together. So you don't wanna be drinking too many of these. So 15 mils of our vodka, 15 mils of gin to follow, which brings a little bit of the botanical notes, a little bit of a kind of citric character to the drink, a little bit of white rum, 15 mils once again, which has those kind of vanilla notes, a little bit of white chocolate in there, which actually ties in nicely with the cola. 15 mils of tequila. I'm going Reposado, but a Blanco would be more grassy. Reposado has more kind of rich notes to tie in with the Coke once again. 15 mils of Cointreau, which also has a 40% ABV, so this is no slouch of a drink. Take it easy. This brings a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of orange character. And then we're gonna bring a little bit of welcome acidity to the drink, which is gonna be 25 mils of freshly squeezed lemon juice. You could also use lime if you prefer, has a little bit more sharpness, but lemon juice is the kind of classic. And then again, 15 mils of our cane sugar syrup. I'm going with Monin cane sugar syrup, which is a two to one syrup. And this just brings a little bit more sweetness. To drinks with this many ingredients, I like to add a few seasonings to kind of bring them all together. And one ingredient that works with pretty much everything on the table is vanilla. And this isn't in the classic recipe, but it is a flavor in Coca-Cola. And I like to add 0.5 grams just to kind of bridge everything together. Before we shake the drink, I'm just gonna prep my glass with our Coca-Cola because we're gonna get a really nice looking layered effect on here. This isn't necessarily required. It just gives a really nice aesthetic to the drink. So before I shake the drink, I've just added 60 grams of Coca-Cola to our glass. And then we're just gonna give this a good shake over ice. Not for too long because we don't wanna over dilute the drink, but we do need to give it a good shake to get all these kind of disparate ingredients to kind of come together. So we can do that now. If you want to slightly change the dynamic of the drink, you can use different base ingredients in terms of your soda. You could use something like ginger beer. You could even use Prosecco if you want to get all fancy. And then in terms of the spirits, you can use pretty much anything here as long as they do kind of synergize together. So adding vanilla to your vodka is really nice. Using darker, more aged spirits can work really well. But play around, this is a really good starting point and then see what you can come up with. I'm just going to slowly pour this over the ice so that you get a really nice kind of layered effect on the drink. So don't pour too quickly and you get actually quite a striking looking drink or something which isn't necessarily the most elegant set of ingredients. I'm gonna carefully add our straw to the drink without interfering with the layering too much. Add yourself a slice of lemon or lime, whichever you want, so you can adjust the acidity of the drink. And who knew a Long Island iced tea could be so fancy? Before you serve the drink, you wanna give it a little mix together. But there we have a very well balanced, slightly more elegant and leveled up. Long Island iced tea. Enjoy that one. The margarita has become the base for countless riffs over the years, and this version, the Tommy's Margarita, might just be one of the most popular versions in the world, and for good reason. This drink really champions the tequila in the drink, and today I'm gonna to show you how to make one. Welcome to Essential Cocktails. The 
Tommy's Margarita was created in the 1990s by Julio Bermejo at his family restaurant, Tommy's Mexican in San Francisco. This is actually a really simple variation on a margarita. Whereas we have a traditional margarita with tequila, lime, Cointreau and salt. All we're doing here is substituting out the Cointreau or orange liqueur, which obviously brings that kind of strong orange characteristic to a margarita. And we're substituting in agave, which is a really kind of synergistic sweetener to use with tequila made from the same base ingredient as tequila itself. So this is our sweetener. We're gonna continue with lime once again, freshly squeezed lime juice. And then the base is gonna be our tequila. And I'm going for a Reposado tequila, but you could use a Blanco, you could use Añejo, whichever you kind of prefer there. I also really like to add a little bit of our saline solution as a bit of a seasoning to the drink. But if you prefer to rim the glass with lime and then salt, that's completely fine. You just obviously get a very different texture. And you can either serve this drink straight up or you can serve it on the rocks, which is what we're gonna to do today. So essentially a Tommy's Margarita is a tequila sour with tequila being the spirit base, lime juice being our acidity, agave being our sweetener, and then the saline just bringing that kind of seasoning, just bridging all the ingredients together. And it's a shake and drink because we want to get it really nice and vibrant and alive. And it's kind of clean and refreshing, but also very much focused around the tequila, which is really the beating heart of the drink. So into our Tommy's Margarita, we're going to start with 60 mils of our Reposado tequila. And if you use a Blanco tequila, obviously this is going to be a little bit more grassy, a little bit lighter, a little bit more kind of citrus forward and fresh. Whereas a Reposado brings a little bit more of the kind of richer, more kind of woody notes to the drink, although an Añejo would bring more of those. So I think a Reposado is a really nice middle ground between the two. We're gonna go 30 mils of our freshly squeezed lime juice. Again, following the formula we've used in a lot of our sour recipes, which is four parts spirit, two parts acidity, one part sweetener, which means we're gonna add 15 grams of our agave nectar. And because this is easy enough to shake up, it's not like a honey, which is super thick. We're just gonna weigh this on scales, much easier than using a jigger, which is a little bit less accurate. And 15 grams works for me. If you like it a little bit sweeter, you can add some more. If you like things a little bit more tart and sharp, obviously you can add a little bit less, but 15 grams is a really good starting point. And then we're just gonna finish that with 0.6 grams of saline solution made with one part salt to five parts water. We're gonna shake the drink over lots of ice to chill the drink, mix it and add some dilution. Fine strain over ice into a nice chilled rocks glass, or you can serve this straight up. Garnish with a dehydrated lime wheel. And there we have what I think is the cleanest, most refreshing and tequila forward variation on a margarita, which is a Tommy's margarita. Enjoy everybody. If you love spicy drinks, this might be a drink for you. If you love coriander, this might also be a drink for you. But if you hate coriander, this might be the worst drink in the world. So you could always watch this video instead. But if you love both these things, this might be the absolute perfect drink for you. And it's called a Picante de la Casa. So the Picante de la Casa is an iconic drink, particularly in the Soho House members clubs, which is where this drink was created. So if you go into any Soho House site at pretty much any time of day, you'll see people drinking these drinks. You'll even see people wearing Picante t-shirts. The power of this drink has gone a very, very long way, but essentially all we're making here is a Tommy's margarita with chili and coriander. And that's no bad thing. This is a delicious drink. So to make our Picante de la Casa, or our Picante for short, we're gonna need one chili, a handful of coriander, and then the other ingredients in the Tommy's Margarita, which are gonna be tequila, freshly squeezed lime juice, and also a little bit of agave nectar, and then also saline solution, just to kind of season the drink and bring it all together. So the first thing we need to do is decide how spicy we want this thing to be. So a good idea is to kind of taste your chilies if you're up for that. You can just take a few slices, give one of them a little nibble, just to see whether it's super spicy, not too spicy, or very mild. And obviously if you add the seeds of the chili, it's gonna be much more spicy than if you don't. So have a little nibble of the chili. That's not too spicy. So I'm gonna go with probably three slices of chili in here. One of which does have seeds in there, so it's gonna be a little bit more spicy. So chuck these into your shaker tin, and then I'm gonna build the rest of the drink. Start in with a good handful of coriander, about that much. But again, if you love coriander, add more. If you hate coriander, don't add coriander. 
To these, we're gonna build essentially a Tommy's margarita on top of our chili and coriander, but I actually like to build it in a slightly different order, starting with our agave. And the reason for this is we can muddle the coriander and the chili into the agave to kind of infuse it into a syrup. So 15 grams of agave, and then all we're gonna do is give this a little gentle press with our muddler, just to crush the chili and create our spicy herbal syrup. Now we're gonna build the rest of our Tommy's margarita. So 60 mils of tequila. I'm going with reposado. And this brings that really nice tequila forward flavor, which is inherent in the drink. We're gonna go 30 mils of freshly squeezed lime juice, which is obviously our acidity. So now we've built this, we're gonna give this a really good hard shake over ice to chill, mix and dilute the drink. And then we're gonna fine strain the drink into our rocks glass filled with lots of ice. You can garnish with a couple of slices of chili, or if you want to go really excessive, the rest of the chili, which you can also eat. And there we have a really delicious spicy herbal and tequila forward cocktail called a Picante de la Casa. Cheers. Even though this drink's over 100 years old, I think that the 20th century is a prime candidate for a renaissance. This underrated classic's got a really unique set of ingredients which are both bang on trend and readily available. It's perfect for any time, whether it's day, night, summer or winter, and I think it's definitely time this drink gets the recognition that it deserves. Gin, lemon juice, white chocolate and Malay Blanc. This sounds like a very strange combination of ingredients, but you have to trust me on this, it's an amazing combination. And today I'll show you how to make it. So let's make the 20th century. So as you can probably guess, the 20th century was created around about the start of the 20th century, and it was actually named after a luxury train that used to run between New York and Chicago around the same time. These ingredients sound like they might not work, but actually the combination of a really good quality juniper forward gin, a little bit of lemon juice for a little bit of acidity, a white creme de cacao, so a white chocolate liqueur, and Lillet Blanc, which has a really nice kind of herbal character, all come together surprisingly well to create a very unique, but also harmonious flavor profile. So because we've got the citrus fruit in the drink in the form of lemon juice, we're going to be shaking this and we're going to start with 40 mils of good quality gin. And I'm using a kind of juniper forward London dry gin here, which is beef eater. But because this does have some sort of floral notes in there from the Lalay particularly, you can play around with lots of different gins. Let me know which is your favorite in the comments below. But something like this, which is a really good value juniper forward gin, is going to stand up the slightly bigger flavors of the chocolate and give a really nice base. And then to add some acidity, we're just going to go five mils of freshly squeezed lemon juice. And I know these don't really kind of sound like they're gonna to work together. Lemon, white chocolate, florality, botanical notes, but the end result really does make sense in the glass. So we've got our spirit, we've got our acidity. We're gonna add some sweetness from our white creme de cacao, which I'm going 20 mils. And this does have some sweetness in there, as well as that really nice white chocolate flavor. And then finally, 20 mils of Lillet Blanc, which brings those light floral notes tying in really nicely with the gin. And it's got a subtle richness in there, which just works really nicely with the white chocolate. Gonna give this a shake over ice. Grab our chilled Nick and Nora glass from the fridge or the freezer. And then we're gonna fine strain this straight in there, straighten out any shards of ice that we've created in the shaking process. I like to garnish this with a little orange zest coin, which we're gonna express over the drink. And that combination of white chocolate and orange with the delicate florals from the gin and the lele is just a magical combination that shouldn't work, but just does. So there we have an underrated classic, which is Dua Renaissance. Give this one a try. It's called the 20th century. Enjoy everybody. If ever you've had a Negroni and been overwhelmed by either the bitterness or the level of alcohol in the drink, then this drink might be perfect for you. It has a similar flavor profile in a way, but it's more sweet and sour style, and it also contains grapes, which I think are massively underutilized in cocktails. This drink is an absolute winner, and it's one that you need to try. 
and it's called an Enzoni. Welcome to Essential Cocktails. Okay, so when it comes to the flavor profile of the Enzoni, we're looking at something quite unique, which is a hybrid of two drinks. First of all, being a Negroni, and the second being a gin sour. Both of these bridge together with the use of green grapes, which are a really underutilized ingredient in cocktails, which I think need to be used more because they're sweet, acidic, tangy, delicious, really refreshing, and really powerful in cocktails. So first of all, we're gonna start with our grapes. We're gonna go with gin, which is common to both those drinks. Also Campari, which obviously you'll find in a Negroni which is a bittersweet aperitif. It has lots of kind of rhubarb, grapefruit, citrus flavors in there, very delicious. And then for our sweet and sour elements, we're going with lemon juice and sugar syrup. And then finally, I like to add a little bit of saline solution made with one part salt, five parts water. And this is a bit of a seasoning in the drink and it does two things primarily. Number one, it reduces our perception of bitterness in the drink. Obviously Campari has an inherent level of bitterness, which you want to kind of bring down our perception of in the drink because we don't want it to be overly bitter. It wants to be a nice balanced drink. And then number two, it just bridges all these big flavors together, creating something which is really harmonious and just a really delicious drink in the end. So if you want to learn more about seasonings and how I use them and approach them, you can click on this video from earlier in the course. And what I'm going to be doing here is shaking the drink. One, because it has our muddled grapes, but also number two, because it contains citrus. So into our shaker tin, I'm going to go with our grapes. And I like to go quite heavy handed on this. I think grape is a really good ingredient in cocktails. So I've got six in there and I just want to muddle this together with 10 mils of two to one sugar syrup. And I'm going with mon in here. So you do want to use a white sugar in here really. Just works really nicely with the grapes and a brown sugar is going to be a little bit jarring compared to all the other really fresh ingredients in the drink. So six grapes, depending on the size, 10 mils of sugar syrup. Just give them a crush together. The grapes will kind of pop. It can be a little bit messy, but that's the way it goes. And that's just going to release all the really nice grape juice into our sugar syrup. And that's going to be the basis of our drink. Now we've got our sweetened grape juice. We can start by adding the rest of our ingredients. So first of all, we're going to go 30 mils of beef eater gin or whatever gin you have. You do want to go with something with plenty of juniper body and juniper kind of flavor coming through because then it's going to really cut through in the final drink. And it'll be obviously a gin drink, which we want. And then we're going to go 30 mils. So the same amount of Campari. And this seems like a lot, but actually because we've got the sweetness, the sourness, and also the bitterness from the Campari, just ends up being a really nicely balanced drink without overpowering too much. And then we've already got our sweetener. We just want our acidity in there, which is gonna be 20 mils of freshly squeezed lemon juice. And this is gonna provide that zip and zing to complement the grapes. And then finally, 0.5 grams of our saline solution, just to bridge the whole drink together really nicely. Gonna shake the drink over ice to chill it, mix it and dilute it. We're gonna fine strain that over lots of ice in a chilled glass. And it's got this really nice pink hue from the Campari and the other ingredients. And then we'll finish it off with three grapes, just skew it onto the drink to provide a little bit of contrasting color, that pop of flavor from the grapes. And that is a sweet, acidic, bitter, refreshing, joyous drink called Nenzoni. There we go, enjoy that one. Give that a try and cheers. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to make a Pisco Sour. So this drink's really popular in Chile and Peru and for good reason. It's an absolute winner of a drink. And now I'm gonna show you how to make it. So Pisco is a type of grape brandy made in both Peru and Chile. This is a Chilean version. You can also buy it from Peru, obviously. And what we're gonna to do today is celebrate the really nice kind of grapey, aniseedy flavors of the Pisco in the form of a sour. So in our previous whiskey sour episode, we followed a framework of four parts spirit to two parts citrus to one part sugar, which we're gonna follow again today, but we're gonna change this very slightly, bringing some slightly different flavor accents and really focusing in on the Pisco. So Pisco is gonna be our base ingredient. I'm going for two different types of citrus, lemon and lime, taking inspiration from both the Peruvian and Chilean version of the Pisco Sour. We're gonna balance this with our white sugar syrup or our Monin cane sugar syrup, which is a two to one ratio. And then we're gonna use some aromatic bitters just to finish the drink, which also serves as a garnish. 
but it's also a big kind of flavor component of the drink as well. And then finally, I'm going with aquafaba, which once again is a really good way to emulsify and bring that nice creaminess to a sour. But if you prefer, you can always use an egg white. So because this drink has citrus in there, we're gonna be shaking it. And we're gonna start with our spirit base, which is gonna be our pisco. So pisco has a really nice subtle grapiness, but also a bit of an aniseed characteristic. And brandy can be made with all different fruits. This is made with grapes, but it just brings a really nice kind of base flavor to the drink. And this is what we're really celebrating. So we're gonna make sure we add plenty of this. We're going with 50 mils this time. To this 50 mils of pisco, which we're calling four parts in our recipe, I wanna add two parts of citrus. And you could do 25 mils of lime juice, 25 mils of lemon juice. But what we're actually gonna do here is blend the two together. So first of all, we're gonna go 12.5 mils of lime juice, which is a little bit more acidic than lemon juice. And also 12.5 mils of lemon juice. And the reason for doing this is that it pays homage to both the Chilean and the Peruvian version of the Pisco Sour. To balance our 25 mils of citrus, or two parts, we want to go one part of our sugar syrup, as long as it's at a two to one ratio, so 12.5 mils. And this will bring really nice balance into the drink. And then for our foamy texture, we're going to go 12.5 mils again of aquafaba, which is the water from tinned chickpeas. Because my ice is fresh out the freezer, I'm just gonna give this a single shake. But if it was kind of starting to melt, you could always do a double shake, which would give it a little bit more emulsion, a little bit more creaminess. But in this case, not entirely necessary. Just give it a really good hard shake over ice. We're gonna fine strain this into our chilled coupe glass. And then the garnish, which is also our final ingredient, is gonna be five drops of aromatic bitters just to the top of the drink, which not only look amazing, but add a little bit of bitterness to the drink, which is much needed. And there we have a creamy, but light, delicious drink, which really celebrates the Pisco at the heart of it, which is called Pisco Sour. Enjoy. Last word is a very old drink that's actually regained huge popularity recently. It's one of those drinks that's deceivingly simple to make, all equal parts, with each ingredient bringing something completely different to the final drink. When you mix it all together, it's everything you want in a cocktail. Spirit forward, fruity, balanced, and herbal. And it's just a really great combination, which is a really hard thing to get right, despite its simplicity. So let's grab some bottles and make a last word. So the last word was originally created in around about 1915, and it really did fall out of favor after initial popularity to the point where it was almost an extinct drink before being picked up and then gaining huge global popularity, which we see it having today. So the recipe for the last word actually seems to be very simple, but to get these equal parts recipes with four ingredients to be balanced, delicious, and all kind of harmonized together is actually a really fine skill to have. So the four ingredients in the last word are gonna be our spirit base, which is gonna be gin, our acidity or sourness is going to be lime juice and then the sweetness is going to come in the form of two liqueurs first of all maraschino cherry liqueur and then second of all a herbal liqueur which is going to be chartreuse so these are actually going to be shaken up together because we've got the citrus in there and you can adjust this up down as much as you like so i'm going to be starting with 25 mils of our gin and you do want a gin with plenty of body and kind of intensity to cut through these really big flavors so beef is a really good option for that we're gonna go 25 mils of our freshly squeezed lime juice for our acidity and vibrancy to balance out our liqueurs. We're gonna go 25 mils of maraschino cherry liqueur, which is our first form of sweetness. And then 25 mils again of green chartreuse, which has a completely different type of sweetness to the cherry liqueur. This is much more herbal, a little bit more complex. Lots of ingredients go into making this. So this in itself is super complex. But now we've got our four ingredients together. This has become a basis for lots of variation. So as I said before, making four ingredients in equal parts, balanced and delicious is really difficult, but there have been some exceptions to this with some really, really great results. Things like the Paper Plane, the Naked and Famous, the Final Ward are all really delicious drinks. And I've actually personally riffed upon this drink before to create a drink called a Word Upper, which is kind of an upper, it contains coffee with these ingredients as well, with some slight tweaks. And I think this is one of my favorite cocktails I've ever created. So if you wanna watch that video, you can click here. But now we're gonna finish off our last word by giving it a good shake over ice. 
We're gonna fine strain this into a chilled Nicanora glass or a coupe glass. And then finish the drink with a cherry on the rim of the glass. And there we have a ridiculously complex, really well balanced, fruity, boozy, herbal, equal parts cocktail called A Last Word. Cheers everybody, enjoy. Think back to the year 2008. The MIA song Paper Planes is playing everywhere. All I wanna do is, and uh, you know the one. And Sam Ross is in a bar creating a drink inspired by a cocktail called The Last Word, which in some ways is the same, but in some ways is completely different. So what we're gonna do today is explore that cocktail. And today I'm gonna show you how to make the Paper Plane. So when I said the paper plane is kind of the same as the last word, but also completely different, what I mean is it contains a spirit, a citrus, and two liqueurs, all coming together to be very balanced and very complex, despite being quite simple on the surface. So whereas the last word, we've got the ingredients across the front, gin, lime juice, maraschino, and chartreuse, we're gonna be substituting these out for the ingredients in a paper plane. So the spirit, we're subbing out the gin, and bringing forward bourbon, which has a much rounder, more kind of toffee-like characteristic. For the citrus, we're taking out our lime juice and introducing lemon juice, which is a little bit less acidic, allowing it to feel a little bit sweeter in the final drink. And then our liqueurs, we're getting rid of our maraschino and our chartreuse. And we're gonna bring forward a Maro Nanino, which is actually specified as a branded product in this because it has quite a distinctive characteristic. And then finally we had Campari, which Sam actually thought brought a little bit too much bitterness to the drink. So he substituted this out and introduced Aperol, which is a kind of sweeter, lower ABV, lower bitterness product. And then we have the Paper Plane. So this is an equal part drink. It's gonna be a shaken drink. And what that means is you can scale it up pretty much as far as you want to. I'm gonna be doing 25 mils each, but you could do 30, 35, 50 if you wanna make a couple of drinks, or you could even scale this up into a big old batch and just shake it to order whenever you wanna have it available. So keep it in your fridge, shake it when you like, and easily done. You can have a really delicious cocktail within seconds. So I'm going with 25 mils each. First of all, our bourbon, which has those really nice deeper notes, whereas obviously gin in the last word is more botanical and light. 25 mils of freshly squeezed lemon juice, which is our acidic note in the drink. 25 mils of Amaro Nanino, which is actually a quite light Amaro. So it's not super bitter, but it does have some bitterness in there. It's got some spice and some citrus in there really nicely. And you can experiment with different Amari, although just be mindful that a really kind of big dominant Amaro is gonna really overpower the drink. So we don't wanna kind of take over the other ingredients. So Amaro Nanino is delicious, but experiment with this and see which you prefer. And then finally, in with the Aperol for those really nice bittersweet citrus notes. A little bit of orange in there, grapefruit, blood orange, and a little bit of complex spice as well. So just before we shake up our paper plane, a couple of notes on the variations you can make to this drink to change the dynamics slightly. You can change your base spirit. You could use rye in there, which is gonna be a little bit more spicy generally, or play around with lots of different spirits. And a flavor I think really works nicely in this drink is actually coffee. So I made a riff on this called a filter paper plane, which I'll put above, which has a pretty different characteristic with the coffee kind of tying it all together. But now we're gonna shake up our paper plane and then get that one served. Fine strain into a chilled Nicanora glass or a coupe glass. And you can see it's got that really nice color and a little bit of texture in there as well. It's a very vibrant and alive drink. <whistles> Garnish with a paper airplane, because why not? And there we have a bittersweet, lightly spicy, really rich, but ultimately very well balanced drink made with equal parts ingredients called a paper plane. So enjoy that one, everybody, and see you in the next episode. Invented by Joaquin Simo in 2011, The Naked and Famous takes elements of two other equal parts cocktails, The Last Word and The Paper Plane, and introduces mezcal to the mix, bringing together a really spicy, herbal, bright, and fruity cocktail, and today I'm gonna to show you how to make it. Welcome to Essential Cocktails.
So if we think back to our other two equal parts recipes that I mentioned, over here we have the last word, which contains gin, lime juice, maraschino, and green chartreuse. And then over here we have the paper plane, which contains bourbon, lemon juice, Amaro Nanino, and Aperol. And these are both delicious combinations, but the Naked and Famous take something from kind of each of these and create something brand new. So from the last word, we're gonna borrow the lime juice. From the paper plane, we're gonna borrow the Aperol. And then our other two ingredients that we're gonna to add to the drink, first of all, are gonna be mezcal, which is our spirit base. And then also we're gonna add yellow chartreuse, which is gonna be our herbal element. So this is a really simple equal parts cocktail. And once again, we're following our formula of one part spirit, one part citrus, and then two liqueurs, both equal parts as well, which bring crazy complexity, despite being only four ingredients. So once again, because we've got citrus in the drink, we're gonna be shaking this, and I'll start with 25 mils of mezcal. And whichever mezcal you choose is gonna have a massive impact on the drink, so choose one that you really enjoy. If you like something a little bit more grassy, a little bit more astringent and kind of green tea-like, go for a younger mezcal. Whereas if you want those flavors rounded out a little bit more, with more kind of caramel coming through, more of the aging impact in there, go for something a little bit older. So this is quite a young mezcal I'm using today. I really wanna lean into those kind of grassy notes and the smokiness, and this has plenty of those in abundance. And we're gonna complement this. So 25 mils of mezcal with 25 mils of freshly squeezed lime juice. So now I'm gonna talk about our sweet elements, which honestly I think are a touch of genius in this drink. So first of all, when we think back to our last word, this contained green chartreuse, which is a much higher intensity version of this, whereas the yellow chartreuse is a little bit less herbal, a little bit less intense. And this is gonna really allow the mezcal to come through. So when we think about our equal part recipe, if we had equal parts of these with green chartreuse, this would way overpower the mezcal. And actually that smoky element is really what we wanna celebrate. So using yellow chartreuse rather than green, absolutely genius. And then when we think back to our paper plane, Sam Ross, when he created it, originally started with Campari in there but he found this to be too bitter and too intense. And the same applies here. If we use Campari instead of Aperol, it would really overpower our mezcal, throw the drink out of balance. So by using Aperol, which is a little bit lower ABV, a little bit less bitter with a little bit more sweetness, again, we allow the mezcal to really cut through. So we're gonna go 25 mils of each. First of all, yellow chartreuse, which has many ingredients and brings loads of complexity to the drink as well as some sweetness. And then 25 mils, of our Aperol, which is gonna be our kind of bittersweet element with a pithy orangey flavor, some red fruit in there, a little bit of rhubarb as well, 25 mils also. So four ingredients, crazy amounts of flavors, which all work surprisingly well together. So before we give this a shake, I'm just gonna move it to one side because as soon as we add ice to the drink, it's gonna start diluting, we're kind of up against the clock. So before that, we're gonna prepare our garnish. Our glass is already chilling in the fridge. And with this, I like to use a nice lime wedge. So the reason for this is some people really like to add a little bit more acidity to their drink, and this gives you the option to do so, as well as having a really nice contrasting color to the beautiful color of the drink, which you'll see in a second. And I just like to add a little slice into the lime so it sits proud on the glass. And now we've got everything ready to go, all our things in place. We can shake up the drink with lots of ice. We're gonna fine strain this into a chilled Nick and Nora glass or a coupe glass. Garnish with our lime wedge. And there we have a smoky, bright, herbal and fruity drink called The Naked and Famous. Penicillin is one of the most popular modern classic cocktails. And if you've never tried it before, you really do need to fix that. Today I'm gonna to show you a really easy version of the drink, which has become my go-to recipe. So without further ado, let's make a penicillin. So the penicillin. This drink was created in 2005 by Sam Ross, who's probably one of the most influential bartenders of our times. He's created some modern classic cocktails, including the paper plane, the left hand, and then this, the penicillin, which might be his most popular creation. Sam created this drink while he was working at Milk and Honey in New York City, and the drink itself, the penicillin, is actually a riff on another of Sam's drinks called the Gold Rush, which contains bourbon, lemon juice, and honey. So the penicillin makes a few changes to that recipe and really kind of freshens it up and brings new levels of complexity. So rather than using bourbon, we're gonna go with a blended Scotch whiskey. I'm going with Monkey Shoulder. 
I'm going to go with lemon juice, which will be our acidity of choice. And then Sam actually makes a homemade ginger and honey syrup, which I'm going to forego today because I don't want it to become too complex. So I've got two ingredients which go in here, which not only bring the kind of similar flavor profile, but also they're zero prep. So first of all, I'm going to go from the syrup in stem ginger and syrup. And this is really kind of vibrant and fresh and quite spicy and zingy, as you know with ginger to be. And then rather than using honey, I'm gonna go with agave nectar, just because it's more vegan friendly, so hopefully more people can try this drink. It also brings a similar flavor profile and viscosity to honey, so it's a really good substitute. But if you prefer to use honey, definitely go for that. I'll just bring it down with a little bit of water, so two parts honey to one part water. I like to add a little bit of saline solution to this, just to bring all those big flavors together. So one part salt to five parts water. And then the final ingredient is gonna be a big old PT Scotch whiskey with really kind of intense smoky flavors which don't be alarmed by, it doesn't overpower the drink. It actually brings so much more depth and complexity to the drink as an aroma in the drink. Either float it on top, or I like to add it to a little aromatizer like this, which you can spritz on top of the drink. So I'm gonna add that in here now. So now that's ready to go, we can start building the drink. And this is gonna be a shaken cocktail because it contains citrus. Starting with 60 mils of blended Scotch whiskey. And this is a little bit less toffee forward often than a bourbon, although you get a massive variation in flavor in Scotch whiskey. I find the monkey shoulder to be a really good base here, but experiment with whatever you have. This drink would also work really nicely with bourbon or rye. So whichever whiskey you choose is still gonna be delicious. It's just gonna slightly change the flavor profile. So 60 mils of our blended Scotch, and then we're gonna go 30 mils of freshly squeezed lemon juice. And if we think back to a few of our episodes in this course, we're gonna follow that same four part spirit two part citrus, one part sweetener ratio, which gives really nice balance in many different drinks, including this one. So now I've got our four parts of spirit or 60 mils, two parts of our citrus or 30 mils. We're gonna add one part of sweetener, but I actually like to mix this up slightly and do this in grams on scales, just because it's a little bit easier to control. So we're gonna look for 15 grams in total. And because Sam's original recipe was a homemade ginger and honey syrup, I'm gonna be using two ingredients. The first 7.5 grams being the syrup from our stem ginger and syrup. And this is really kind of fresh and zingy. And using a bar spoon is probably the easiest way to measure this. And definitely, definitely, definitely do use scales for this so you can easily control and consistently control the amount of sweetness in the drink. I'm also adding 7.5 grams of our agave nectar or our two to one honey syrup if you prefer. Totaling 15 grams in total to bring through our four to two to one ratio, which is a really tried and tested recipe. So now we've got our key ingredients, we've got our spirit, our acidity and our sweetener. We're gonna add a little seasoning to the drink. And because these are quite big flavors and they're kind of sweet and sour, we don't want them to be really kind of wide and apart. We wanna kind of bring them together. So you get that really nice combination of the whiskey, lemon, honey, ginger or agave if you're using that. Kind of similar to a hot toddy. That doesn't wanna be a sweet and sour drink. I don't think this needs to be a sweet and sour drink either. I think the whiskey should be the kind of key characteristic with the other flavors kind of working around it to really elevate the whole drink. So in order to do this, I like to add around about 0.5 grams of our saline solution, which won't make the drink taste like salt. It will just bring all those big flavors together. And then particularly when you add the peaty whiskey later, I think this really kind of combines everything really beautifully. I'm gonna shake this over lots of ice to chill it, mix it and dilute it. Fine strain over ice into a chilled rocks glass. And then the garnish is gonna be a little bit of a crystallized ginger, which is a nice snack as well. So that's a delicious drink, but actually it's not quite finished here. So you've got two options here. Number one, you can either very carefully layer a little bit of PT whiskey on top of the drink, but my preferred method is actually to serve the drink with a little spritzer like this, which you can keep adding to the top of the drink. So every time you take a sip, you get that really nice smoky PT aroma. So with each sip, just give it a couple of little spritzers of your PT aroma. Take a small sip, and as you bring it to your mouth, don't use a straw. You get that really nice peat smoke on the nose. But then the drink's much more smooth. It's got that blended scotch at its base, which is much less smoky. And each time, top it up. Have a sip. And there you have a really delicious drink, kind of similar to a whiskey sour in many ways, with different layers of complexity added from the ginger, the agave or honey if you use that, and then the smoky whiskey and it's called a penicillin. Enjoy.
Welcome back to Essential Cocktails, everybody. Today, I'm gonna to show you the ultimate cocktail if you're feeling a bit under the weather or if it's really cold wherever you are. And that drink, you might have heard of it, is called the Hot Toddy. So the hot toddy is one of those really evocative drinks, kind of like a hug in a mug. And whenever you drink a hot toddy, it reminds you of those times when you really want to be kind of warm through, given something really comforting, and it does a perfect job of that. So the hot toddy has got many different recipes. I'm gonna show you my favorite. The simplest way to do this is literally to add all the ingredients into the glass, top it up with hot water, and you're ready to go. But the downside of that recipe is it's not super hot when you serve it. And I think a hot toddy you kind of want to lean into, take some time, warm your hands on the mug. And if it's not super warm to begin with, you're not gonna be able to do that. So this recipe, although it's a little tiny bit more complex, takes maybe one minute longer, just means the drink's really nice and warm when you serve it. And I think that's kind of worth the effort there. So the ingredients in a hot toddy are really simple. Some kind of booze. I think most people choose whiskey, but you could choose brandy. Rum also works really nicely. Spiced rum's really good because you get those nice kind of spiced warming notes, really wintry. I'm gonna go with monkey shoulder, but you could blend in a little bit of PT whiskey here, just if you like those flavors, it might be even more warming. But this is a really good starting point, but pretty much whatever whiskey you have, go with that. It's gonna be a really good drink. And then we're gonna combine this with freshly squeezed lemon juice, either honey syrup or agave nectar, and I'm gonna go with agave, so it's a little bit more vegan friendly, but if you prefer honey, go with honey. And then finally, I like to add a little bit of vanilla extract, which is very optional, but it just brings the drink really nicely together and kind of rounds out those kind of sharp edges, the sweet edges, and makes it a little bit more harmonious. So there are four liquid ingredients. We're also gonna need some spices. And again, these can be whatever you choose. I'm going with clove, cinnamon, and also a little bit of orange peel as well. Just two kind of long peels, which will bring a nice citrus element to the drink, that nice orangey aroma. So now we've got all our ingredients gathered, we can start building the drink. So to make our hot toddy really nice and kind of warming and that hug in the mug I was talking about, I'm gonna build it in two parts. So on one side, we're gonna make essentially kind of a spice tea, which is gonna bring those nice warming flavors. And then in the second part, we're gonna build essentially our liquid part of the hot toddy, which pretty much is a whiskey sour. And if you think of a drink like a penicillin, this is very similar in flavor profile to this, but it's just the hot version, a kind of alter ego of that drink. And it's just completely different by serving it warm. So first of all, you wanna make sure you're using boiling water and we're gonna preheat everything that wants to be hot, essentially. So pour some water into our glass, pour some boiling water into our small tin. And this is just a normal Boston shaker, just repurposed for making a delicious hot toddy. Give these a few seconds to warm up and you wanna make sure you use a nice thick glass that isn't gonna crack. And then pour both of these carefully into our bigger tin. And in this one, we're gonna make our spice tea. And now in here, we essentially have a little bain marie so that when we add these ingredients to it, it's gonna be nice and warm. So for our spice tea, we're gonna add two or three cloves. And just be careful you don't overdo this because cloves can be very, very strong in flavor. It's tempting to add more because they're small, but that'll be probably a mistake because it'll overpower the drink. We're gonna go with one cinnamon stick, which you could crack into the drink and kind of break, but because we're gonna be drinking this straight from the glass, you might end up with cinnamon in your teeth, which isn't ideal. And then we're just gonna squeeze in for now those orange peels, just like so. And this is gonna be the base of our tea. We're gonna add our boiling water, just about three quarters of the way up, maybe 150 grams, let's say. But again, this depends on the size of your glass. And then in our shaker, Ban Marie type thing, which is a nice warm environment now, we can start building the rest of the toddy while this steeps and kind of becomes our really nice infused spiced tea, which already smells delicious. So we're gonna go in with 40 mils of our whiskey or spirit of choice. You could go a little bit more, but I think if you serve this hot, it becomes a little overwhelming because it's gonna be quite intense on the aroma. We're gonna go 20 mils of freshly squeezed lemon juice, which gives it balance and that hint of acidity without being too much. And then you're just gonna move this onto the scales, move your tea to one side, just being very careful because it is quite hot. And we're gonna add our agave or our honey. So if you're using honey, this has got a slightly different flavor to agave, perhaps a little more richness, but this has all that viscosity, kind of similar flavor profile. And this is also vegan friendly. So whichever one you choose, that's completely fine. But if you do go with honey, I'd bring it down two parts honey to one part water to get a similar kind of texture. And I'm gonna go in with 15 grams of agave, which would just bring balance to the drink. And then finally, our seasoning, which I use quite often, and I actually made a full video about earlier in the course, which I'll link above, is gonna be vanilla extract which isn't designed to make the drink taste like vanilla, 
although it does work with all the flavors. It's just designed to kind of soften those sharp edges because this doesn't want to be too much of a sweet and sour drink. It's designed to be wholesome and warming, which is exactly what you want it to be. So we just want to give this a little stir together just to make sure it's fully mixed. And then we can combine the two together to finish off our hot toddy. So you can either leave the spices in the drink, which is kind of pretty, but not the most practical to drink, or you can take them out. So I'm going to leave the cinnamon stick in there because I think it actually looks really nice. Remove our peels, which you can even smell, have done their job really nicely. Remove our cloves. And because we counted them going in, we know we've got all of them out and we have three. And then finally, just carefully take out your toddy mix from your little Ban Marie, homemade Ban Marie. Just carefully do this because obviously it's very hot. There's our spiced tea. There is the rest of the drink. And there we have the most delicious, warming, hugging a mug of a drink, which we call a hot toddy. So enjoy that one. And I hope you feel better if you're feeling a bit under the weather. The Old Fashioned might just be the ultimate minimalist cocktail that stood the test of time for centuries. Spirit, sugar, bitters, garnish, ice, that's all you need to make an Old Fashioned. But I do like to add one more ingredient in there, which I think takes it even further and really elevates the drink to the next level. So without further ado, let's make the Old Fashioned. So when it comes to making an old fashioned, there's actually a few decisions we need to make when it comes to each ingredient in the drink. And I'll talk you through each of these as we go through making it. So the old fashioned is pretty much always and should always be a stirred drink. So you wanna add this into a chilled mixing glass. And I like to start with 60 mils of our base spirit. A lot of recipes will call for bourbon, which I'm going with here, because that nice high corn content gives it a really complimentary flavor, which works with the other ingredients. Kind of toffee-like, butterscotch, naturally sweet without being overly sweet and a really nice depth of flavor, which you get from the bourbon. But if you prefer a little bit more spice in your old fashioned, you could go for a rye whiskey. There's a world of flavor in Scotch whiskey and all the global whiskeys from all over the world. Taiwanese whiskey, Japanese whiskey, Irish whiskey, Scotch whiskey. These all bring completely different characteristics. And even within those places, you get massive variety between the whiskeys you find. So for example, an Isla whiskey could potentially be kind of peaty, almost saline in its kind of flavor profile. Whereas the space side might be a little bit rounder and sweeter but then you still get variation within those tiny areas. So whiskey is a world of flavor and you can make a decision. And this doesn't even have to be a whiskey based drink necessarily, although traditionally it would be. But you can get really delicious results using rum, even mezcal works really nicely. Tequila, if you use agave as your sweetener, there's a world of flavor to explore in an old fashioned and this is the perfect way to do it because it really celebrates the core spirit at the heart of the drink. So now we've covered our base spirit, we need to start thinking about our sweetener. So I actually covered a full episode all about different sweeteners and the options you have earlier in the course, which I'll put up here, which you can watch. But there are a few different ways of doing this. So some people like to put a sugar cube in here, muddle it with the bitters to dissolve it into the bitters. But I find this quite inconsistent, difficult to measure and quantify. Whereas if we use a sugar syrup, A, it's easier to control how much we add, but also B, it actually speeds up the process, removes a few steps and I think gives better results. I don't really like to have crunchy sugar in my old fashioned, although I do understand some people like this. So I'm gonna go with a two to one sugar syrup. This is from Monin, which is their cane sugar syrup. And you can use different types of sugar in your sugar syrup, but I think in this recipe, keep it really clean, really simple, and let the whiskey really kind of be highlighted. So white sugar here, but a brown sugar would work equally nicely. I like to add five mils per old fashioned, but if you prefer it a little bit sweeter, I'd say go up to 10 mils, but I probably wouldn't go beyond this. I think it's gonna to get too sweet. We don't want this to be an overly sweet drink, but equally, we don't want it to be an overly boozy drink or an over bitter drink. So this is all about balance, which is kind of hard to achieve. But if you follow this template, I think you'll get a really good starting point. We also have a decision to make when it comes to bitters. And I like to keep things kind of classic here. So I like to go three dashes of aromatic bitters, which bring a little bit of spice, those kind of warming clovey cinnamony flavors, but you can go with any bitters you choose. Some people like to add a chocolate bitters, orange bitters works really nicely but I think keeping things classic here actually works really well. And then at the start of the video, I actually mentioned my other favorite ingredient to add to an old fashioned, which if you've seen my other videos, you might recognize, and that's gonna be this, which is saline solution. And this is made with one part salt, five parts water, and don't be afraid of this. This can really bring those big flavors together. It won't make the drink taste like salt, but if we think of a chef, they're always gonna season their food. And I think just a small amount of salt in an old fashioned, once again, brings those flavors together. So you can go really light on this. 
0.5 grams is plenty, but I think this does make a really nice difference and really elevate the old fashioned even further, in my opinion and my taste preferences. The final variable to think about is gonna be your ice and your dilution. So you wanna stir this drink down with plenty of ice and contrary to what you might think, add in more ice will actually give you more control over the dilution and slow down the dilution process. And you wanna stir this down for around about 30 to 45 seconds, depending on how fresh your ice is. If it's fresh out of the freezer, stir for a little longer, whereas if it's start to melt, go for a little bit shorter of a stir. As I said earlier in the course of my episode about ice and dilution, you can actually measure how much water is added to your cocktail, which is a really easy thing to do. And uh, this is a really good way to kind of fine tune your favorite recipe when it comes to an old fashioned. Um, we're just gonna strain this over ice or even clear ice if you have it, which is what I'm doing here. And this is just a fantastic looking, fantastic taste and drink, which celebrates whiskey, but isn't overpowered by it. And then finally, you wanna make a decision on your garnish. So I like to go with the zest of orange because it brings a really nice kind of pithy citrus character to the drink. But if you prefer not to have this, you can omit it. You could also add a cherry, which is a really nice kind of sweetener. But because we have spirit, sweetness, bitterness, and a little bit of salt in here, I think the missing piece here is acidity. So just expressing your orange peel over the drink and around the rim of the glass is gonna be the perfect way to finish it off. So we'll just tidy this up into a really nice kind of ribbon for our garnish, now we've expressed the oils out of it. And this just can live inside our beautiful, rich, complex, whiskey forward and balanced, old fashioned. So enjoy that one everybody, and cheers. The Manhattan's one of the most popular and important cocktails of all time. Today I'm gonna to show you my absolute favorite recipe when it comes to a Manhattan. I'd also talk about some variations that can take it in slightly different directions. So, welcome along to Essential Cocktails. So the Manhattan's actually quite an interesting drink in that a lot of classic cocktails like the Manhattan have kind of changed and morphed over the years and been really open to interpretation. Whereas the base recipe of the Manhattan's remained much the same. It's broadly accepted that it contains two parts spirit, one part vermouth and a couple of dashes of bitters, garnished with either some kind of citrus peel or a cherry. And that recipe is pretty much timeless and it just works really, really well. So when it comes to the whiskey base, a lot of people say, should I use bourbon or rye in my Manhattan? And personally, I'd say the answer is yes. Whichever one you prefer, go with that one. I think a lot of people prefer bourbon, some people prefer rye, but whichever one you go with is gonna be really delicious if you love that kind of whiskey. So we're not gonna to be too bound by tradition here. If you take a rye whiskey, it's gonna be more spicy, a little bit more dry, perhaps a little bit more woody. Whereas if you go for a bourbon, it's gonna be a little bit rounder, a little bit sweeter, and it's gonna just have a slight impact on the final drink. You could blend the two together, that'd also be really delicious. Or you could even ditch these all together and use Scotch whiskey, which would change the drink from being a Manhattan to being a Rob Roy. So today we're gonna to go with the rye whiskey because that's my personal preference and kind of what I feel like right now. But you could use bourbon and it'd be totally delicious. And we're gonna pair that with our sweet vermouth. I'm going with Cocky Vermouth di Torino, which has got a really nice full body, enough kind of natural sweetness without being overpowering and a little bit of complex herbal note in there as well. And I'm gonna go with regular aromatic bitters from Scrappy's Bitters. But if you have Angostura, that'll work really well as well. When it comes to the garnish, I actually like to add a little bit of orange zest to the drink, but I also like to use a cherry for our kind of visual garnish. And there we have our ingredients from the Manhattan. So we're gonna be stirring this down and let's start building it now. So into our mixing glass, we're gonna start with 50 mils of our rye whiskey. <laughs> and you wanna have a look at the ABV of this. So if this is a 40% ABV, that's a slightly lower ABV than this, which is gonna be 45%. So you just need to factor that into your dilution and your stirring. The higher the ABV, probably the more you're gonna to wanna to stir it down just to get a little bit more dilution. Otherwise it can be quite a powerful drink. So 50 mils or two parts of our whiskey. If you use bourbon, it's gonna be different. If you use scotch, it's gonna be very different again. So don't underestimate the power of the whiskey because this really is the heart of the drink. I'm gonna pair that with 25 mils of your choice of vermouth. And I really like the cocky range. I think this is a really delicious vermouth but experiment with different vermouths because the combination of the whiskey and the vermouth together is kind of the basis of this drink. So they do need to interact really nicely. And if you were to divide this one part or 25 mils into 12.5 mils each 
of a dry vermouth and a sweet vermouth, you'd be looking at what's called a perfect Manhattan, which is not my preferred way to drink the drink, but it is some people's, so you need to have that drink in your arsenal as well. We're gonna go three dashes of aromatic bitters to bring a little bit of complexity to the drink, a little bit of spicy bitterness, and then we're gonna stir the drink down over lots of ice. And when it comes to stirring, I'd aim for around about 20 to 35 seconds here, depending on your ice. So if the ice is fresh out of the freezer, you wanna stir for a little longer. Also, if the ABV is higher in the whiskey, maybe stir for a little longer. Whereas if the ice has started to melt a little bit, or you've got a lower ABV in the whiskey, stir for a little bit less time. And as I said in my episode about ice and dilution, which I'll link above, which is from earlier in the course, you can actually measure your dilution and work out exactly how much water you want to introduce to your Manhattan to get your own perfect recipe. You can also experiment with different vermouths in the recipe. So if you were to introduce a Verna, this would make it into a black Manhattan, which is a really delicious mix. And you can actually bring in lots of other flavors, including coffee being one of them. And I actually explored this in full detail in this video above. We're gonna strain into a chilled Nick and Nora glass or a coupe glass. And then to finish the Manhattan, I like to go with a double garnish, one of which for aroma, one of which for kind of taste and visual. So first of all, I'll take a little orange coin, just taking the zest off the orange, and we're gonna express this over the drink, which is kind of optional, but I think this adds a little bit of freshness to the drink, kind of lightens the richness a little bit, which we're gonna get rid of. And then we'll finish the drink with a boozy cherry, which is another classic garnish for a Manhattan. And there we have a whiskey forward, timeless classic of a cocktail, which is called a Manhattan. Enjoy that everybody. Despite being one of the most important cocktails of all time, being said to have evolved from the Manhattan and eventually into the Martini, the Martinez often slips under the radar of a lot of cocktail drinkers. This drink's absolutely delicious, so easy to make, and today I'm gonna to show you how. So, welcome to Essential Cocktails. Let's make a Martinez. So if you're not familiar with a Manhattan, I'll put a video all about that drink just up here for you to watch. And I probably do recommend watching that first because then this drink will make a lot more sense. And that kind of lineage from Manhattan to Martinez to Martini will just have a very clear path and you can see how one evolved into the other, evolved into the next. And that's quite an important chain of events really. They're three absolutely fundamental cocktails, despite two of them being a lot more popular than one. And the one we're gonna talk about today, which is a bit less popular, although it shouldn't be, is the Martinez. So just like the Manhattan, we're gonna have a spirit base, which rather than being bourbon or rye or some kind of whiskey, is actually gonna be gin in our Martinez. And this can be a lot of different types of gin. London dry gin's become very popular, mostly because it's readily available, but it does work really nicely in the drink. But traditionally, this might be a Geneva, it might be an Old Tom gin, which is gonna change the dynamic of the drink quite a lot either with a more malty style or something a little bit sweeter. So I'm gonna stick with London Dry today because it is very readily available and it's really delicious, but play around with whatever you have. And if you have different types of gin, get them in here. So once again, comparing this to a Manhattan, that drink contains vermouth and the Martinez is no different. So we've got our spirit base, we've got our vermouth, which is gonna be a sweet vermouth, but we'll talk more about that in a second. But in the Martinez, we've got one extra ingredient, which is gonna be a little bit of maraschino liqueur. So this is a cherry liqueur. It's gonna bring a little bit of fruitiness to the drink and another layer of complexity, which you perhaps wouldn't otherwise find. And then to finish off, we're gonna go with our bitters. In a Manhattan, you'd probably go for an aromatic bitters, but I really like in a Martinez to go with an orange bitters because we're leaning into the kind of more botanical notes, the more citrusy notes that you find in the gin, and then the more fruity notes that we find in the maraschino. So this is a really easy drink to put together. Four ingredients stirred down with ice and a garnish, and I'm gonna show you how to put it together now. So some recipes I've seen for a Martinez call for equal parts of our spirit and our vermouth but I prefer to go for a two to one ratio, which has become the more kind of popular way of doing things. And that's also in line with our Manhattan, which we've spoken about the similarities between these two drinks. So I'm gonna go with 50 mils of our gin, 25 mils of our sweet vermouth, and I'm going with Cocky di Torino, which is a really delicious vermouth, but you can experiment with other styles of vermouth. And some recipes actually started calling for dry vermouth. So if we see how we've moved from an equal part spirit and vermouth recipe to a more spirit forward recipe of two to one, We've moved from a sweet vermouth to a dry vermouth. We've also got the bitters in there, which is sometimes in a martini. You can really see how this has evolved over time to be a real inspiration to the martini itself. So to 50 mils of gin, 25 mils of vermouth, we're just gonna go with a tiny amount, five mils of our maraschino liqueur, just for a little bit of fruitiness in there and a little bit of sweetness. And then finally, three dashes of orange bitters, 
bringing that really nice bittersweet zesty character to the drink. We're going to stir this down with plenty of ice until it's really nice and cold. Strain into a chilled Nick and Nora or coupe glass. And then we're going to garnish the drink with your choice of either an orange zest or a cherry. And I'm going to go with orange zest today. So you just want to take off a nice big peel, which we can express over the drink without getting too much pith there. You don't want it to be super bitter. So express that over the drink for that really nice citrus oil aroma. Rim the glass. And then we just want to tidy this up and make a really beautiful looking garnish. And this can just sit nicely on the rim of the glass. But equally, a cherry would also be delicious. And there we have a fundamental drink, which is perhaps underrated, despite being very important to the world of cocktails, which brings really nice botanical notes of gin, really nice herbal notes of the vermouth and a little bit of fruitiness from the cherry and the orange. And it's called a Martinez. If you haven't given that one a try, I strongly recommend that you do. The perfect martini doesn't exist, but the perfect martini for you does exist. And today I'm going to show you how to find it. Welcome to Essential Cocktails. So the martini is not one of those drinks where you can just walk into a bar, order a martini and get exactly the drink that you want. When it comes to ordering a martini, there are lots of things to consider, a lot of questions you'll be asked, and a lot of decisions to make. So today I'm gonna to talk you through those decisions and the top seven decisions you have to make in order to make your own perfect martini. So the origins of the martini have a pretty clear lineage, which you can track, starting with a Manhattan. So a Manhattan is a very old drink, which had a whiskey base, and still does have a whiskey base, vermouth and bitters. And then that kind of evolved over time into a drink called a Martinez. So a Martinez, rather than having the bourbon or the rye base, has gin, it also has vermouth in there, still sweet vermouth, and then a couple of drops of orange bitters and a little bit of cherry liqueur. And then from there, we have the martini, which is what we're talking about today. So we have a spirit base, we have vermouth or a wine-based aperitif, bitters, sometimes, but not always, which we'll talk about today. And then we have a garnish, which we'll also talk about. So the seven considerations we're gonna talk about today to help you find your perfect martini are number one, the spirit base. Number two, the ratio. Number three, bitters or no bitters. Number four, the method. Number five, dilution. Number six, the glass. And then finally, number seven, the garnish. And when you've worked out your preferences in all these sections, you'll be able to find your perfect martini. So the first decision you make, which is a really important one, is whether you go for a vodka martini or a gin martini with either vodka or gin at the base. And this is a big decision. If you're gonna go for a vodka, I do recommend spending a little bit more money than you would otherwise for mixing, maybe for a potato vodka, which has that really nice creamy body. But if you're gonna go for a gin, choose the gin you love. All sorts of gins have different makeups of botanicals and flavors and ingredients. So whichever one's your favorite is gonna make a really nice martini. But whichever you go for, number one tip here is to keep this in the freezer. So this gin is a Colworth Farm Distillery dry gin, and it's just got a really nice makeup of characteristics. And this has been in the freezer to get it really, really nice and cold. And just bear in mind, because these are really high ABV, they're not gonna freeze. So you can even keep these in the freezer to be ready to go whenever you want a martini. Something you can do here is blend the two together. So part vodka, part gin, with a bit of Kina Lalay, which is a classic wine-based aperitif, or even Lalay Blanc, which is a more recent version. And that's gonna be your Vespa martini, which is, to some, the perfect martini, to others not. So you can also experiment with that. So now we've chosen our base spirit, which today's gonna be gin, but for you might be vodka. We can move on to point number two, which is our ratio. So now we've got our gin or our vodka ready to go. We need to think about what we're gonna pair this with, which is gonna be a vermouth or a wine-based aperitif, depending on your preference. So I've got a couple here, which I think are really good options. Martini Extra Dry is a really kind of classic option, quite light, quite clean and readily available. So it's gonna make a really good martini. But I really like these two, which have a little bit more complexity, a little bit more body and kind of floral notes, a little bit more going on in there, which I think is really nice. So technically these aren't vermouths, they're both aperitif wines, but they're more than acceptable in a martini. First of all, we've got Cocky Americano, and then second of all, we've got Lillet. And what I recommend doing here, if you can, is to taste these, get an idea of what you think they bring to the drink, and then choose the martini based on the combination of the gin and the vermouth, or the vodka and the vermouth. So now we've got an idea of what we're gonna pair with our spirit, we need to think about that ratio that I was talking about. 
So this is kind of a slide in scale. There's no right and wrong here. Over here, we have very dry martinis. Over here, we have a wet martini. And within that, there's kind of lots of variation. You can look at this as a ratio. You can look at it as dry, wet, whatever you want. But the easiest way to do this is to work out exactly how much spirit, exactly how much of your aperitif wine or your vermouth, and then work out, I think the ratio here is the most important. So over here, we have very dry martinis, which are really driven by our spirits. So this might be a 12 to one, 12 part spirit to one part of your vermouth. That could be a very dry martini. Whereas as we move through the spectrum, we get our dry martinis, we get our kind of wet martinis. There's such things as a 50-50 martini, which is half and half, or you can even go for a reverse martini or an inverted martini, which leads with the vermouth. So as I said here, there's no right and wrong. You might want a very boozy, high ABV drink. You might want a more complex kind of floral, lower ABV drink. So if you're not sure where to start with this, I'd perhaps recommend starting with a four to one ratio. So four parts or 60 mils of your spirit, I'm going gin, but you could try vodka, to one part or 15 mils of your vermouth, your aromatized wine. And that's a really nice starting point. It's got enough of the vermouth coming through to give it that kind of complexity, but also plenty of spirit to still be very much a gin or vodka based drink. So that's a good starting point. Work on that entire spectrum, make a decision, and then we can move on to our next point, which is gonna be whether we have bitters or no bitters. So when it comes to adding bitters to a martini, I think we need to think back to that Martinez, which I was speaking as a precursor to the martini. So that had its gin base, it had vermouth, which was usually sweet vermouth, but then kind of became a drier vermouth. And it also had maraschino liqueur and orange bitters. And a lot of people like to add orange bitters to a martini. I think maybe it's a remnant of that kind of lineage working its way down to the martini. But my personal preference here is not to. We don't want the drink to be kind of a really bitter drink, in my own opinion, but maybe you disagree. So if you like things to be a little bit more pithy, a little bit more kind of citrus forward, feel free to add a couple of drops. And if you disagree with any of this or you agree with any of this, make sure you let me know in the comments because as I said, there's no perfect martini, but I wanna hear about your perfect martini. So now we've decided in this recipe not to go for bitters, we can start thinking about the next point, which is the mixing method. So the question you probably think about when you order a martini is shaken or stirred. And it's actually a really important decision to make. If you shake the drink, which I think is not optimal, you're gonna really liven it up lose some of the kind of clarity and the transparency of the drink, but it will be more vibrant, a little bit more alive and kind of bubbly. Whereas if you stir the drink over ice, which is my own personal preference, you get a little bit more elegance in the drink. I think you get a little bit more clarity of flavor and whichever ingredients you go for really come through quite vividly. Whereas if you shake them up, they get a little bit all over the place and lost. So personally, we're gonna be stirring this, but if you prefer it shaken, who am I to argue? James Bond likes it that way, so some of you might as well. So now we've covered how we're gonna mix the drink together, we need to start thinking about a really important factor which I think is often overlooked, which is the dilution of your martini. So when it comes to the dilution of your martini, this is a really important thing to think about. So if it's under diluted to your taste, it might be too kind of boozy, too spirit forward and not really that drinkable. Whereas if it's over diluted, it's gonna be watery, a little bit thin and perhaps not what you're looking for in that kind of intensity level when it comes to the martini. For my own taste, I really like a 25% dilution. So if you weigh the drink before you stir it down with ice versus the final drink after you've stirred it down with ice, you've got 25% more liquid. And this is really easy to measure. In fact, I did a full episode about ice and dilution, which I'll put just here, which you can watch. But as a starting point, maybe 25 to 30% would be really good. But if you're stirring it down, wait till the ice kind of rounds out, wait till the glass gets really chilled and you're probably gonna be roughly in that zone. So don't underdo it, don't overdo it. But if you wanna be really precise, you can measure it and repeat that over and over again every time you make a martini. So now we've made some big decisions about how the drink's gonna taste and how it's gonna feel in our mouth. We need to start thinking about how the drink's gonna look and how it's gonna be finished off, starting with the glass that we choose. So when it comes to choosing a glass for your martini, there are three things to think about. Number one, is it the right size for your martini? It shouldn't be too big that you're gonna have, you know, 100 mils of vodka or gin to fill it. Number two, do you like it? Do you like the look of it? Do you like the feel of it? Do you like how it kind of carries the drink and brings the aroma to your nose? And then number three, not really a decision, more of a recommendation, it needs to be really, really cold. So whichever martini you're making, get that glass in the freezer if you can. If not, put some ice in there, get it really, really nice and cold. And then that's really critical to this drink. A good martini is spoiled by not being cold enough, but if you wanna get the very best out of your martini, it wants to be really, really nice and cold. So once we've got that, we can think about our final element, which is gonna be our garnish. So when it comes to garnishing a martini, there are probably two primary options for a classic martini. Number one is gonna be an olive. Number two is gonna be a lemon zest twist. 
There are other options. You could do something like a pickled onion in a Gibson martini, but that does stray away from our classic template. And I really like to go for an olive. If you're familiar with this course or with this channel, you know I like to add a little bit of seasoning to my drinks in the form of either salt or something that kind of brings a little bit of variation to the drink, maybe vanilla. But I really like an olive because it brings that really nice kind of savory mouthfeel, a little bit of saltiness and umami. And I think in a martini, that's really, really welcome. We've got all the complexity from the gin or the vodka, got all the complexity from the vermouth, and that olive just makes you kind of want more and more of it. And these olives, not sponsored, are the best olives in the world that I've ever tried. Perello olives, give them a try if you can get hold of them. If you want to take this one step further, you can actually add a little bit of the olive brand to your martini to make what's called a dirty martini. But if you want a fresher take on the martini, you can just remove a little bit of lemon peel, express this over the drink, and just tidy it up for a really pretty and kind of citric and fresh garnish. So now we've talked about all the seven things you can think about. I've kind of told you my seven preferences. I'm gonna make my own perfect martini, which I think is gonna be a really good starting point for you as well. So let's make a martini. Okay, so for this martini, we're gonna start with our chilled frozen gin. And I'm gonna go with 60 mils of this, which is gonna be four parts. And I'm also stirring this down in a nice chilled mixing glass, which really does help things along to get it nice and cold. So 60 mils of that. We're gonna go 15 mils or one part of my wine-based aperitif, which is gonna be cocky Americano. We're gonna forego the bitters, but you'd add them now, maybe two or three dashes. And then we're gonna stir this down with plenty of ice. So we're just gonna stir this down for around about 30 to 45 seconds, aiming for that 25 to 30% dilution. So now that's really nice and cold. I'm just gonna strain this into my frozen glass. Very happy with that. And we have our martini, which we're just gonna finish off with an olive. And there we have what I consider to be the perfect martini, which may also be yours. Experiment, let me know which one ends up being your favorite and enjoy. Welcome back to Essential Cocktails. I'm Dan Fellows, and today we're gonna to make one of the most simple but beloved cocktails in the world called the Negroni. So when I said the Negroni is a simple drink, it really, really is. It contains three ingredients, which are all completely different, but bring something to the final drink and works so well together. And if you want to trace back the origins of a Negroni, it's actually quite easy to see how this drink's developed over time, starting with a drink called a Milano Torino. So Milano Torino is a really simple drink. The first ingredient being from Milan, which is going to be Campari, hence Milano. And the second is going to be from Turin, which is a vermouth from Torino. And I'm going with Cocchi Storico Vermouth di Torino. And if you combine these two together, you get that delicious drink called a Milano Torino, but it's quite thick, quite heavy, quite kind of syrupy. And although that's not such a bad thing, over time, this drink got lightened and was topped up with soda water or sparkling water to create a drink called an Americano. So the Americano gained lots of popularity and understandably so. It's a really delicious drink, very refreshing, kind of bittersweet. But the story goes that in 1919, Count Camillo Negroni, who'd been traveling around the Americas and specifically New York, had grown really fond of kind of hard spirits and particularly gin. And he asked for his Americano to be strengthened with gin instead of soda water. And with that decision, the Negroni was born. So once again, going back to the simplicity of a Negroni, it really is very, very simple. And it's actually an equal part recipe traditionally. So I'm gonna go with 30 mils of gin. And this is gonna bring plenty of those botanical notes, a little bit of citrus in there. But what you can do here is actually use different gins. Although I do recommend using a gin that's got plenty of those juniper flavors, kind of high intensity, because it's going up against such big ingredients that if you didn't use a really high intensity gin, it would run the risk of being lost and that kind of damaged the Negroni. So as I said, this is 30 mils for a single serve, but you could do 30 mils, you could do 300 mils if you prefer. You could even pour a bottle of each of these into a big container, decant it back into the bottles, keep it in the fridge, and this is one of the most batchable drinks in the world. And once again, referring back to that equal parts formula, some people like to change the amount of gin in here, increasing it to give a little bit more of the kind of booziness, bringing down the bittersweet and herbal characteristics and making a slightly lighter drink. So whereas we're gonna go one to one to one, some people might go 1.5 parts gin to one part vermouth and one part Campari. Some people might even go two to one to one. Experiment with this to find your own perfect ratio, but we're gonna keep things kind of classic here. 
equal parts is a really good starting point. So 30 mils of Arjun, I'm gonna go 30 mils of Campari. And this brings those really nice inherent bittersweet notes, some kind of citrus in there, a little bit of kind of pithy peel and a little bit of rhubarb as well. But you can also experiment with other bittersweet ingredients here. You could use Amaro, but if you don't like that really high bitterness or the relatively high bitterness, you could go with something like Aperol, which is a lower intensity, lower ABV and slightly less bitter option. So keeping the kind of DNA of a Negroni, but making it a little bit more approachable, a little bit less bitter and probably suitable for people who aren't keen on that high bitterness in the drink. So that's one option. And then the second option we have is with your vermouth. So I really like Cocky Storico. I think it's really delicious. It's got a nice balance of herbals and sweetness in there, but there are many other vermouths on the market. Experiment, find out which one you prefer, and we're gonna go 30 mils in this drink. So that's our base, very simple, equal parts put together. This is a single serve, but if you've gone for a bigger batch size, keep it in the fridge. It'll keep forever in the fridge, and you've got a Negroni ready to go whenever you want it. So that's a good option. But now we're gonna stir this down with plenty of ice for our single serve Negroni. So because these are quite high intensity ingredients and quite syrupy, you do want to get an adequate amount of dilution in here. And if you want to learn more about dilution, I'll link a video above, which is going to cover all the kind of fundamentals of dilution, which you can watch at your leisure. But now we're going to serve up our Negroni. So to serve the drink, I'm just going to strain this over a nice big clear ice cube, which I can teach you how to make above. But if you don't have this, you can use cubes. You can use a big block of ice, whichever works for you. And then to finish off the drink, I'm just going to take a nice big, swathe of orange peel because that citrus really cuts through the kind of sweeter elements in the drink. I'm going to express this over the top around the rim of the glass and then just give it a little tidy up just to finish off. So you just want to finish off by cleaning up those edges, making your garnish look as attractive as the rest of the drink. Drop that in there and there we have the most simple but delicious bittersweet and complex drink which is a Negroni. Enjoy everybody. The white Negroni takes the very Italian affair of a classic Negroni with Campari and Italian vermouth, subs out the Italian ingredients and introduces some French ingredients, including Sousa and Le Blanc, and creates something completely different, flips the Negroni on its head, but also quite similar as well. So if you love a Negroni, I think you're gonna love this. And today I'm gonna to show you how to make it. Welcome to Essential Cocktails. So somewhat ironically, the white Negroni wasn't created by a French bartender or an Italian bartender, but it was actually created by a British bartender called Wayne Collins in 2001. And Wayne was actually visiting France and he wanted to create essentially a French inspired Negroni, taking out the Italian ingredients, bringing in some kind of French touches, and this is what he ended up with. So for our white Negroni, once again, it's a three ingredient affair, starting with gin, which is true in both drinks. I'm going with beef eater because it's got those really nice kind of juniper forward characteristics, but whichever gin you like, you can try. We've got Sousa, which is a bittersweet gentian-based liqueur, which we're subbing in for the Campari. And although they're not the same, it does a similar job. So it brings that kind of bittersweet characteristic, a little bit of kind of herbal note in there as well. And it's very delicious, but quite intense. And then finally, Lele Blanc, which we're bringing in instead of sweet vermouth. And this has those subtle floral characteristics, which make this drink kind of light, kind of refreshing, and very different from a classic Negroni, whilst maintaining that classic DNA of bittersweet notes herbal notes and botanical notes. So I'm gonna build this now, and this isn't usually an equal part formula. So the first thing we'll do is add our gin to the drink. So whereas a classic Negroni is usually an equal parts recipe of one to one to one, a lot of people like to do a two part spirit, one part Sousa, one part Lele Blanc kind of variation on this. And I think that works really well in the white Negroni. This allows the gin to come through, and that Sousa is a pretty big old flavor. So if you're adding this in equal parts to the gin, no matter how kind of intense and flavor forward the gin is, it's probably gonna be lost. So I think this two to one to one ratio actually is perfect for this. So in this drink, I'm going 50 mils, but you can scale this up as much as you need. You can make tons of this if you wanted to, very, very easily. But we're gonna do 50 mils, 25 mils of Sousa, which is quite powerful. And it has quite a vivid color as well. So we don't wanna lose our kind of almost white color, which is basically yellow, but don't tell anyone. And then finally, 25 mils of Lele Blanc, 
which has those really nice floral notes and a little bit of freshness to balance out the bitter notes, the gentian base liqueur. We're gonna have plenty of ice and give this a little stir down over the ice. We're gonna strain this into our chilled rocks glass, ideally with clear ice if you have it. And you can see the color isn't white, but it's definitely not that vivid red that we associate with the Negroni. So to finish the drink, we're gonna do something again, similar but different. This time we're gonna go with grapefruit, which just has a slightly different characteristic to the orange in a regular Negroni and you want to take a big, big swathe because this really is kind of a key ingredient in the drink. It really needs acidity and freshness. So you're going to express that liberally over the drink and around the glass, tidy it up into a nice presentable swathe of grapefruit, pop that in the glass for a little contrast of color. And there we have a delicious variation on the Negroni, which is the white Negroni. Enjoy. For those of you who love Negronis and whiskey, today we've got you covered. In this episode of Essential Cocktails, we're gonna make a drink called a Boulevardier. So just like the classic Negroni, which the Boulevardier is a riff on, it contains Campari, it contains sweet vermouth, but the key difference we're gonna make here is that we're subbing out gin and introducing bourbon whiskey. And even though these drinks are very similar on paper, I think you're gonna be surprised at how different they are in the glass. So the classic Negroni is usually an equal parts drink, although people do kind of change around with the proportions. But in a Boulevardier, we're gonna go with a slightly different ratio. So this is gonna be a stirred drink, and rather than doing 30, 30, 30, or one part to one part to one part, I'm actually gonna do 45 mils of our bourbon. And we're gonna call this 1.5 parts. And the reason for this is we do want this to be quite different to a Negroni. And those kind of rich toffee-like notes that we find in the bourbon just really contrast the gin, the kind of deeper, rounder, more kind of caramelly, whereas gin obviously has much more vibrancy and freshness. So 45 mils of our base spirit. You could even do 60 mils or two to one to one, but I think 1.5 to one to one is a really easy ratio. It works really nicely and it doesn't overpower the Campari and the vermouth. So with the Campari, we're gonna do one part, which is gonna be 30 mils. But this is a really easy drink to scale up once again, just like the Negroni, just like the white Negroni. You could make even huge vats of this. You could even age this in a barrel, which would be quite nice. So 30 mils of that, but you could do 300, you could do three liters. Depends how many friends you've got, depends how much you wanna make. And then finally, we're gonna go 30 mils of our sweet vermouth or whatever amount you wanna make, depending on the batch size. So to summarize this recipe, 45 mils of bourbon, or 1.5 parts, 30 mils of Campari, or one part, 30 mils of sweet vermouth, one part again, and we're just gonna stir this down over plenty of ice. We're gonna strain this into a frozen glass with a nice big clear ice cube if you have it, or cubes, or a big block if you don't. And then we're gonna finish the drink with a good zest of orange just expressed over the top of the drink. Garnish with your orange zest, and there we have a delicious riff on the Negroni, which has deeper, rounder, more caramel-like notes called a Boulevardier. Enjoy. Although the spritz has been around for over 100 years, maybe closer to 200 years, only in recent memory has it reached the global fever pitch that we see today, where everywhere you go, particularly where the sun's shining, you'll see people drinking and enjoying Aperol spritzes, Campari spritzes, Amaro spritzes, and they're super refreshing, super delicious. But one thing that people do is they tend to favor a three to two to one ratio, a Prosecco to Aperol to soda water. But I prefer something different. Today, I'm gonna to show that to you. So the first thing we need to do with our spritz is decide what we're gonna build it around. And a really obvious option would be Aperol. Everyone knows the Aperol spritz. It's a really good base for the drink. But you can also experiment with other bases. Things like Campari work really well for a little bit more bitterness and a little bit more booziness. You can also experiment with different Amari. Each Amaro will have a kind of different flavor profile. 
so experiment with different bases. But to our Aperol, which we're going to go with today because it's really classic and works so well, we're going to need also some soda water and finally some Prosecco. And most people really like that three, two, one formula. Three parts Prosecco, two parts Aperol, one part soda. But I actually like to change this up a little bit. And rather than going three, two, one, I like to go one, two, three, squeeze. And I'll explain the squeeze later, but we're gonna just build this slightly differently to a classic Aperol spritz, just to maintain that really nice bubbliness, really nice fizz, and get as much kind of refreshing vibrancy in the drink as possible. So the first thing we need to do is grab a really cold glass to build the drink in, just like this one. And then rather than using a jigger like this one to measure the drink, I'm actually gonna build it on scales directly in the glass. And the reason for this is that same reason, just to keep it really fizzy. So as I said before, three, two, one is popular. I like to do this slightly differently and do one, two, three, starting with one part of our soda water. So I'm gonna do 25 grams of soda as our starting point. And then two parts of that is obviously gonna be 50 grams of Aperol. This has got those really nice kind of citrus fruits in there. Very refreshing, a little bit of bitterness, but not too much. And then before we mix the drink, I'm actually gonna stir these two together. So by doing this, we obviously don't use the jigger, which is gonna give us more touch points. And each time we pour it into something, reduce the kind of fizziness of the liquids, but also building it on scales with just the first two ingredients it means I can stir them, get them really nicely mixed. And whereas the Aperol wants to sit on the bottom, now it's kind of mixed in with the soda water so we can really get it all the way through the drink without having to stir too vigorously, particularly with a Prosecco. So gonna tear my scales, pop my Prosecco, because this is always a bit of a celebration, right? And then to add our Prosecco, we're gonna add three parts, so 75 grams. And I recommend pouring this like you would in a champagne glass, just so it really mixes nicely. Oh, nearly 69. And then we can add our ice afterwards. So with an Aperol spritz, you wanna add plenty of ice and you wanna almost be kind of vigorous with how you add it because it will serve as another way just to mix the drink without having to stir it. So just give them a little push around and you wanna get loads of ice in Aperol spritz because it does wanna be really refreshing. And then my final tip, when I spoke about one, two, three, squeeze, refers to the orange. So I really like orange with Aperol. I think it's a perfect combination. So when I say squeeze, what I mean is take a really nice orange, a nice juicy orange, take a really big wedge, maybe like a sixth of the whole orange, and we're just gonna squeeze the whole thing into the drink. And this just brings that really nice kind of sweetness and acidity of orange and adds that really nice fresh orange character. We're gonna add a second slice of orange for our garnish. And this just makes the most delicious spritz. So there we have it. Refreshing, bittersweet, dry, fruity, beautiful. We have a spritz. Enjoy. Welcome to Essential Cocktails, everybody. Today we're exploring our first tiki recipe, and some say this is the ultimate tiki drink. I'm inclined to agree. So today we're gonna make a Mai Tai. Okay, so the Mai Tai. This is a delicious drink, which was created in the 1940s by Victor Bergeron, also known as Trader Vic, who's one of the pioneers of the tiki revolution. Although there are some arguments to say that Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gunt, which is a bit of a mouthful of a name, also known as Don Beach from Don the Beach Coma, created a drink which kind of inspired Victor Bergeron's Mai Tai 10 to 15 years later. Although Trader Vic really strongly denies that and says anyone who says he didn't create the drink is a stinker. So although Trader Vic clearly strongly denies any knowledge of Don's drink, there are two ingredients in common, which a lot of drinks have in common to be fair, being rum and lime. And then Don's drink was pretty different. It contained aniseed in the form of perno or absinthe. It contained grapefruit and it also contained velvet falernum. And none of those ingredients are in Trader Vic's recipe, which has become the kind of synonymous, definitive Mai Tai recipe that we know and love today. So since then, obviously a lot's happened. Drinks tastes have changed. And in the kind of 80s and 90s, the Mai Tai became this fruity, sweet, saccharine kind of abomination, a lot of people would say, which completely misrepresented what a Mai Tai should be or its original form. So what we're gonna to do today is make a drink which is inspired by Trader Vic's recipe, 
which I think is really, really delicious. There's gonna be no pineapple juice in there because that wasn't in the original recipe. And we're gonna need a few different things. So at the heart of every good Mai Tai is rum. And not one rum, potentially not two rums, but I'm going with three different rums today. So first of all, I'm gonna go with our aged white rum, which is gonna be El Dorado 3. We're also gonna go with a Jamaican rum, which is Appleton Estate, which has a little bit more age on there, a little bit more kind of funk coming through. And then we're gonna finish it off with Gosling's Black Seal Rum. And the reason for blending rums is that Trader Vic originally made this drink with Ray and Nephew 17, which was discontinued, and he was really searching for that flavor profile in his Mai Tai. And it's pretty difficult to know what that rum tasted like definitively. So this is the really exciting part of a Mai Tai. You can blend rums, you could introduce rum agricole, which would be a little bit more grassy, particularly a younger one. You can introduce really funky high ester rums, maybe some kind of really funky Jamaican rums. You can introduce darker rums like Gosling's or even an overproof Demerara rum. The world is your oyster here. Pick rums that you really like, experiment with blending them together. And that's gonna be our starting point for the Mai Tai. So to our rums, we're gonna be adding some sweet elements and some sour elements. And the sour element is gonna be freshly squeezed lime juice. As is common in a lot of tiki cocktails, this is really popular in many tiki drinks. So lime is gonna be our acidity. And then we're gonna have two sweeteners, one of which being a liqueur, one of which being a syrup. The liqueur is gonna be Cointreau in our recipe, but you can choose your favorite orange liqueur. And this brings some kind of complimentary round, sweet citric notes to the drink. And then second of all, we're gonna go with Orgeat, which is an almond syrup. So I'm using Monin Orgeat syrup. Some people like to make their own, which is also a really good option. But this just brings a really nice kind of nutty character to the drink. And then the final ingredient is gonna be a little bit of saline solution, which is not traditional. But if you followed this channel and this course for a while, you'll know I really like to bring big, diverse flavors together, like these using a little bit of salt, and this does a really good job of that. So now we can start building our Mai Tai. So there are hundreds, if not thousands of different Mai Tai recipes, and there's no right and wrong here, just the one that you find balanced based on your kind of flavor preferences and your favorite rums. So this is a really simple recipe. I'm gonna go 20 mils, first of all, of our aged white rum, which is gonna bring some of the kind of white chocolate, unripe banana notes and a little bit of vanilla to the drink. Very delicious. I'm gonna blend that with 20 mils of our Appleton Estate Jamaican rum. And these two work really nicely together without overpowering the drink. They just harmonize really well. 20 mils again of our freshly squeezed lime juice for the kind of acidity and brightness that you need in a lot of tiki cocktails. And then we're gonna do 20 mil again of our sweetener, but it's gonna be 10 mils of Cointreau and 10 mils of our Orgeat syrup. So a really simple recipe to remember, 20 mils of each rum, 20 mils of our lime juice, and then 20 mils of our sweetener divided into two, being 10 mils of Cointreau. And then finally, 10 mils of our Orgeat syrup, or some people pronounce this Orzat. And this is gonna bring that really nice nutty character to the drink. Finally, we'll grab our optional saline solution, which I do really recommend. And I'm a big fan of seasoning cocktails. So the purpose here is to bring these really kind of wide, vibrant flavors together. And this is gonna do that really nicely. Now I'm gonna add some crushed ice, which I've freshly crushed for the drink. And if you don't have an ice crusher like this one, that's totally fine. You can just wrap it in a tea towel and give it a smash with a rolling pin, obviously being careful, or even a muddler would work quite well. So that's around about 100 grams of our crushed ice. We're just gonna give this a really, really quick shake, no more than five seconds, just to mix it together. And then the reason for not shaking this any more than that, A, is because we don't wanna emulsify the drink. B, is because crushed ice really chills the drink quickly. But also C, we don't wanna over dilute the drink. So you can just open pour this into our glass and top this up with more crushed ice. I'm gonna go for a very traditional tiki garnish, which is gonna be a lime wheel and a big old sprig of mint because you wanna get that really nice kind of fresh aroma on the drink. And I do recommend garnishing before finishing the drink and I'll explain why in a second. So in we go with the lime, in we go with a big old over the top sprig of mint because this is tiki after all, and we can embrace excess. Gonna add our straw, and this isn't quite finished yet. So you can take this to the table, or to your guest, or for yourself, as you'd like to. And then to finish the drink, we're just gonna crown it with 10 mils of a really dark rum, such as Gosling's. And this just brings that kind of richness, those kind of treacle notes. And that finishes off our citrusy, rummy, nutty, orangey, delicious drink, known as a Mai Tai. Enjoy that one, everybody.
The Hurricane, to me, is the ultimate drink for a good time. At its heart, it's essentially a passion fruit, pomegranate and orange rum sour, which is a delicious drink. But over the years, it's been kind of marred by overly sweet and synthetic takes. So today I'm gonna to show you my absolute favorite hurricane recipe, which might also be the very simplest. So let's have a look at it now. So the Hurricane was invented in the 1940s at Pat O'Brien's bar in New Orleans. And the story goes that rum was much easier to get hold of at the time than other spirits. So the bar set about creating delicious drinks which contained rum. And this is a perfect example of that. So my favorite recipe for Hurricane really keeps things simple. And you'll see some recipes which call for, you know, 15 mils of this, 20 mils of that, 12.5 mils of that, two mils of that. And that's not really the way I want to approach this drink. I want to make it as easy as possible because being completely honest, I've been, put off from making hurricanes for a long time because there are so many things you need, so many different measurements. But I think this recipe, which is pretty much entirely equal parts, is as effective, if not more effective than any of the others I've tried. So today I'm gonna to show you that. So to make this version of the hurricane, we're gonna need three rums of your choice, essentially. I'm going with Eldorado 3, Appleton 8, and also Gosling's Black Seal Rum. And these three work really nicely together, bring in kind of rich vibes. The lighter rum kind of balances out the richer rum. The Jamaican rum brings a really nice kind of tropical fruit funkiness to the drink. And you can play around with these. Use whichever three rums you like. You could just use one rum, but triple up the amount you add in there. So you add the same amount as we would of the three. And experiment here. This is all about experimentation. I really like this combination. There's a world of rum out there. And let me know in the comments below, which is your favorite rum or combination of rums for a hurricane. To our rums, we're gonna need some acidity. This is gonna be in the form of lime juice. We're gonna need a sweetener, which also has acidity which is gonna be freshly squeezed orange juice. And this really levels it up from using bottled. And then we're gonna need a sweetener, which is gonna be grenadine. And I really like to add a little bit of saline solution because I really think these are big flavors and bringing them together with a pinch of salt in the form of a few drops of saline works really nicely. Finally, a hurricane wouldn't be complete without a passion fruit, which is one of the key flavors of a hurricane. So we're gonna use that later. So now I've got all our ingredients, we can start building our hurricane. So the hurricane historically is a really, really big drink. I'm talking huge and I think actually way too big. So I'm gonna build this in our shaker tin, but this recipe, as I said, is very simple, almost entirely equal parts. So you can really easily scale it up as much as you want. You could double it up and put it in a classic hurricane glass, that'd be completely fine. But just be mindful, you'd be drinking 90 mils of rum, which is quite a lot by anyone's standards. So if you're gonna do that, take it easy, drink responsibly. So first of all, we've got our white rum in there already, 15 mils. Then I've got 15 mils of my Jamaican rum, and these work really nicely together. And then we've got those rich molasses notes from our black seal rum. And as I said, these are a really perfect base for experimentation. Use the rums you have, try new rums, experiment with different rum agricole, different ages of rum, different styles of rum, different origins. Wherever the rum comes from will have a big impact on the flavor profile, as with the production method, aging, etc. Rum has so many variables, so many flavor notes you can find in there. So have a good experiment and find your own perfect blend for your hurricane. To 15 mils of each rum, once again, keeping things really simple, we're gonna go with 15 mils of our lime juice for our freshness and zing, which is really important in a drink, which historically can be a little bit overly sweet. Bridging our sweetness and acidity, I'm gonna go with our freshly squeezed orange juice, but this is perfectly intact. This is a really beautiful orange, and there's a lot of flavor in the peels, which if you can maximize, I do recommend using. You can use that in things like oleo saccharum. You can use it as a garnish, so ideally, if you've taken the peel off, you can use an orange like this for juicing, and that's gonna be a little bit more sustainable, really maximizing the flavor we get from our oranges. So we're gonna go in with 15 mils of our freshly squeezed orange juice. And as I said, using fresh just really levels up the drink. If you use bottled, it tends not to have that vibrancy and freshness of freshly squeezed orange juice. So I'm gonna go 15 mils of that. I'm gonna go in with 15 mils of our sweetener, which is gonna be grenadine. I'm using the Mon and Grenadine syrup. And this is essentially a pomegranate flavored sugar syrup, which gives it that really nice red vivid color that you often associate with a hurricane. And then optionally, I'm gonna go in with 0.5 grams of our saline solution, made with one part salt to five parts water, just to bring all those big flavors together. And no hurricane would be complete without passion fruit. So I'm just gonna cut this in half and add all of the pulp straight into the shaker. And it'll give it that really nice kind of tart, sweet, tropical flavor that we all know and love with passion fruit. Just gonna add around about 100 grams of crushed ice to this. 
give it a couple of very quick shakes over ice just to kind of mix it all together, but we don't want to overly dilute, so no more than five seconds. Then you want to open pour this into a chilled highball glass. I'm just going to top this up with a little bit more crushed ice. And one thing to remember here is that because we're open pouring, we're going to get all of the passion fruit pulp in the drink. Some people really like this, you might prefer it out of there. And if that's the case, you can just shake this with cubed ice, fine strain it into crushed ice, and you'll get a really similar result. But you do run the risk of having a little bit more dilution, and you don't get that really nice passion fruit pulp coming up the straw. So whichever way you go, completely your call. I love passion fruit, I love that texture as a little surprise, but make it your preferred way. To garnish, I'm just gonna cut a little wedge of lime, so you can adjust the balance of the drink if you prefer to. I'm gonna pair this with a really nice boozy cherry and finish off with a nice wooden straw. And there we have my favorite version of a passion fruity, rummy, tropical, delicious drink called a hurricane. Cheers. Today I'm going to show you a drink which bridges the gap perfectly between tiki and aperitif and it's called the jungle bird and when you look at these ingredients you might not immediately think that traditionally they're going to go together but when you taste the drink I think you'll be shocked at how amazing it really is. I'll also show you a riff on this recipe which I think I created and if I did create it then it's one of my finest creations. So today let's make some jungle birds. So the Jungle Bird was created in the 1970s by Jeffrey Ong in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And the drink takes its name from the bar in which it was created, which it's inspired by, which is the Avery Bar. And it has those tropical notes as well as the bird theme. So Jungle Bird is a perfect name for the drink. The drink itself bridges together two very different styles, which are kind of tropical tiki drinks and also aperitif style drinks. And it has a really nice balance of acidity and sweetness, like a lot of tiki drinks, but also those kind of bittersweet notes, really refreshing and crisp that we associate with aperitif style drinks. So to make a Jungle Bird, we're gonna need a black rum, such as Gosling's Black Seal Rum. Then we're gonna need Campari. And even rum and Campari are slightly less familiar combination, but actually work really nicely together. We're gonna to get our acidity from freshly squeezed lime juice, our sweetness from a cane sugar syrup or a white sugar syrup at a two to one ratio, and I'm using Monin. And then finally, bridging together the acidity and sweetness, and also bringing a really nice kind of creamy, foamy texture, we're gonna be shaking this with pineapple juice. And this is a really kind of key flavor in the drink. So first of all, in our jungle bird, we're gonna start with our black seal rum, which is gonna be 45 mils. And this brings those really nice treacly, molassesy flavors giving the really nice solid base to the drink. If you used a lighter rum, I don't think it'd really cut through with Campari in particular being such a big flavor. So the darker the rum you can get, the kind of richer and more intense flavor you can find, that's what you're really looking for. To our rum, we're gonna go 15 mils of Campari, which is a bittersweet liqueur, which brings those really nice kind of bittersweet pithy notes to the drink, which are a little bit unexpected. And then our main source of acidity is gonna be 15 more mils of freshly squeezed lime juice. I'm gonna go 10 mils of our two to one white sugar syrup, and I'm using Mon and Cane sugar syrup as our form of sweetness. And this also helps the texture of the drink, bring a little bit more viscosity. So you might wanna add a little bit less of this if you really want it to be a nice dry drink, because we are getting sweetness from the Campari and the pineapple, but up to 10 mils, I think is a really nice balance in the drink. And then to finish off, I'm gonna go 45 mils of good quality pineapple juice. And if you can squeeze your own or juice your own, even better. But with store-bought, it still works really nicely. So now I've got our classic Jungle Bird ready to go, ready to be shaken. I'm gonna start talking about a drink that I think I might have created, although I might not have done as well. Although I've never seen it done before and I can't find any references to it on the internet. So if it's not on the internet, maybe it doesn't exist. But what I'm talking about here is if we think back to a Negroni, you also have a white Negroni, where you make substitutions which do change the characteristic of the drink and very much the look of the drink, whilst also maintaining the kind of DNA of the core drink. So what we can do here with our classic Jungle Bird, we can make a few little tweaks, which change it from being kind of rich molasses forward and also quite a dark, deep red color to being a white version, which isn't clear, isn't necessarily a white completely, but it's a much lighter version, which has similar, but also different characteristics. So the first substitution we're gonna make to go from a classic Jungle Bird to a white Jungle Bird is to lose the Gosling's Black Seal Rum, which obviously is a much darker, richer color and characteristic. 
and replace it with an aged white rum, El Dorado 3, or your favorite white rum. Then we're gonna substitute out the Campari and bring in another bittersweet element, which is gonna be Sousa, which is a bittersweet gentian-based liqueur. We're gonna keep the lime juice. I'm actually gonna change our classic cane sugar syrup for something slightly different, which is gonna be a Monin coconut syrup. And this slightly changes the flavor profile of the drink, bringing a little bit more kind of tropical notes, a little bit more like a pina colada, but very different as well. So in with the coconut, and then we're gonna finish with our pineapple juice. So I'm gonna build this again using exactly the same proportions, which is gonna be 45 mils of our El Dorado 3 aged white rum, 15 mils of our Sousa gentian based liqueur, 15 mils of freshly squeezed lime juice, 10 mils of coconut syrup, and then 45 mils of our good quality pineapple juice. So we're gonna shake up our classic Jungle Bird first of all. And then the white Jungle Bird, giving it a really good shake to really whip up the pineapple juice, getting that really nice creamy texture. Gonna fine strain these over cubed ice into a nicely chilled glass. And you get that really nice kind of cascading look to the pineapple juice. And then again with the white Jungle Bird, fine straining it out. So the classic Jungle Bird is gonna be a little bit more of a classic bittersweet flavor profile coming from that Campari with a really nice kind of rich molasses forward rum. And then the white Jungle Bird is gonna be a little bit more herbal, a little bit more kind of pina colada in the flavor profile from the pineapple and the coconut. And then they're both gonna be garnished with a really nice big slice of dried pineapple. So we have the classic Jungle Bird and the white Jungle Bird. Enjoy. There aren't many drinks as evocative as a pina colada. It's got the power to take you from whatever you're doing immediately on holiday, sitting on a deck chair, sipping these in the sun. And there are so many bad pina colada recipes, but I do think that this one is the best I've ever tried. So without further ado, let's get onto our holidays, close your eyes, take yourself to a happy place, and let's make some pina coladas. So the pina colada is a ridiculously well-known cocktail, but I do think it often gets away without being quite perfect because it's always enjoyed in good locations, by the pool, on a sun lounger, having a great time and you're in a good mood. So you might excuse the fact that this drink is either too sweet, too kind of artificial, almost like liquid sun cream, or kind of a slushy rather than being a cocktail because you're having a good time and that's totally fine. But if you add a great drink on top of that experience, it takes it to a whole new level. And this recipe I'm gonna show you today, I think is on point and I'm really, really happy with it. So for our pina colada, we're gonna need a few things. The first of which being rum. And with rum, you can choose a rum that you enjoy. If you don't love rum, you can perhaps go for a white rum or an aged white rum, which is gonna be a little bit more mild, allow the pineapple and coconut to really come through. Whereas if you really like rum, like I do, you can go for a slightly more aged rum, which has a bit more character and a bit more intensity. So I'm using Appleton Estate 8, which is a really nice balance of kind of a little bit of funk in there, some kind of tropical notes, a little bit of roasted pineapple and banana right through to the more round kind of dark sugars. So a little bit of butterscotch and caramel. So this is gonna be my basis. And then we're gonna need the two key ingredients to a pina colada, which are gonna be pineapple in the form of pineapple juice and coconut in the form of cream of coconut. Ideally Coco Lopez cream of coconut, which is a really authentic choice, but you can use regular coconut milk if you can't get hold of this. And then we're gonna build around these flavors. First of all, with a bit of acidity using freshly squeezed lime juice. And then I like to add a little bit of salt to this in the form of saline solution. And this just brings it all together really nicely. So when it comes to making our pina colada, I'm actually gonna build this on scales because we're gonna be blending the drink. And jiggers are a little bit difficult when it comes to things like the Coco Lopez, and particularly with the saline. This is a really finely balanced drink and I'm really happy with exactly how it turns out. So I wanna be quite accurate with this and scales are the perfect way to do that. So first of all, we're gonna start with our rum and I'm going 40 grams here. And this is gonna be our spirit base to the drink. I'm gonna go 100 grams of good quality pineapple juice. You can use store-bought and you get really good results, but if you wanna to go to the next level, you can use freshly strained pineapple juice, either through a juicer or by blending it up and then straining it. And if you didn't know, pina colada actually directly translates as strained pineapple. 
hence the inclusion of pineapple in the drink. If you want to use strained pineapple, delicious. With the Coco Lopez, you want to give this a really good stir together because it does kind of separate in the can. And then when you've done that, we're going to add 50 grams straight into our blender cup. And it looks a little bit gloopy, but fear not, because in the final drink, this just brings that really nice creamy texture and loads of coconut flavor as well. So Coco Lopez is actually really quite sweet. So we do need some acidity to balance this. And I like to go for freshly squeezed lime juice, which just balances out the cocktail really well. And then finally, actually quite a lot of saline solution, much more than I usually add, which is gonna be two grams, made with one part salt to five parts water. And this just stops the drink feeling overly sweet and sour, and it brings it all together really nicely. So I think a lot of recipes now would just call for you to blend this up with ice, pour it into a glass and you've got your pina colada. But when ice is such a critical ingredient in this drink, either being the difference between a kind of really thin drink versus a really kind of thick, almost edible slushy, we do want to be quite precise with this. So I recommend adding 60 grams of ice here to get that perfect texture, which is drinkable, but also rich and creamy and luxurious. If you don't have a really high speed blender like a Nutribullet like this, or if you're stick blending, then I would actually recommend using the smaller ice. So maybe crushed ice, but because this is gonna be really rapidly blended, it's gonna chill down nicely. And the difference here is if you use really big cubes, it's gonna take a long time to break them down and chill the drink. So you're actually gonna add some heat as the liquid kind of gets the friction. Whereas if you use crushed ice, it's gonna be really efficient in chilling the drink and also blend up really easily. So I'm using cubes because this is a pretty high speed blender, but ideally if you wanna use crushed ice, that's gonna make things a little bit easier for you in your lower power blender. So we're just gonna blend this up until it's all mixed together. You can actually hear when it's ready because the ice stops kind of clicking inside the blender. We can feel this is really, really nice and cold and it's gonna be perfectly diluted. Pour this into a nice chilled glass. Oh my God, this is the best drink ever. Serve it with the straw. Garnish with some really nice dried pineapple for a nice elegant presentation. And that, for me, is the perfect pina colada. Enjoy. The zombie isn't a drink for the faint of heart. As you can probably tell from all these ingredients in front of me, and there are quite a lot, it contains a lot of booze, a lot of fruit, some really nice seasonings. And if you bring all these things together, you can actually make a really delicious drink, but it does contain a lot of booze, so be careful. So let's make some zombies. So the zombie was created in the 1930s by Don Beach of Don the Beachcoma, and he was one of the kind of pioneers of the entire tiki movement. I'm not exactly sure what he was thinking when he brought this many ingredients together and thought, I think that, 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 and that will all go really well together. But it turns out he was right. And this drink is really delicious. So what we're doing here is creating quite a simple template because the zombie can be quite an overwhelming drink. Not only does it have a lot of ingredients, it can have a lot of very specific ratios, proportions, but we're gonna keep things quite simple here. So I've actually chopped this into three parts. The first part being our booze, of which there is a lot, which is gonna be rum, 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 velvet falernum, and I'll talk about each one as I add them. We've got our juices, which are gonna be pineapple, grapefruit, and lime. And then we've got our kind of seasonings, which bring balance to the drink and just bring it all together. So we've got grenadine, we've got some kind of aniseed forward flavor, which is gonna be absinthe, but you could also use perno. Then we have some bitters and some saline solution. So this recipe isn't designed to be a recreation of the original recipe. It's designed to bring all the elements of a zombie that I really enjoy, and I think you might enjoy, into one drink in a kind of balanced way. So there's gonna be lots of variation and lots of kind of tweaks from the original. One thing that is missing is gonna be cinnamon. We're adding falernum, but if you really wanna introduce the cinnamon even more so, you could actually infuse cinnamon into one of your rums. I recommend just breaking them up, leaving them in the bottle till you've got enough cinnamon flavor and then straining them back out again. But because we're trying to keep things really simple and really repeatable on the course, I'm just gonna grate this over the top of the drink and that'll give us a really nice cinnamon aroma, which will finish off the drink really well. So with all that out of the way, let's start building our zombie. So as I mentioned before, the zombie is a pretty busy drink. It's got a lot of ingredients, but we can kind of bunch them into three parts. The first of which being the booze, then the juices, then the seasonings. And in the booze category, we're actually gonna keep things kind of simple. And doing it this way just makes it really easy to keep up with what we've added to the drink already. 11 ingredient drinks can be quite complex. It's very easy to miss something, but here we're actually gonna go equal parts. So the three rums are up to you, which three you go for. 
Historically, this might be a Jamaican rum, a Puerto Rican rum, and then some kind of overproof rum, maybe a Demerara rum. But whichever you go for is gonna have a big impact on the drink since it has a lot of rum in it. So first of all, I'm gonna go with 20 mils of our El Dorado 3 unaged white rum. But as I said, definitely experiment with this. We're gonna go 20 mils of a Jamaican rum and I'm going for apple to Nate, which has got a little bit of funk in there, but also some nice kind of caramelly notes as well. Gonna go 20 mils of an overproof Demerara rum. And this is gonna bring really rich kind of molasses characteristics and a lot of booze, to be honest. This is 57%, so take it easy. This one's woods. And whichever of the rums you decide to infuse with the cinnamon, it's gonna take on some of those spice flavors and it shouldn't take too long to infuse. So if you go down that track, obviously it'll bring a little bit more spice. But what we're gonna do here is add 20 mils again of Velvet Falernum from John D. Taylor's. And essentially this is a spiced liqueur with cane sugar, lime, clove, and almond. And this is gonna really kind of do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to the spice, along with bitters at the end. So I don't think it really misses too much of the cinnamon, but you can always add it in through the infusion. So that's our booze, 20 mils of each rum, whichever one you go for. 20 mils of our falernum, we can now move on to the juices. So when it comes to the juices, we've got our three, pineapple, grapefruit, and lime. And we're gonna start our kind of slide and scale down to finishing our zombie now. So we're actually gonna go 25, 20, and 15 mils, moving down the scale of our juices. Starting with the sweetest, which is gonna be pineapple, followed by grapefruit, which is a little bit more acidic, followed by lime, which is the most acidic. And these are just ways to kind of remember the recipe. So 25, 20, 15, starting with our pineapple juice. And the pineapple is gonna bring some of those kind of classic sort of tiki notes. And if you can use freshly juiced pineapple, even better, but store-bought is gonna do a good job here. So 25 mils of that. Then we're moving down our sliding scale. And we're gonna go 20 mils of grapefruit juice. I am using freshly squeezed here because I think it really does add something. But again, if you use store-bought, you will get reasonable results. So 20 mils straight into our jigger. Gonna go 15 mils of our most acidic juice and our least sweet, which is gonna be the lime juice. And this will be our primary acidity in the drink. So we've moved through the scale, 25, 20, 15. And now I can move on to our kind of seasonings, which bring balance to the drink. So in our seasoning section, we're kind of finishing off the drink, bringing it all together and balancing out what currently is essentially boozy juice. And this wouldn't be that delicious to drink yet. So these are gonna really kind of finish it off nicely. And we're gonna carry on with our sliding scale. So in the juices, we had 25 mil, 20 mil and 15 mil, going from sweetest to most acidic. Here we're gonna carry on with our kind of sliding scale. So we're gonna go 10 mils, five mils, two dashes, one gram. So the first ingredient is gonna be 10 mils of grenadine, which is gonna bring a little subtle pomegranate character, as well as lots of sweetness. I'm going for five mils of absinthe, but this is pretty overpowering, so be careful with this. And I'd actually say up to five mils is probably what you wanna go for no more, otherwise it becomes a little bit too aniseedy, which isn't really what the drink's all about. It does have an element of it, but think of this more like a seasoning than a flavor. So I'd go really, really easy on this. You could also use perno, which would be a little bit less intense, but still has lots of aniseed flavor. And then we're gonna go two to three dashes of aromatic bitters. This is also gonna bring out a little bit of the spice again. So really trying to recreate cinnamon without directly adding it necessarily. And then finally, this is a lot of ingredients. I'm gonna go one gram of saline solution, which is my go-to when I have lots of ingredients in a drink, just because it brings them all together really nicely. And now we're gonna add 100 grams of crushed ice just to chill it down and really mix it together. So 100 grams is just a good scoop of crushed ice. 103, that's pretty accurate. And as soon as the ice is in, we wanna move quite quickly. Just give this a really quick shake, no more than five seconds just to chill it down. And the crushed ice does a really good job of that. So that's actually plenty. It just livens the drink up a little bit. We're gonna open pour this into our chilled highball glass. Top it up with a little bit more crushed ice if you need to. Grate on a little bit of cinnamon, just so you've got that nice spice on the nose. Gonna garnish with a nice big mince sprig. And there we have my interpretation of a delicious, tiki, classic cocktail called a zombie. Enjoy. All right, welcome back to Essential Cocktails, everybody. Today we're making a drink that I think deep down, pretty much everybody loves, even if they pretend they don't. 
I'm actually really, really happy with the end result of this recipe. So today, let's make a porn star martini. So the porn star martini was created in the early 2000s by a bartender called Douglas Ankara in London. And the core flavor that we're really looking at in here is passion fruit. So to start our porn star martini, we're gonna need two passion fruits. And I kind of hear the argument that this is gonna add some cost to the drink, and I do agree with that. But we're gonna substitute out a bottle of liqueur. We're gonna use fresh, really nice, delicious passion fruit rather than any kind of alternatives. So it's gonna give a really natural flavor to the drink, and this is really key. So two of these we're gonna start with. We're also gonna go with vodka. You can choose to use a vanilla infused vodka if you prefer. You can buy vanilla vodka. You could infuse a stick of vanilla into a bottle of vodka. But because we're gonna add vanilla syrup later, we actually don't necessarily need to. And vodka, although delicious, can quite easily overpower a drink, which we don't wanna do. So I'm going with straight vodka. So now we need to think about our acidity. And for that, I'm going with freshly squeezed lime juice. To balance this with sweetness, I'm gonna go with the Monin vanilla syrup, which is gonna bring really nice balance to the drink and kind of underlying vanilla flavor. And then something you don't often see in a porn star martini is something that bridges acidity and sweetness together. And I've got a few ways of doing this. So first of all, I'm actually gonna add pineapple juice, which isn't called for in a lot of recipes, but because it works really nicely with all the other flavors in the drink, vanilla, passion fruit, it's actually a really nice bridge between those big flavors and pulls them all together. And as an added bonus, because we're not adding any kind of purees or any egg white or aquafaba into the drink, Shaking this up with pineapple juice is a really natural way to get that really nice foam on the drink, giving a really nice kind of creamy texture and that luxurious feel that we're looking for. And then finally, again, breaking from tradition, we're actually gonna season our porn star martini using two things. The first of which being orange bitters, and then the second being a one to five salt to water saline solution. And I'll talk about these more as I add them. So first of all, we're gonna prepare our passion fruits, and this is actually really easy to do. Just wanna cut them in half. And you can see all the lovely passion fruit inside with both of them. And then we're just gonna scrape out the seeds from three of the passion fruit shells, reserving one for later for garnish. So in total, we're adding one and a half passion fruits worth of the seed and pulp, which is where you get so much of that lovely flavor. To this, we're gonna go 50 mils of good quality vodka. I'm going with a potato vodka, which has really nice kind of creamy body, but whichever vodka you have will work really nicely. Gonna go 25 mils of freshly squeezed lime juice for that zestiness that we know in the porn star. We're gonna go 20 mils of our vanilla syrup as a sweetener. And this is perhaps a little bit more than I'd usually add, but because passion fruit has a lot of acidity, it really does add a little bit of kind of tanginess to the drink, so you can get away with a little bit more sweetness. And I think a lot of people who enjoy porn star martinis tend to enjoy that vanilla flavor, so we're gonna really push that through here. So now I've got our base, we're gonna start adding our own kind of touches and flares to this. First of all, we're gonna go that really good quality pineapple juice. And obviously fresh is best if you can have it, but if you have store-bought, this will work just as well. So, so far we've obviously got acidity and sweetness as well as some boost from the vodka, but something we don't really have in our porn star martini, usually, if ever, is any bitterness. And I really like to add some kind of pithy, zesty bitterness, and I like to do this with a little bit of orange bitters. So I'm just gonna go in with three dashes of this, which is around about 1.5 grams. That was 1.6, so very close. And then another element I really like to introduce to our acidity, sweetness, and now bitterness is a tiny amount of salt. And what we're doing here is just kind of building a more complete flavor profile. And I think porn star can be delicious, but a little bit one dimensional or perhaps two dimensional with acidity and sweetness, but adding the kind of bitterness and a little bit of salt to the drink just makes it so much more complex, so much more layered. And rather than being very wide and kind of sweet and sour, it becomes more kind of focused on the vanilla and passion fruit, which is what we really want to celebrate in the drink. So before we shake the drink, I'm just going to prepare my Prosecco, which lives on the side. And this is a really nice addition because the drink, as I said, has that brightness, has that sweetness, and now the bitterness and salt as well. This just brings a really nice kind of crispness to the drink. And you can either sip this on the side, you can pour it in if you want a little bit of fizz, but it's just a really nice addition and it kind of takes it to the next level. So I'm going with Prosecco, but you can choose your sparkling wine of choice. I do, ideally something quite dry so that it kind of offsets the sweetness in the drink. So now we're gonna give it a really good shake over ice to really kind of emulsify it and whip up that pineapple juice for the creamy texture. We're gonna fine strain into a nice big coupe glass and you can see it's got that really nice foamy texture without the need to add egg white, aquafaba or any form of puree. We're gonna garnish with our other shell of half passion fruit. And there we have 
a really delicious passion fruit forward, but also really well balanced porn star martini with vanilla coming through, a hint of bitterness, salt just bringing it all together, and that really lovely texture. Served alongside Prosecco, I think that's my favorite version of the porn star martini. So give that one a try. I'm really, really happy with it and enjoy. The Cosmopolitan is actually a bit of a misunderstood cocktail. It isn't just that drink which is overly sweet, bright neon red, and ordered because people have seen it on Sex in the City. Or at least it doesn't have to be. So today I'm gonna to show you my favorite version of this drink, which not only nods to the past and takes inspiration from something that is a precursor to the Cosmo to really elevate the drink, but it also brings it up to date, gives a really balanced drink, which isn't overly sweet, and I think is really, really delicious. So let's make a Cosmo. So when it comes to the origins of the Cosmo, there are a few different schools of thought here. Some seem really definitive, some seem a little bit more murky and complex, but the general consensus seems to be that the drink, the Cosmo, was originally created by a bartender called Toby Cicchini in the 1980s, but then it was really kind of refined, defined and popularized by a bartender called Dale DeGroff, who's one of the most famous bartenders of all time. And he really pushed it into the spotlight, partly in the Rainbow Rooms in New York, but then the drink spread all over the world, really kind of defining an era. So before this, there is actually another drink which we need to think about, which was also called a Cosmopolitan or a Cosmopolitan Daisy. And this drink was sort of similar in a way, but also different. And it included raspberry syrup. It had gin instead of vodka. And it wasn't quite the same drink, but it does bear some resemblance. So we need to kind of consider that. And when I make my Cosmopolitans, I like to kind of reference the 1934 Cosmopolitan by introducing something which I think really elevates the drink. Just a couple of raspberries, because we've got the really tart and dry flavor from the cranberry. Raspberries bring a really nice welcome sweetness and juiciness, and these are the base of my Cosmopolitan. So it looks very simple, but two raspberries make a big difference. So these raspberries are obviously to replace the raspberry syrup in the 1934 Cosmopolitan. And then around this, we're gonna build a more familiar template, often kind of referred to as the classic Cosmopolitan. And it's gonna be four ingredients, and we're gonna go 10, 20, 30, 40 mils. So first of all, the 10 mil is gonna be our citrus, which is gonna be lime juice. We're gonna add more citrus to this whilst also bringing the sweetness in the form of Cointreau, 20 mils. We're gonna go 30 mils of cranberry juice. Historically, this would be Ocean Spray, which was a really popular brand, but you can use whichever brand you like. Ideally, something with a little bit more sweetness if you can. Or what I even like to do here is actually add pomegranate juice, which is what this is, because it has a little bit more roundness, a little bit less dry tartness, and I think it just rounds out the drink, working really nicely with the raspberries. And then finally, as with most cocktails in the 1980s, we're gonna have vodka as our base spirit. So quickly to build the drink, 10 mils of our lime juice for our citrus, 20 mils of Cointreau, or your favorite orange liqueur, which is also gonna be our sweetener, 30 mils of cranberry juice, or even pomegranate juice if you're feeling a bit more fruity, 40 mils of a really good quality vodka, and you could choose a citrus vodka here if you like, but we are hitting a few citrus notes with the lime juice and the Cointreau. So I don't think it's a necessary step, although it does add a little bit more citrus to the drink, if you like. And then there we have a really easy template for a Cosmo. 10, 20, 30, 40, lime, Cointreau, cranberry, vodka. And what we're looking at here is essentially a riff on a sour. So we have the spirit, which is our base spirit, which is gonna be vodka. We have our acidity, which is our lime juice. We have a sweetener, which is the orange liqueur. And we're just gonna lengthen that with a little bit of our cranberry or our pomegranate, which kind of bridges the acidity and the sweetness. So this is kind of a drink that does make sense. And these proportions really give you a nicely balanced drink. And then now we need to give this a good shake over ice. So you'll notice I haven't actually modeled the raspberries just because it's not necessary. The ice is gonna really kind of mix it into the drink really well. So don't bother wasting your time with that. So now we can fine strain out our Cosmo, just to remove any flecks of ice in there. And you can see it's got that really nice kind of pinky hue. It's not over the top and we haven't added any sugar to this. So we're really getting a nicely refined, crisp, but also well-balanced Cosmo, which I think works really nicely. To finish the drink, we have an iconic garnish, which is gonna be a flamed orange zest. And you just wanna take a little coin from your orange. And then what we're gonna do is just carefully light this over the drink and express it onto the liquid. 
So just very carefully burn the oil just to warm it through. And then when you're ready, zest, rim the glass, and you've got that really nice orange citrusy aroma. And then we have a delicious drink with a nod to the past in there as well, which I think really levels it up, called a Cosmopolitan. So enjoy my friends. I honestly couldn't make a 50 video course like this one, featuring some of the most popular cocktails in the world without featuring a video on the one and only espresso martini. So if you've followed my channel for a while, since before the Essential Cocktails course, you'll know I'm all about coffee and cocktails and bring the two together in really interesting, creative ways. And I can't think of a more iconic example of this than the espresso martini. So today what I'm gonna do is show you the most simple, easy, effective, and delicious formula, which you can take away, adapt, twist and put your own spin on to make your own perfect espresso martini. And it's actually really, really easy to make. So without further ado, welcome to the final episode in this huge essential cocktails course, which I really hope you've enjoyed, where we're gonna make an espresso martini. So the espresso martini was created in the 1980s by one of the greatest and most influential bartenders of all time, Dick Bradsell, at the request supposedly of a supermodel who asked for a drink to wake her up and her up. If you wanna delve much deeper into the history of the espresso martini and where it came from, I actually spent time with Bee Bradsell, Dick's daughter, in this video here, which you can click on to learn all about the story of the espresso martini and the truth behind its ingredients. So for this simple espresso martini, it's gonna be a four ingredient drink with a few tips and tricks along the way. So first of all, we're gonna need espresso, which can be freshly brewed, or you can even pick this up from a coffee shop if you don't have access to an espresso machine. And then we're gonna add three ingredients to this to really focus in on the coffee. The first of which being a frozen spirit, which is in the freezer. I'm going with a frozen aged white rum, but you can choose your favorite spirit here. For sweetness, I'm gonna go with a cane sugar syrup. I'm going with Monin, but you can use different sugar bases. You can use different flavored syrups and try different sugars. So again, a really simple starting point, which you can adapt to your favorite flavor profile. And then finally, I'm gonna go with a little bit of our saline solution, our trusty old friend, one part salt to five parts water, which is just gonna bring those big flavors together and slightly reduce our perception of any bitterness in the drink, just rounding it all out to make it really, really delicious. So into our shaker tin, we're gonna start with our espresso, which I recommend brewing hot if you can, with 18 grams of coffee for a 40 gram yield. And there's much more content about the espresso martini on my channel. So if you wanna deep dive into any element of the espresso martini, there'll be a playlist at the end that you can click on. As you know, coffee can have a huge spectrum of flavors which you can explore, everything from tropical fruit and really kind of ripe, deep fruit flavors, right through to tea-like notes, delicate notes, florals, and then the more traditional kind of chocolatey and nutty notes. All of these can be in an espresso martini. You just need to kind of adapt the other ingredients to make sure that it's really celebrated and balanced. Then to our hot espresso, ideally, you wanna choose a frozen spirit. And the reason for this is we don't wanna over dilute the drink. So by adding 40 mils of our frozen aged white rum, which historically would be vodka, but I just think the rum brings a bit more depth and ties in with this really chocolatey coffee. So this is gonna balance out the temperature. So obviously by using a hot espresso, if we were to shake this drink over ice without adding any cold ingredients, it'd dilute too quickly. We probably wouldn't get the same texture we're looking for, but by counterbalancing that temperature with our chilled spirit, it just brings down the temperature again to a more neutral temperature, just like we would with shaking any other cocktail. So that's kind of a pro tip there. Freeze your spirits, change your spirits, shift into other categories. Vodka is obviously the more classic choice. Things like brandy are really nice. Rum, of course, really, really great. And there's flavor spectrums within these, which is so huge. You can tie them in really nicely with the coffee. And then you need to balance this out. So I recommend going with 20 mils of a two to one sugar syrup of some kind. And all the syrups in the Monin range come to this level of sweetness. So you could use any Monin syrup here. You can make your own flavored syrups. You can use different sugar bases. I've actually explored a whole range of sweetness in the course, which I'll link in a video above, just here. And then to finish this off, we're gonna go with one gram of our saline solution, just to really bring everything together nicely. Gonna shake this over lots of ice to really whip it all together and get that nice creamy texture, whilst also chilling it down and slightly diluting the drink. As always, we're gonna strain this into a chilled glass, and I actually like to fine strain into this really nice coupe glass. And you can see it's got that really nice foamy texture. It's gonna have loads of body, loads of really nice coffee character coming through, being surrounded by the other ingredients in the drink. And this is an absolute winner. 
So there we have one of my favorite cocktails in the world, which is gonna be an espresso martini. Cheers, everybody. This drink is a perfect example of bringing really good quality coffee, really good quality cocktails, pushing the two together and creating something even more delicious. And that's something I'm really, really passionate about. So throughout this course, we've learned a huge amount of information. Hopefully a lot of it's been valuable to you. I've really enjoyed sharing it with you. So if you wanna level up your coffee, your cocktails, or even your coffee cocktails, it'd be amazing if you could subscribe to the channel where hopefully you'll get lots more information about both those categories and how to combine them. And I'll put a couple of playlists here. This one, all about variations on the espresso martini, of which there are many. So finally, thank you once again for watching from the bottom of my heart. I really appreciate it. And I really hope this course Essential Cocktails, as well as the rest of the channel, will help you make better drinks, which is what it's all about. So I'll see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone.